So today's lesson is going to be about how complicated your story should be using the famed adage, keep it simple, stupid. Now consider the sphere. This is actually one of those little take it apart desk toys that I like to play around with every once in a while, but I consider it a good visual metaphor for what I'm talking about. On the surface, we're just talking a basic little sphere. It's simple enough, you know, you don't really need to get too much into the details. It's, it's a ball, you get it. But if you look a little deeper and you actually take it apart, you actually get an understanding of how deep and intricate everything actually is. There's a lot of depth to what was originally such a simple concept. And yet, despite how different all of these pieces appear, everything fits together to make one understandable shape. That is how I like to approach a lot of world building, a lot of character building, a lot of magic systems. Simple start, but with a lot of depth, kind of like Brandon Sanderson's depth not width argument. However, that cohesion is completely absent from Lightlark. This is easily one of the most unnecessarily overcomplicated books I've ever read. There's a lot in here. Some of it's actually kind of good, but a lot of it doesn't actually mesh well together. My working theory is that Astor took a whole bunch of ideas and suggestions, threw them together, regardless of how well they actually fit together, and then try to push that out as a finished book. Sometimes putting a bunch of things that are cool on their own and smashing them together with a bunch of other things that are cool on their own doesn't actually make them blend or fit together at all. One of my favorite things to do when I go to conventions like AwesomeCon is try to go around the um, independent vendors, you know, like a bunch of indie authors and pick up their books, see if I can add something interesting to, uh, to my library. And I'm not gonna name this particular book, but uh, it's described as Samurai astronauts led by an immortal kung fu monkey saving the universe from zombie cyborg space pirates. Now, a lot of that sounds really cool. A lot of those individual elements, like samurai astronauts, okay, I could see that. Uh, an immortal kung fu monkey, weird, but there's something you can do with that. Zombie cyborg space pirates, hey, why the hell not? But the problem with the way that the book is written is it feels like it's automatically cool because it's got all these cool things in it. And so it expects you to already be on board with how cool it is. And it doesn't work because you've got all of these elements that don't actually fit together in the story. The story becomes an incoherent mess. Now you compare that to this other indie book that I found, indie comic rather, that I found, uh, Tuskegee Airs, which is really a bunch of kids using high tech uh, planes to fight aliens in the future. This is a much more simple premise, but because it's working with fewer elements, it actually makes a lot more sense. Plus, the artwork is really good, so points for that. Now, I'm gonna do my best to try to keep everything as simple as I can because, unfortunately, Lightlark is the sort of book where a lot, a lot of it is written purely to fool the reader. It, a lot of things don't make sense in context. A lot of decisions the characters make, a lot of the rules or the elements that are laid out when they are laid out, don't make sense within the greater context of the story or the universe. They are put in there the way they are put in there, when they are put in there, simply to play along with the audience. And unfortunately, a good portion of the reason for that is because of Astor's insistence on creating these magnificent twists. And there are big plot twists, and no one has guessed all of them who has read it so far, so that's a challenge, I ah. guess, like, to anyone who reads it. Astra's big point of pride is that no one has figured out the twists in her book, and there's a reason why that is true. You'll be able to figure out at least a few of the twists if you pay attention. Like, the big one at the end is actually kind of obvious if you stop and think about it. I figured it out before it happened. I'm sure a lot of you can, too. And there's a reason why you won't be able to get a number of the other twists, but I'm going to hold off on telling you what I think the reason is until the very end. I want to see how many of you figure it out. Make sure to timestamp in the comments when you figure out how Aster got away with these twists. But anyway, what is this story about? Well, Lightlark is the story of this magical island that appears once every hundred years, except no, it doesn't. It's just, nope, nope, actually, I'm gonna stop. I'm already pointing out the contradictions. Lightlark, as this story is advertised, is an island that appears once every hundred years. 
when that happens, the rulers of the six realms of the world uh, come together on Light Lark in order to uh, undergo what's called the Centennial, a very vaguely and unnecessarily defined set of rules and demonstrations that they all join together in in order to fall in line with some prophecy so they can all break their curses. See, each one of these realms has a unique curse that uh, has dire consequences sometimes. Some of them are laughably easy to avoid, but I'm getting ahead of myself. And one of the early twists is that the protagonist, Ela, doesn't actually have a curse, but she also doesn't have any magic powers, unlike pretty much everyone else on the planet. So not only does Ela have to go through these deadly trials as uh, the ruler of her people, the Wildlings, she also has to do it without any magic abilities. And if anyone figures out that she doesn't have magic, well, they're probably going to want to kill her anyway. For some reason, it's never actually really explored. But unfortunately, that's one of those things that you will find very commonly within Light Lark, where you've got an element that sounds interesting on the surface until you think about it for half a second, and then you realize, but why is that? But why does that make sense? But why do you think these things mesh? So much is told but so little is explained. But that's not quite as much of a mess as the story of how Lightlark came to be. In several interviews, Aster has stated that uh, she has gotten hundreds upon hundreds of rejection letters for her glorious idea, Lightlark. It was such a good story, but no one wanted to take a chance on it until someone did. And then the book got published, which seems to lose a lot of weight when you consider that she started reaching out to literary agents when she was 12. Of course you're going to accrue hundreds upon hundreds of rejection letters if you're writing to people when you're that young and you don't have any established presence as a writer. Now what's odd is that she did eventually get a an agent, but that was for two middle grade fantasy stories that she wrote, like The Curse of the Witch Isle and something else like that. It doesn't matter because I'm not going to be referencing them. But she kept pushing the idea for Light Lark. And her literary agent at the time said, oh no, it's too similar to too many other stories that are out there. And uh, we're not going to be able to really make it work. So just keep dropping, don't, don't even try to push it. And Aster kept pushing it. And eventually the agent got tired and quit, or that's how Aster describes it. And so she eventually found someone else who took the chance, but that's after the book rose to prominence on TikTok. Now on YouTube, we've got this kind of broadly defined genre called which I suppose I am a member of, where we discuss books, book news, author news, reviews, all sorts of stuff like that. Book talk is like the annoying little brother that you don't really want to have around, but you can't kill him because then your parents will find out and they'll be upset. Well, book talk is a broadly defined group on TikTok where they celebrate mediocrity like this and Colleen Hoover. Don't worry, I'm not going to make fun of book talk that much. Frankly, as long as you're reading, you're doing something right and I don't care. Because even Twilight got people to read, and once they started reading, they learned to read something better. But Aster uploaded a video, it was about 15 seconds long, that had the extremely generic description of what her book was about. The way she tells the story, she posted this, the, uh, the video, went to bed, and I guess the algorithm picked it up, and when she woke up, she had like over a million views on it. This was able to generate a lot of publicity for the story, so eventually, and she was able to smartly ride that wave all the way to publication. She got a literary agent because of it. She was invited on a whole bunch of interview shows. She was invited to Comic-Con, where she sat next to Brandon Sanderson at one point. I guess the panel was trying to cover the extremes of talented and not. And then there's the drama that resulted as a result of all the publicity on TikTok. You see, one of the things that Aster did to generate a lot of hype is she would reach out to her uh, audience and say, what if I had this element in the book? What if I had this line in the book? The problem with that is when the advanced reader copies or ARCs went out, a lot of people would return with reviews saying, this element was promised to be in the book. It's not. This line was promised to be in the book. It's not. 
and that got a lot of people upset, so a lot of people started reading, uh, leaving negative reviews. There are accusations of review bombing on sites like Goodreads and Amazon. I have no evidence that there was, in fact, uh, any review bombing going on. It's possible that people were just leaving one-star reviews because they read this and they hated it. I would give this one star, at best, like a 3 out of 10. But it's also possible that people were jumping on the bandwagon because this just became the popular thing to hate. But there was another particular element that I don't know why she ever advertised this. She stated that there were going to be some spicy moments. And um, spicy moments are not something that you would typically find in a young adult novel. So I'm not sure why she ever advertised it. Now, there's implications that some spicy things happened, but nothing's actually detailed. It was me, Sonic. I made the rewrite light lock with fewer sexual features so that you wouldn't be horny. But the general vibe about Light Lark was that it was overhyped, overpromised, and it turned out to be severely disappointing. As Tim Hickson put it on his uh, second channel, this is the Fire Festival of Book Talk, a label that I would have to strongly agree with. This feels like one of those things, like, I've got this weird conspiracy theory in my head where a lot of terrible stories are being pushed. Like, we, we used to consider movies like The Lost World as bad. And compared to a lot of the stuff that we're getting these days, that's actually pretty good. Like, The Lost World ain't that bad in comparison to some of the schlock that's coming out now. But my conspiracy theory is that there's no effort being put into the writing because it's easier to put this out there and rely on YouTubers crapping all over the book and just relying on that for publicity. One of the other aspects about how this book was advertised is, comes down to how query letters work these days. And I'm not really a fan of this, but it's just the norm. It's one of those things that you gotta do. One of the things when you're writing a query letter and reaching out to a literary agent is you've gotta say, my book is like a mix of this and this. Well, Light Lark was apparently advertised as a mix of A Court of Thorn and Roses, Akatar, and The Hunger Games. I have not read Akatar, so I can't really draw any comparisons there, but I did read and enjoy The Hunger Games trilogy, and I can tell you, I have no idea what Aster is talking about. The Hunger Games, at its most basic core, was about an authoritarian government that forced its citizens to sacrifice children and teenagers to a death tournament as part of a way of keeping the country in line. I think of the first Hunger Games, like 10 or 12 kids died pretty much at the start of the, the first game, and that, that, out of 24, and that gives you a solid idea of how bloody, how miserable this entire experience was, how actually dangerous it was. The Centennial is described as a deadly series of games. And I'm being serious when I say this. I have been to obstacle course races that were deadlier than the Centennial. Because in the last 500 years that the Centennial has been going on, they're like, none of the rulers have died as a result. And there's a very brief description that like the first Centennial, a lot of citizens and innocent people got caught in the mix. But for the most part, these deadly games are pretty harmless. Meanwhile, I once went to an obstacle course race where a man drowned in front of me. I'm, I'm not making that up. He was underwater for at least 10 minutes. They did eventually pull him out, but it, like, they, they, it took the divers entirely too long to, um, to bring him out. It was like, you, you step on a platform and you, you're supposed to pencil dive into a 15 fit, uh, foot pit uh, filled with water and I guess this guy couldn't swim and he just never made it back up. And because it's as incredibly muddy as it was, the divers weren't able to find him. They did eventually get him out and they did eventually revive him, but I don't know what state he was in after that. I've never seen that obstacle since. Now one of the things I've argued in favor of fantasy before is how much you can do with the rules in fantasy. Any kind of magic system can be molded to work. Any type of creature can be inserted into your world. Any sort of fantastic element can be played with to escape the limits of reality. However, the author must create and follow these rules. Light Lark's biggest error might be that it creates a whole slew of rules and ideas, but those rules don't mesh, make sense, or follow through. And that's not when they're outright disappointing. There are moments where you're going to be like, is that it? 
One of the other things that people bring up about Aster is that they suspect that she is an industry plant, someone who was put out there artificially in order to create some sort of artificial interest in her story. That might be something you see with other industries, but I can't think of any examples where that's ever happened with publishing. That's not to say that Aster didn't cheat along the way, though. She likes to claim that she was a rags-to-riches story, essentially. She likes to tout that her parents struggled in order to give her everything that she needed, you know, a comfortable environment and all that. I don't know how true that is. I'll assume that it is. Her parents sound like good people otherwise. But when you consider her twin sister, it does raise questions. Her sister, Daniela Pearson, is worth $200 million. She got a $15,000 loan when she was 19, and she created a, a female-led news uh, thing called The Newsette, which I believe is currently valued at about $40 million and has a lot of connections. Uh, at one point she worked, I believe it's with the, the Newsette, that she worked with Selena Gomez. And Astor claims that she didn't use any direct industry contacts. She didn't have, like, her father wasn't a former roommate of the head of this particular publishing house or something, as far as I can tell at least. But she really paints a dishonest image of herself. Hence why I call her the Rebecca Black of literature. What are your superpowers again? Now, that's not to say that Aster doesn't have talent. This is something that I'm going to bring up at the end of the review again, but I think that Aster has some potential as a writer. It's easy to see that Aster has developed her technical skills well. Syntax, grammar, and such work effectively. Payson could use some work, but whatever. Her issue is the actual artistry in creating a compelling or stirring narrative. Her characters are flat, her world makes no sense, and every time she introduces a new idea, it's compounded by several questions because the idea doesn't mesh with the, uh, the characters or the world pieces already set in place. Think back to the visual metaphor thing I did earlier with the uh, sphere puzzle toy. Simple idea, but with a lot of complex interlocking parts. Aster, what she did is effectively she put a whole bunch of jewels together, threw them in a pile, and said, look at this impressive statue that I built. Well, no. Individually, a lot of these gems might look nice, but they all have different sizes, different colors, different cuts, and they don't actually fit together to make a statue. It's just a pile. Taken piece by piece, there are things that I could call are pretty good. But all together as a whole, it's a disorganized mess. I've never seen a book do such an incredible nosedive before. The author was this celebrated writer with everything going for her and all this blind praise for her upcoming book, only for it to be the most unorganized, jumbled mess. I think we all expected Midnight Sun and The Mister to suck, considering the authors, but Light Lark at least had some mystique behind it and some potential at its core. Now, there are a number of internal contradictions. I was going to do this bit where I, like, cleared out a wall in my house, and I, I have all these, these post-it notes about, here's the rule, but here's a different rule that contradicts that, and here's uh, the logic pattern that this doesn't actually follow, and there's just going to be this big... Pepe Silvia style wall to demonstrate how little thought any of the interconnectivity of the book actually contains. But that's entirely too much work and I am entirely too lazy. It also doesn't help that a lot of the story only works because it is a classic idiot plot. Idiot plot is something we've discussed before. It is, uh, I believe, associated with Oscar Wilde and it's a plot that only works because the characters are idiots. And that is true for not just the protagonist, but a number of people, and we will... We got plenty of examples for all of that. Before we really dive into the book properly, let's talk about the protagonist, Ela Crown. Now, I will admit, I mispronounced her name before I learned that I was wrong. I thought it was Isla. And when you consider how much Spanish is actually in the book, I don't think I can be faulted. For example, two of the other rulers are named Azul and Oro, which are Spanish for blue and gold. So if I slip up and I accidentally call her Isla, I know it's wrong. I just read the book like that the first time all the way through. Yeah, hi folks, uh, Cr Editor Crimson for the Future here. Um, there's a lot of confusion as far as Ela's name, how it's supposed to be pronounced, because the book seems to tell you one thing, but uh, the actual name can be pronounced, like, I found four different pronunciations depending upon origin. Isla. 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 So I'm just going to be going with 
Ela for this review. I don't know if that's accurate. I assume that it is, considering that I don't think the um, the author uh, had the Scottish version of the name in mind. I went back and re-listened to a few interviews with the author, and it's strange. Aster almost never talks about her characters, so I don't know for sure how the protagonist's name is supposed to be pronounced. Now, were I to analyze that particular nugget of information myself about how Aster conducts herself in interviews where she talks about herself, her journey, her success, as opposed to anything substantial about the story, one might think that it's, it's a little indicative of a high level of ego or vanity on Astor's part, but that's a little psychoanalytical for me. I use my interest in psychology to analyze characters in books, not real people, partly because I don't have a degree for it, and also I don't want to play armchair psychologist. But it does make you think maybe Astor doesn't actually care about her characters, which would explain so much about this story. Oh god, I just... the nomenclature in this book is impressively lazy, but I don't want to overload this intro. The way some of the nomenclature is set up, like take the realms for example, you've got the wildlings, moonlings, skylings, starlings, sunlings, and nightshade, which just reminds me of the ghosts from Pac-Man, Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and Clyde. The difference being the ghosts were named like that as a joke. And so yeah, I, I read that as uh, Isla Crown, Crown Island, and in a competition of a bunch of rulers, that's like advertising the ending, giving it away beforehand. You might as well name the protagonist Big Winner or Number One. It also doesn't help that Ela cannot really be defined that well, to the point where I don't know how old she is. She's called attractive, but that's such a subjective description, I don't know how to actually narrow anything down from that. Then again, I'm of the belief that this was done by design. Like how Twilight doesn't describe Bella, Lightlark doesn't describe Ela outside of being a woman. I'm not even sure of what her age is, so I'm assuming she's somewhere between 18 and 24 for NSFW purposes. And what actions she takes within the book are either obvious or random badass moments because it uh, that fits within a bland power fantasy archetype. This is an exceptionally lazy writing choice because it requires the reader to do some of the author's job. This isn't even like the reader using their imagination to picture the world and the book's events. Uh, this is the reader filling in gaps that the author left, presumably to let the reader insert their own experiences and personality into Ela's role. Yeah, hi folks, interrupting again. Um, did you know that out of all of the stuff I had to talk about with Aster, I actually forgot something, namely the movie deal. One of the other big pieces of information about why people thought Aster was an industry plant was because before the book was released, she actually had a movie deal with Universal, which it's like, oh my God, of course, they had all of this set up in advance. That's, that's conclusive proof that she uh, was planted here by some publishing company, whatever it was. That's actually not the case. It's actually more normal than you would think. What studios will often do is they'll buy the movie rights to a book or something if it's got a lot of hype uh, behind it before it comes out. That way they can pretty much just uh, get their foot in the door before the book is a provable success and Astro would be able to argue for more money. And with all of the hype that this book had around uh, book talk and publishing in general, it was the talk of the town. I think she, in one interview, Astro said that it was on like the number one uh, New York Times bestsellers list for like 10 weeks straight. Regardless of the actual quality of the story, that sort of a thing indicates a safe investment for movie studios. So. Uh, Universal just called dibs early. Now, Aster is jumping the gun a little when she says they're definitely making a movie out of this book. The movie rights have been sold. So far, as far as I can tell, that's all that's happened. Will they actually make a movie out of this? I mean, they've made movies with worse ideas. I can promise you that without massive rewrites, the movie adaptation will be a hilarious failure in regards to writing. I, I might actually have to do a Book is Better episode on that just so you could really get a firm understanding of where the book ha or where the movie had to cut corners. Anyway, that's the last last minute edit that I had to make to this video, so enjoy the rest of the review. But before we get into this, one last amusing note that doesn't really amount to much, but I thought was funny. So I'm going through the process of applying to literary agents for my own novel right now, 
And a website that I found that is really helpful is called Query Tracker. It's basically, it's a search engine for literary agents, and you can narrow it down to all sorts of different things, and you know, just going, you know, company by company to see who might be a good fit for me. So far, I'm like up to 20 rejection letters. Uh, no hits yet, but fingers crossed. But one of the people who came up on my search is Caitlin Detweiler, who works for the Jill Grinberg Literary Management. Caitlin Detweiler is also the literary agent for Alex Astor. I don't believe they're going to take me as a client once this video's out. <laughs> but anyway, we've got a whole bunch of tabs to get through, and I, like I said, I'm going to do my best not to overload you guys, so this might be a video that would benefit from a second viewing, and I'm not just saying that for my own sake, it's because this is a cyclical story, so a lot of the things that are revealed in the end will make more sense when you understand them in the beginning. And you'll also understand why it doesn't work, because a lot of the setup that Aster does only works to fool the reader. Not because it's something that makes sense for the characters to say or do, or for the information to be revealed when and how it is. And before I forget, the book has the pacing of a racetrack covered in speed bumps. So there is a lot to go over. Uh, a lot of it is going to be just diving into the minutia of some of the elements because of how much they don't work. Like genuinely, there are times where Aster will introduce a single element but it doesn't mesh with multiple other elements that are introduced. And every time she does that, I would bring up like three or four questions as to how does any of this register? So it's going to take me a while to get through all 62 pages of my notes. So if the lighting changes or my shirt changes, understand that I am filming this over multiple days because I'd rather get this out in one video rather than try to torture myself by getting like another three or four parter out. But that's enough build up. Let's check out Light Lark. Now there's actually something to be said about the cover. I actually think this isn't a bad cover at all. The word Light Lark is displayed prominently and very ornately. You've got these little vine thorn things that go around the edges. I think that adds a nice bit of flourish. The little heart in the middle definitely grabs your attention. It is a little similar to Midnight Sun for my taste, but whatever. And that is going to be the last compliment I pay this book for a while. Now, one unique thing about this cover that I can't say about any others is that, hopefully you guys can see this well, but the, the cover is actually starting to curl up on itself. Like, I didn't do anything excessive to this book. I would, like, put it on my backpack and and just read it and that's about it but there's the it's made of a synthetic material on top of paper and it's starting to separate i've never seen a cover do that before it's like that on both sides so to start off chapter one opens eh, not bad it's got an okay hook Ela crown often fell through puddles of stars and into faraway places always without permission and seemingly on the worst occasions one thing that i like to do when i read these books is I don't do any research ahead of time. Like at most, I'll try to find a summary, but I like these books to be able to speak for themselves with their own merits as much as they can without me looking up what horrible thing the author has done. So when I first read that, I actually thought that Ela Crown was an island and it was like sailing through the stars or something in an overly flowery description, kind of like Discworld, but no, Ela Crown is is a person like it's an it's a pretty opening line, but you don't get a full understanding for everything for for a while. I don't think this was a story that you're meant to view more than once, kind of like uh, the Prestige or Donnie Darko, but it doesn't work on that level. And as we get more details, you will understand why. It turns out that Ela has teleported back to her uh, her home. Uh, she lives in a basically a greenhouse with uh, the uh, the windows painted over and she travels uh, without permission using what's called a star stick. The star stick is a powerful artifact that she we later learned she inherited from her mother uh, who is unfortunately died and the star stick becomes one of the most infuriating plot holes 
within the story at large, you'll understand what I'm talking about shortly. So Ela teleports back to her room just in time because her two guardians, Poppy and Tara, rush in and check in on her because today is a very special day. Today is the day that she has to portal over to Lightlark for the first day of the centennial. We get a brief description about how Ela utilizes the um, star stick. She apparently goes off and th this is, okay, this is gonna be difficult. A problem that Aster has is she will introduce an element and you know, certain rules are laid out, but when you actually, then later on, certain rules uh, governing this other aspect, person, practice, thing, whatever, comes up. And they don't actually work in sequence. And having gone through this, I can tell you this particular element that doesn't work at all. Later on throughout the book, we, we learned that Ila's life has been one of constant training because she's so young, uh, she needs to be ready for anything the Centennial will throw at her. So her guardians, Poppy and, Ter uh, and Tara, will do all sorts of different training regimens with her, some that last days on end. And despite that, we get this description of how Ela uses her star stick to teleport. Ela didn't pretend to be an expert at using the device. In the beginning, the puddle of stars took her unexpected places. The snow villages of the Moonling Newlands, the airy jubilees of the Skyling Newlands, a few lands that hadn't been settled by any of the six realms at all. Little by little, she learned how to return to locations she had been to before, and that was the extent of her mastering the star stick. All she knew for certain was that somehow the mysterious device allowed her to travel hundreds of miles in seconds. So she's able to spend who knows how much time going to all these different places, exploring all these different lands, sometimes meeting new and interesting people. How then does she never get caught by her guardians who can pop in at random through the only door in her room because it's it's time for training whenever. That has to be the lucky, and she's been doing this for like five years apparently. That has to be the longest stretch of dumb luck I could think of anywhere. That's like winning the lottery every week for five years. After a while, it stops making sense. We get a description of Ela's room. It is in fact an ancient greenhouse, but the panes have been painted over, the windows are sealed, and all except one door has been removed. I think what she means to say is that all but one door had been boarded off so that there was only one way in. And Poppy calls Ela Little Bird, a minute element that will be important in about 380 pages. I'm not making that up, but there is a particular element that I don't like in that Aster doesn't really trust her audience to understand the basic image she's setting up. Consider that Poppy calls Ela Little Bird. Her room was not her own. It was an orb of glass, the remnants of an ancient greenhouse. But the panes had been painted over. The windows had been sealed. All except one door had been removed. She was a little bird, just like Poppy and sometimes even Tara called her. A bird in a cage. Now, this is an element where I think that you should have some faith in your readers because there's an obvious image that's being set up there that we don't need explained, except the image of being a bird stuck in a cage is dead on arrival because she opened this chapter by using a teleporting stick. She is not, in fact, trapped in one isolated location. She's able to leave whenever she bloody wants. I am on page two. But when a lot of the information doesn't actually work in context with other bits of information, Aster is very vague or intentionally lacks any description. For example, Ela has a bunch of swords on her walls. Tara eyed her suspiciously before turning her focus to the wall. Dozens of swords hung there in a shining row, a makeshift mirror. Pity you can't bring any of them, she said, a finger trailing across the wall of blades. She had given Ela every single sword presented from the castle's ancient store. Ela had earned them after each training achievement and mastery. What types of swords are these? Couldn't tell you. They're never described. In fact, that's a problem that goes throughout pretty much the rest of the book. The, the type of sword 
might not seem like a big deal, and oftentimes it's it's not. You can usually use context clues to understand the type of society that you would be in. For example, if we're talking your standard ancient, um, I guess English or German style setting, you would probably understand broadswords as like the basic type of sword. But we don't have that benefit because this is an entirely new world. There could be any number of swords. They could be broadswords, rapiers, gladiuses, claymores, katanas. Each one of those will have its own unique fighting style that will color in how we would see Ela as a character, as a fighter. But because none of that is actually described, we can't get that extra bit of information. The way Needle is described in A Song of Ice and Fire helps us understand uh, Arya a bit better. It is a thin, light blade that allows a, a fighter faster reflexes. And because of that, we understand how her fighting style would evolve in training with that weapon. Uh, same thing with Guts in Berserk. He uses a giant ass, well, at the very start, really a chunk of iron uh, with a bit of an edge. <laughs> But because he trains with oversized swords and becomes an oversized muscular character, we understand his fighting style in accordance to that particular sword. We don't get that advantage with Ela because we have no idea what, what type of sword we're even talking about in the first place. I am still on page two. But somehow she has mastered all of them, which sounds remarkable considering that one of the other characters in this book, uh, Celeste, who is a starling and cannot be older than 25. Starlings die at the age of 25. Ela is younger than her, I believe. So Ela has got to be anywhere between 18 and 24. Even worse, we're told that she's already mastered all these different types of swords, whatever they might be. So rather than see the character struggle and grow, uh, grow through adversity, she gets to start at badass level. Part of the reason Die Hard has such immortality isn't because John McClane starts at badass level. He struggles for the entire run of the movie. Like, the man doesn't even have shoes, and yet he's able to overcome his, his opponents by outthinking them bit by bit, like when he threw that uh, C4 chair bomb down the elevator shaft. But then there's the Centennial itself, and the Centennial is... I don't even know how to start to describe it. But Aster tries to. The Centennial was many things. A game. A chance at breaking the many curses that plagued the Six Realms. An opportunity to win unmatched power. A meeting of the Six Rulers. A hundred days on an island cursed to only appear once every hundred years. And for Ela, almost certain death. Yeah, so Aster has compared this to the Hunger Games, even though it pales in comparison to the Hunger Games because... Those games, on a concept level, are actually pretty straightforward. Death Tournament. Kids are thrown in, and they have to kill each other until there's only one left. The example that came to mind when I was going through the Centennial was Throne of Glass by Sarah J. Mass, a book that I found passable at best, but it has a lot of the same concept at its core, and it does seem to appeal to the same audience. Throne of Glass is about uh, a character who is also kind of an automatic badass who has to compete against other champions from around the realm in order to become the, what was it, the king's champion. There are various trials that she has to undergo and death is actually a possible outcome if she doesn't overcome opponents in certain challenges. But it makes sense. There's a collection of games that has a clear end goal. The demonstrations that we will see in a bit that the Centennial has the characters undergo don't really serve a purpose in the broader scheme of things. They're supposed to demonstrate rulers' aptitudes in certain things, but like, it's just an overdressed, overproduced nothing of a tournament. The prose goes on and describes a little bit more about Light Lark and what the world was like before the curses were spun 500 years ago. We get some vague niceties about, you know, there were people who could make the sea dance, castles that floated in the, in the clouds, flowers that bloomed pure power. Did someone say flowers? 
But now Lightlark itself is trapped inside of a massive storm that's like less storm and more giant water wall that surrounds the entire island. And Ila learns this because she used to speak to an Eldress on her island, which I'm not sure how she did if she was supposed to be secluded in her room for the sake, uh, safety of her people and, like, her own. This is separated by two pages. Why did no one catch this? But she used to talk to this particular Eldress who would spin all these stories about what life on Lightlark used to be like. So, yes, some of the people are centuries old. I, I guess that just works for everybody, generally. Like, as long as you don't die from natural causes or an accident or something, then you're effectively long-lived like the elves from Lord of the Rings. Except for the Eldress, who died somehow, and Ela blames herself. Now, this is an element that's introduced here, but doesn't actually make sense in context. You've got to go another several chapters before you actually understand this particular point. So what Aster is doing is she's trying to seed some degree of curiosity so you can, uh, so the reader will go, oh my God, how could this be Ela's fault? She didn't kill the Eldress, did she? But the first several chapters are so exposition heavy that it is extremely easy to get overloaded. And in fact, it, the book seems reliant on this concept. So much information is thrown out there so hastily, so overwhelmingly, that I actually thought it was a stylistic choice. It's like a sleight of hand during a magic trick where, you know, you're distracted by this and, you know, you're getting so much information that it's it's too much for you to actually keep straight all at once. And all the while, you've got this one little stray nugget of information until that one pivotal scene when, boom, it turns out the butler did it! And you're supposed to go, oh my god, that was a, that was introduced like 400 pages ago. How did I not remember? I should have seen this coming. Wah! And if you're wondering, no, that is not how the twists operate. They use an entirely different logic, but I'm getting ahead of myself. And I'm sorry if I'm just dwelling too much on minute details. It genuinely, like, th this is what reading this book is like. It is so overwhelming for, for anyone to go through. Case in point, these are all the notes I have for the first four pages. That's a lot. Poppy gets her ready, gets, uh, you know, her makeup and uh, her hair put up and, and all that, gets her ready for uh, to leave on the centennial. Beautiful, Poppy said. Ela didn't need to hear the compliment to know it was true. Beauty was a wildling's gift and curse. A curse that had gotten her own mother killed. Try to keep this particular bit of information in mind because Everything surrounding Ela's mother's death confuses the hell out of me. And because of that storm, the island is now a shadow of its former self, trapped within a forever storm that made traveling to it outside the centennial impossible by boat or even by enchantment. A point that the book will contradict much later in the story. So Ela gets ready to leave, and we get a bit more description of the Wildling Castle, about how it's covered in... Uh, leaves and vines crept along the walls and birds are flying about, turtling happily. And we even get this moment that I would actually call uh, not bad. It actually fits in a bit of character detail that we do need. She wore deep green to honor her realm, a fabric that clung to her ribs, waist, knees, and pulled at her feet. Her cape was made of gossamer, sheer enough to make its traditional purpose for modesty obsolete. And that choice represented her realm just as much as its color. Wildlings had always been proud of their bodies, beauty, and ability. They'd always loved wildly, lived freely, and fought fiercely. Now, the fact that she's wearing green, and the wildlings are a very nature-oriented realm, that makes a lot of sense, like, on its face. I don't need to describe it any better than that. And the fact that it's a very form-fitting dress that uh, is quite revealing does play along with the natural beauty that wildlings are also very proud of. So, this is, in fact a good thing the book has done. Because now, perhaps a bit bluntly, but the thought was actually put in place. We've got a mixture of color of clothing as well as type of clothing in order to accentuate the people of the wildlings. We get a little bit of culture as to who they are. And I like that. I appreciate when a, an author can actually combine elements like that and give us a little greater detail as to who the people um, 
you know, in this case, the wildlings are. The problem is it doesn't get much deeper than that. And it's like that, like that same element is repeated multiple times uh, through the rulers of their own realms. Like how Oro, we'll see, has gold armor, which doesn't actually make sense. Grim of the Nightshades is, has like very spiky armor, you know, because they're, they're very off-putting and antisocial, so you can't get close to them. Get it? Ugh, man, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself again. But then we get some information on the Wildling's curse. And while every other realm has the one curse, the Wildlings, for some reason, have two. And before you ask, no, that's never explained or explored. Wildlings was twofold. They were cursed to kill anyone they fell in love with, and to live exclusively on human hearts. They turned into terrifyingly beautiful monsters with the wicked power to seduce with a single look. So there's something that Aster attempts to play with as far as utilizing the curses, because it's supposed to be, how does she phrase this exactly? 500 years before, each of the realms were cursed, their strengths turned into their own personal poisons, each curse was uniquely wicked. Now, it's true that each curse was unique to each realm. Some of them do make sense, like how the starlings all die when they reach the age of 25. Well, stars are extremely long-lived, and so you've got uh, starlings that are now extremely short-lived. Sunlings can't go out in the sunlight. They're kind of like vampires that way because sunlight will like cause them to burst into flames and die. But wildlings, I don't understand because they're a very nature heavy uh, group. They get their power from nature itself. So I don't get how that turns them into like seductive Ardok Yachi for I guess that that's the best way I can put it. Like, what's the natural aspect there? Like, how is nature utilized against them in that regard? I, I guess you can sort of make an argument for, you know, needing to eat human hearts as sustenance, because that's like an aspect of nature, sort of? It's, it's definitely a stretch. Although it does become a logistical impossibility because if they or it's like survive exclusively on human hearts, how are you getting that many people? How are you getting that many hearts? Because it's suggested that, you know, thousands of wilding men and women had been killed off since, so I guess there was some degree of cannibalization within the realm, and they do have something of an excuse later on that doesn't actually answer the question. But it doesn't really feel like you're being punished through nature. Now, if they were deathly allergic to plants, for example, like in, if they brushed against the bark of a tree, then they would break out in a terrible rash like poison ivy or poison sumac or something, then I can see that being a little more effective. Maybe not quite as deadly as the other curses, so I actually wish that there was a database because I don't recall what the Skylings or the Nightshades curse is. I think the nightshades are allergic to darkness. So dressed up as she is, uh, Ela walks towards the uh, this area where a portal is supposed to appear every hundred years for the centennial, where she and she alone will walk through without weapons as part of a rant that I'm actually gonna break up in a little bit. I'm, uh. and you know, while the control over nature is on full display, flowers bloomed, spilled over the balcony, down the hall. People used to be able to grow entire forests with, a th with half a thought, move mountains with a flick of their wrists. Summon cats without even meaning to. Although it's actually true, uh, one of the elements that they can do, and this is something that I forgot uh, until just now, uh, they apparently do have an affinity with animals, and this is an element that never really shows up. Wilding powers varied in their mastery of nature, but they often included affinity with animals. Terra had a great panther named Shadow she spoke to as easily as she communicated with Ela. Poppy had a hummingbird that liked to nestle in her hair. I'm getting images of Dritz Duorden and Radagast the Brown. The wildling curse is that they kill anyone they fall in love with and to live exclusively on human hearts. Not sure how that is, but whatever. Apparently they can turn into beautiful monsters and kill with a single look. This has devastated the wildling population, reduced their number of men they've had, and forced the women to become warriors to supplement the ranks. Again, not a bad idea, but I do have questions on how this works. Would a secret crush be enough to kill someone? Do the wildlings feel obligated to kill the person they love, or do they inc uh, incidentally kill people when they feel love? 
If that was the case, then would you really want to encourage any kindness at all? As evidence later in the book, it's obvious that Aster doesn't have a problem with same-sex relationships, so one wrong comment from anyone, like the one that the Guardians had about Illa being pretty, could spark something unintentionally. For that matter, what about platonic love, like between siblings or parents and child? Is that enough to kill someone or cause a monster transformation? Also, how does the transformation work? Does Illa have to be in love to transform, or can she wake up looking like a succubus and realize that someone must have a crush on her? Questions about magic systems are great, but this is all sorts of unclear. Also, if Poppy's got a hummingbird that totally doesn't crap in her hair, why is she giving Ela any kind of crap about her hair being a mess? Like, there's no way Poppy's hair doesn't look like a literal bird's nest. So, moving on to chapter two, and this is when Ela actually arrives to Light Arc itself. And before we go too much further, I think it's important to break down how this world works geographically, because it doesn't really go into that much detail itself. At the center of everything, you've got Lightlark, and there are smaller islands that are branched out from the mainland of Lightlark. So you get uh, the very well-named Moon Isle for the Moonlings, and Sun Isle for the Sunlings, uh, Sky Isle. You'll never guess what the uh, Starling Isle is called. And there's also one for the Wildlings, Wild Isle, but that's been abandoned and everything on it is dead. More on that later. Surrounding all of that is the giant tsunami water wall storm thing. And outside of that, sporadically scattered around the world, are the Newlands. And that's where the majority, I believe, population of uh, all the different realms live. I mention this because there is already a population of all of the realms except for Wildlings and Nightshades on the, uh, on the mainland of Lightlark. Which is weird because Lightlark itself, according to the Inside Jacket, only appears for 100 days every 100 years. What happens to the people when the island supposedly isn't there? In all truth, the island actually is there, they just, they're cut off from the rest of the world, but this is impressively sloppy. Like, this is something that's discounted by the second chapter, but the, the inside jacket gives you a separate image from what's actually going on. Who proofread this? So I guess it's more accurate to say that every 100 years, portals open up on the Newlands to allow the rulers, and only the rulers, to step through and they all congregate at one spot in the mainland, and then they head to the mainland castle, and then the centennial begins for real. And Ela is the second person to arrive. She's actually beaten there by the nightshade ruler. The face belonging to the man looking down at her was amused, and familiar somehow. He was so tall, Ela had to tilt her chin to meet his eyes, black as coals. His hair spilled ink across his pale forehead. Nightshade, no question, which meant... Thank you, Grimshaw. I'm actually rather amused by the description of, you know, his hair spilled ink across his forehead. It, it kind of sounds like he's a 1950s style greaser and he put too much mousse or product in his hair and now it's just like dripping down. But no, this is the, uh, the ruler of the Nightshades who might as well just be like the, the grim, mysterious loner people. This is actually the first year that uh, the Nightshades have been invited to uh, to the Centennial, so that's an indication that things are getting desperate. Which is weird, considering part of the prophecy requires everyone be there and pair up, or at least that's the interpretation, so why they wouldn't be invited beforehand doesn't make sense, but I'm getting ahead of myself! The, the problem is, going through this book a second time, I notice all these contradictions with so much more clarity, because now I know what eventually it leads to, and it just, it doesn't work. Speaking of, you know, things that lead to other things, Ela gets the weird suspicion that she has met Grimjaw before, Grimshaw before, uh, I'm gonna keep doing that. Ela asks Grim if they've met before, and he says if we had, it wouldn't have been just once. This is what Aster likes to think is foreshadowing. The problem is it gets so lost in everything else that's introduced in this chapter that good luck remembering it. Now, part of the reason supposedly why Nightshades weren't invited to previous Centennials was because they had the power to spin curses. It's one of their many magic abilities. They're kind of the broad, whatever the plot needs them to be, power 
groups, and it has long since been suspected that uh, a nightshade, if not the entire realm, were somehow responsible for the, the curses being spun in the first place. Next comes Azul, the ruler of the Skylings. And in fact, like Grimm, both of them are ancient. They are over 500 years old, a commonality amongst the other rulers. And they were alive when the curses were, uh, were originally cast. Now, something that I find very disappointing is that even though I'm only on page 10, there's been almost no dialogue throughout the entire book so far. And dialogue is such a wonderful tool for expressing characterization. It's not always what a character says, but how they say it or how they provide some degree of information. For example, if you were to ask a character uh, what their least favorite subject in school was, then there are all sorts of avenues that you could approach for exploring the character as well as their viewpoint. Uh, if a character were to, instead of directly answering the question, go off on a rant about their least favorite subject's teacher, that would indicate that the teacher is perhaps the reason why they don't like that class. Like, um, uh, they don't like math class because their teacher, Mr. Smith, is such a jerk. He's so strict with everything and insists on a nonsense seating chart and, you know, never actually answers questions directly and makes you feel small. At that point, we understand that the problem isn't really math itself, but rather the person who's teaching it. And that can color in a viewpoint of uh, not just how the character sees things, but how, they, uh, how the teacher is viewed in general. There are a lot of tricks that you can put in with dialogue, but if you instead insist on just giving these info dumps like this entire book has been thus far, it becomes a slog to get through. It turns the book from a fantasy adventure into a textbook that you have to study. That's not nearly as engaging because you can't really do as much with your your imagination as a reader. Instead, we, like as far as storytelling goes, this is just and then style storytelling. So you've got this character who introduces this particular facet, and then this happens, and then this happens. And I bring that up because Aster's not completely incapable of utilizing this style of examining things through a character's perspective. For example, Ila has a couple of rocks on her fingers, like a couple of um, gems on her fingers instead. His bright eyes met hers, then studied her fingers, each covered in rings with gems as big as acorns. The comparison of a gem to an acorn is good because now we're comparing something familiar to an element of nature, something that Ela as a wildling should be uh, very familiar with. It colors in her viewpoint because this is what she uses to compare common elements. And that's an idea that follows somewhat in the next paragraph. To Ela, it was just a rock. Pretty, of course, but nothing in spades ever seemed too special. Jewels were made when great power was wielded over nature, and over the centuries the glittering gems had bloomed beneath the ground in the wilding Newland, rising up eventually, blossoming like flowers. And again, we get some verbiage to describe some connection to, uh, to nature, like how the gems bloomed beneath the ground, you know, uh, using comparative imagery to make the gems seem like flowers in that way. And Aster tries to use this to give a reason for why the wildlings, who sustained themselves entirely, exclusively on human hearts, haven't starved to death. Terra always said those glittering rocks were the reason they had such a steady supply of hearts. Thieves from other realms, foolish and bold and wicked, sneaked under their territory for the diamonds. Now, we don't get a lot of detail about how the wildlings really prepare hearts, if they just need to eat, like, a little segment and that's enough, or if they have to devour an entire heart as part of a meal. Like, do they need three square hearts a day? How do you actually supply the wildlings, whatever their population happens to be at this point, with enough hearts that they won't all starve to death? I don't care how many thieves you have invading the island. After a while, like 500 years of living like this, how are they actually getting enough sustenance? How are people so stupid as to walk onto this island, which is assuredly a death trap? How does this not spike some kind of war with other realms? Stop murdering and eating our people! Like, even if there are thieves, you'd figure after a while the, the like, the level at which they would have to be murdering and devouring other people's hearts 
would cause some sort of a concern with some other foreign government. It just boggles my mind, like, just thinking about this sort of thing, because it, it doesn't, it doesn't work logistically. I get the whole they have to eat hearts thing, that's fine, but for 500 years, they've lived like this. How frequently do they, do they actually get enough hearts? How often do they have to resort to cannibalizing other wildlings? Again, this is one of those elements that sounds cool at first, until you think about it for half a second. You won't believe how many times you get to say that when reading Light Lark. So anyway, because he seems to like it and Ela doesn't consider the rock very valuable, Ela gives the diamond that Azul was admiring to him. This will show up later. The next ruler to show up is Cleo, the ruler of the Moonlings. And she is actually older than anyone else, including the King of Light Lark. Cleo is perhaps the most egotistical out of all the rulers and will be one of the most antagonistic, but more on that later. The last person to arrive is uh, Celeste, the ruler of the Starlings. And this is where we're told that the Starlings cursed had been one of the cruelest because no one in their realm lived past the age of 25, which is another logistical nightmare. Take a moment to consider what the society would have to look like in regards to just bearing and raising children. Nothing beyond that, but the, the multitude of answers I'm sure you could come up with would create a very uncomfortable image. The best one that I can think of is you've got parents in their 20s who give birth to children, as many as they can reasonably pop out, I suppose. The children are then raised by completely separate people as their parents die before they can form any real memories. I'm sure that there are many worse situations that you can come up with, none of which will be confirmed or denied throughout the course of this book. The most that you can really claim is that there aren't really any experts in Starling society because no one lives that long. That is not the only logistical nightmare they have to contend with though, but the other one is a, is a massive plot hole that we will discuss much later. So everyone gets together and they start off towards the mainland castle on Light Lark, and Ela starts explaining a few things, like how Light Lark was a shining cliffy thing. Now, the rest of the paragraph actually describes the uh, island pretty effectively, but this opening line is like running a marathon, but breaking your ankle at the starting gate. Also, because Lightlark is the source of magic, Ela drinks in the island greedily, like the wine she was never allowed to touch, equally addictive and dangerous. This will come back later. It also makes me wonder if Ela is actually supposed to be under 21, but I don't know what the drinking age in this world is. I don't even know what the world is actually called. Lightlark is an island, not the planet. And some more intel about how Lightlark is built, like how Thousands of years ago, the island was cut into different pieces, so each realm could claim a shard. And we're told that Star Isle is for the Starlings, Sky Isle is for the Skylings, Moon Isle is for the Moonlings, and Sun Isle is for the Sunlings. And if that sounds redundant, congratulations, you are a more talented writer than Alex Astor. At one point I commented that Light Lark was like, Artless Listicles the book, because so many times, when Astor needs to get through a chunk of information quickly, she will, without any real creativity, just flat out list everything that these realms do, like, just like this. Instead of trying to color in the world or introduce it to us slowly and naturally, uh, it's just force-fed down our throats. One of my patrons actually had a pretty good comment on this and stated, you should deliver lore and exposition the way you give your child medicine. Occasional spoonfuls not tipping the whole thing into their mouth. Unfortunately, that is very much how most of the exposition in this book works. When you're giving exposition, you don't want to force it in wherever you can. You want to introduce it naturally and try to bring it in piecemeal where it's comfortable and where it flows well. It's one of those things you have to develop a, an understanding for the more you do it. Simply shoving it in there, because you can't think of anywhere else to put it, is not the way to go about writing. If it doesn't fit, 
find a new way to introduce it, or cut it entirely. I've had to do the same thing with my own book. It sucks, but it's like pruning a bonsai tree. It's better for the thing as a whole. We're also told that Lightlark is the home of Lightlark royalty, which currently is pretty much just Oro, the ruler of the Sunlings and the king of Lightlark. I don't know why that distinction is made, especially because he's pretty much condemned to this island and cannot interact with the rest of the world. It also doesn't seem to have any real importance, like him being king doesn't impact anything. At most, he gets some points for being what's called an origin, which I don't think is ever dis like defined. But he has blood from each of the four realms that still had a presence on the island, so he's got Sunling, Moonling, Starling, and Skyling. He is missing Nightshade and Wildling. This is important, believe it or not. And in a situation that is so frequent that you could actually make a drinking game out of it, Aster goes from describing the king, Oro, and then, for no reason, and with no real sequence, jumps, topic, uh, jumps topics entirely in the following paragraph. Because we're told the king is insufferable, and then immediately we're described a bit of magic that doesn't make any sense. Because we're told about the history of Lightlark, we're told about the royalty of Lightlark, we're told a little bit about Oro, the king of Lightlark, as a person, and then it jumps to this. On Lightlark and beyond, love had a price. Falling deeply and truly in love meant forming a bond that gave a beloved complete access to one's ability. They could do whatever they wished with it, wield it, reject it, even steal it. Love is a unique magic on Lightlark. How and why? Does it also imbue their curse? Does the one being stolen from lose their curse? What got this system started, and why does it manifest like this? Why is love the connective idea? Oh my god, I can't recall the last time I came across a magic system with so many details and rules, but with so little understanding. I have no idea what the fuck is going on, and my head is starting to hurt. Oh, also, Oro has all the abilities of the other realms, but only the curse of Sunlings, so... Guess that's fortunate. Now, like it or not, there is oftentimes a particular sort of science behind how magic works. Maybe it's that the, uh, the mana just manifests from a person's ability. Maybe you draw it out from uh, some sort of a font of power like the Sunwell in Warcraft. And through individual abilities or weapon enhancements or certain artifacts, people are able to channel power in any number of ways. There's a degree of understanding on the audience's behalf there as far as how all of this fits together, how well it works. But sometimes when you've got rules that are so specific, you have to break down the why is this here question. I'm gonna have more to talk about how the, the magic doesn't make sense later on, but try to try to ask this right now. Why does love function like this on this island? Do you think there's a, a history for it? Do you think there's a reason why it would manifest? Do you, like, is there some sort of a counter to it? Like, if love does this, what does hatred do? Or is this all a trite little plot point the author came up with just to drive the plot later on in the book? And if you ever come up with a plot point or a character or motivation or a magic system that exists purely to advance the plot, you are not doing your book a favor. If I can look at an element, like the mechanics of an element, and say, that makes sense for that character to do that. That makes sense for that piece of equipment to work that way. That makes sense for that law to be in place. Then that's good. That means you've got a cohesive story, or at least a, a cohesive element of a story. If I then look at something else like this magic love element, and my easiest conclusion is that uh, this is something the author needs to be in place so that the plot can advance for a dramatic twist in the third act. You done screwed up. Aster then tries to tie this love thing in with the discussion about Oro because knowing how many people wanted his endless stream of power, Oro was very untrusting, uh, paranoid, cold. Uh, Ela dreaded meeting him, especially given the first step of Poppy and Terra's plan for her. As they approached the mainland castle, Crowds of starlings, moonlings, and skylings waited for everybody. The complete absence of wildlings, though, reminded Ela that she was very alone on this island, as is Grimm. 
The two of them don't have any attendants. They're not there to lean on for advice like some of the other rulers seem to have later on in the story. Cause I'm all alone. There's no one here beside me. And in fact, this is an element that Grimm tries to use to get a little closer to Ela, being the man whore that he is. But you gotta have free. Stop singing! It was unnerving. Her skin felt inexplicably electric. So the uh, obvious love triangle that uh, Astra is building is already underway. You <laughs> <laughs> there was also a war between Nightshade and Lightlark, which does not help Nightshade's perception on Lightlark. And this is an element that will be mentioned numerous times throughout the rest of the book and never really deeply explored. Ela is led to her chambers and someone has planted an oak tree in the middle of the room. It's interesting because a lot of the hallways are described as dark and gloomy. Uh, at one point she compares the castle to a prison, so I have to wonder how the tree's getting enough sunlight, especially because as the king is a sunling, he can't have too much sunlight pouring in. It would kill him. An element that isn't really described very well on page 15 because it says, Sunlings have been cursed never to feel the warmth of sunlight or see the brightness of day, forced to shun that which gave them power. And so that explains that the king uh, is forced into the darkness and uh, to compensate for light, he has furnaces and torches burning at all hours of the day. What it doesn't tell you is that stepping into the sunlight actually would lead to his death. When I first read this, I wasn't entirely sure on how dire this curse really was. He was cut off from sunlight, okay, but does that mean like he literally can't observe sunlight? Like he can't process uh, the, the concept of sunlight, or is he like, is there some sort of a barrier stopping him from uh, feeling the warmth, seeing the light? No, Aster instead went with the more poetic flowery prose, which doesn't give a clear image until much later when she confirms that sunlings are like vampires in that way. Going out into the sunlight will kill them. Burn them to death, in fact. It is the author's assumption. The author figured that she had established enough information for the reader to understand what she was talking about, and she, in fact, had not. This is the first of many, 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 many examples of this. And it's important that Oro stay healthy and alive because... The King of Lightlark didn't just control its power, he was its power. If something happened to him, the entire land would crumble away and every Lightlark realm would fall. Now keep this in mind as we go over the rules of the Centennial because the risk this imposes on the entire planet is substantial. Ela spends the rest of the time before dinner getting used to the rest of the room when there's a knock at her door and it's Celeste. Ela immediately threw her arms around the starling ruler. They jumped in a tiny circle, embracing and laughing so hard, Ela kicked the door closed to keep it from echoing down the hall. It turns out that Ela and Celeste had a, a secret alliance that uh, they're working together behind the scenes. See, Ela was able to use her star stick to teleport to the starling Newlands, where she met Celeste, and uh, the, the two of them hit it off to the point where at one point it says that they were having slumber parties, which is remarkably lucky, considering that Ela's guardians could have stepped in and checked down her uh, in her room, isolated at any time. There's presumably a reason why that's not a concern, but the reason that doesn't work is because the first time you're going through this book, if you think of that, you realize how flimsy, how lucky so much of the plotting in this book is. So it's like, yeah, there's an explanation for it, but you don't get that for another 300-ish pages. But we get a bit more information about the star stick. Ela discovered among her, mo uh, her mother's things five years prior, and she's been playing around with it ever since. And apparently it is an ancient starling relic. And even though it apparently belongs to the Starlings, Celeste had never asked for it back. That marked the start of their friendship. And yes, that does raise the question of how did uh, Ela's mother get the star stick in the first place. That does get answered. 
And it's disappointing. What's unfortunate in this moment is that there is now a built-in reason for why Ela wouldn't always have access to the star stick, which will become a plot hole in a, numer a number of occasions later on. She could give it to Celeste for safekeeping because there are numerous times where she has to go and uh, infiltrate other locations as part of this mission that she's got. Not only will this never actually happen, it will never even be brought up with any kind of awareness, so I'm not sure how much of a plot hole Aster is aware that she's created for herself. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So because she was so young, to get her ready for the centennial, Poppy and Tara trained Ela however frequently it ended up being. She was trained in a whole series of different skills and strengths and stamina building, all because Poppy and Tara had a plan for Ela to carry out in order to guarantee success, or get a chance for success, I suppose, uh, when competing in the Centennial. Too bad Ela had her own plan. Ela had never agreed with Poppy and Tara's plan. It was too complex, too demeaning. This is something I'm going to be making fun of for a good long while now. The plan that Poppy and Tara came up with has one step. Seduce the king. That's it. That's so complex. Demeaning you can make an argument for, but complex? Come on. Because the plan that she comes up with, with Celeste, is so overly complicated, so based on nothing substantial for evidence. It's just, it's the core of like the first half of the book's plot. And it's so dumb. It's so dumb. Oh, it's so dumb, it's brilliant. No, it's just dumb. And unlike Glass Onion, that's not the point. After the visit with Celeste, the day rolls on and eventually it's the evening. The sun had fallen. It was just a yoki thing. I don't trust the look of that sun. But what? Go left, Harry! Ah! Darn. I almost had him. And to calm her nerves as she feels a bit anxious and lonely, not unreasonable considering the circumstances, Ila begins to sing. Singing was a wildling thing, a temptress thing, just like their sisters, the Sirens of the Sea. This happens to be a kind of irrelevant footnote because we never really see sirens at all later on. And it also raises the questions of how does that like manifest with other realms? Like did the sirens get in the way of people trying to invade the wildling isles, newlands for, for the jewels? Wouldn't that have an impact on their heart gathering? But it doesn't really matter because the sirens never actually show up. But do keep that in mind because there are going to be certain ancient creatures of Lightlark that we see later on. And um, just just remember the sirens for now. But Ela goes out to the balcony to sing. And as she concludes, suddenly there's clapping from somewhere. And this startles her so she actually falls over the ledge of the balcony. Which makes me wonder if there's actually a safety railing or anything here. I just want a railing. You know, one railing, right here. Yeah, I know. I've almost fallen over that thing so many times. So Ela falls into the sea and then wakes up in the middle of her room in the next scene. Someone had rescued her, then dumped her in the middle of her room without bothering to see if she would wake up. Peter, what the hell? You chose a turkey over me? I almost died. I swear to God, I thought dogs could breathe underwater. Yes, the uh, Centennial is so dangerous and so disastrous that someone had to rescue Ela on her first night there. I truly believe that her life is at risk. We then get a bit more of an info dump about how the first night that the uh, curses were spun, apparently the six rulers of the realm sacrificed themselves in exchange for a prophecy that was promised to be the key to breaking the curses. And the prophecy to break the curses, which we will get much, much later in the book, uh, has three parts which had been uh, interpreted in several ways throughout the centuries. One was clear, for the curses to be eradicated, one of the six rulers had to die. Which again raises the question, why haven't they been inviting the Nightshades to this? Now, before you point out that it doesn't make any sense that all of the rulers convened at the same spot, why doesn't someone just ambush them there? There's 
actually are a couple of rules in place. Still, there's a group on the island that would ex do exactly that and tries exactly that later on, so I'm not sure why this is set up the way that it is, because this condition is listed and then later on in, I believe it's in this chap, no, sorry, the next chapter, uh, it's revealed that there are steps that the other rulers have to honor in order for the prophecy to actually come true. Your first time going through this book, if you're like actually thinking critically as you read it, you would come across this section, like one of the rulers had to die. It's like, okay, then why don't they murder each other when they are first there on the island? But it's dinner time and Ela walks in still drenching wet from her little impromptu dive into the sea, where she comes to the conclusion that it must have been Oro who had saved her. And even though we get this large chunk of exposition in such a way that it actually breaks the pacing of the moment because Ela walks into the room where all the other rulers are waiting so they can have dinner together, we then get a full page of exposition before anyone actually responds to Ela being there, so it's like, what is narrative flow? Oro makes a quick comment on Ela having jumped into the sea, and then Cleo decides to take a little dig at uh, Ela's expense. Cleo's eyes glittered with amusement, relishing the red that Ela uh, could feel spreading across her cheeks. A swim in that sea? At this hour? She certainly is a wild pet. Even a moonling wouldn't think to do such a thing during the centennial. Only a fool would. Not great dialogue, doesn't really sound natural or the way that a person would talk. It's almost like this is written just to give Ela a reason to say this. Certainly not on a full moon, Ela said smoothly, the words slipping out before she could stop herself. Silence. And Ela said this so that Asher could introduce what the Moonling curse was. And the Moonling curse is the dumbest one. Moonling's curse meant that every full moon the sea claimed dozens of lives from their realm, drowning anyone who found themselves too close to the coast. It made faraway trade nearly impossible, made living near the ocean a danger, and had completely crippled the Moonling economy. The sea is always right! So, moon, tides, there's a connection there, I can work with that, that's fine. Except, you're talking about a curse that operates on a schedule. That means that once a month, all you gotta do to stop the curse is go to bed early. That's it. Once night falls on a full moon, just go to bed early. This is in fact a solution that they utilize later on in the story, where they're on the moon isle, and it's the full moon night, so all the moonlings get into one castle, somewhere near the coast for some reason, don't ask me why, and the waves can't actually crash through the walls, so nobody dies. We're led to believe that, like, ships at sea would be pulled under anyone walking the streets. The waves would come in, grab them, and drag them out to sea. And that's dramatic and all, but why would you be outside when you know that the sea is going out of its way to try to kill you? And it's not like something compels them to walk into the waters. Like, it literally, it just reaches out and tries to grab them. But if they're behind strong enough walls, it can't get to them. And keep in mind, we don't know what the Moonling Newlands look like, so it is very possible that all they have to do there is move deeper inland. It's entirely possible that their Newlands are a continent, and they have ample space to stay away from the ocean. It's not like they have to worry about drowning in the toilet. This curse is so weak, it is actually defeated by taking a nap on a couch. We also get a line confirming that, uh, Ela is the youngest and least experienced ruler present, and considering that Celeste has to be younger than 25, we can assume that Ela is younger even than that. And most of the rest of the rulers were around when the curses were spun, so at their youngest, we're talking about five and a half centuries old here. And there is a love triangle between Ela and two of the other rulers. Lightlark. For the people who thought that the age gap in Twilight wasn't big enough. So Ela's comment pisses off Cleo, and Ela confirms that she has made her first enemy. But before anyone could say another word, a plate was placed in front of Ela. On it sat a bleeding heart. Oro confirms that it was sourced from the worst of his prisons, a murderer of women. 
We all know that eating local food is great for the local economy. Ela tries to excuse herself and Oro says, nonsense, eat, and Ela takes a bite. And the chapter ends with her uh, apparently spending the night retching blood. And in the opening of the next chapter, it's confirmed that she was born without the wildlings curse or their power. And unfortunately, this chapter has so many exposition dumps that really start to interfere with other elements that have already been introduced and don't actually make sense on their own logically. For example, one of the opening things about how as, uh, Ela's mother died, I've got a, a, a note for just that that takes up like half a page on my Word document here. So we get a breakdown of why Ela doesn't have any powers and she feels like a lot of the blame falls on her mother. Her mother was to blame. She broke the most important wilding rule. She fell in love. Then she tried to kill him. Tara and Poppy always said there were consequences to breaking rules, and that no matter what, curses always found their blood. Ela's father had murdered her mother moments after Ela was born, and their spawn was powerless. Her own curse, as a consequence of her mother somehow thwarting the first. Ela's malediction was not eating hearts or killing a beloved but being a ruler born without powers was just as deadly. And I'm sure that this has raised a lot of confusion in a lot of you listening to this. I don't blame you at all, because having read through this full thing, I can't explain it either, even with later context. This is really stupid. It only took until chapter 4 for Aster to shatter the immersion of her own story. So Hila doesn't have a curse because her mother broke the rules by falling in love, then she didn't kill the father. So, do they have a choice in the matter? I assumed they were under a powerful compulsion that controlled their desire or instincts or something, or maybe a loving glance doled out heart attacks. I don't know. Then the father murdered the mother. Apparently the curse compelled him to murder the mother, which begs the question of how flexible are these curses? Are they managed or overseen by some unknown force? What is implemented to keep it in place, and how did Elo's mother break it? This shatters the reality of the book's backstory, and it looks so hastily cobbled together that I'm at a loss for words. Also, how does this spare Ela from the curse? If curses always found their blood, then why didn't it find Ela? This looks like a tremendous oversight and design, and not a simple one like the door is slightly crooked. This is like you built a skyscraper, but you left walls off one side of the building. Even worse, I don't read this with the assumption that Ela is some destined hero or something like the author might intend. This reads like Aster wanted Ela to be more relatable to readers, so now she isn't afflicted by that gross heart-eating thing. She has a reason to fall in love. Uh, later in the story without consequence, and the bland description of who Ila is and what she looks like sounds more like the reader is meant to implant themselves in her place, especially considering that she's only 18 to 24 somewhere, I guess, really targeting the demographic directly. And even with what I know later on, with what information is revealed at the very end, I can tell you that these notes stay in place. I don't understand how Ela's mother broke the curse. I don't understand why her non-curse manifested the way that it did. It actually conflicts with something that we are going to get to in a little bit. Stuff like this is why I think that re-watching this video might make a lot of sense once you get a grander understanding of everything in Light Lark. Because once you understand, like, Ela's full backstory, oh my god! How is any of this supposed to make sense? This is also why you need to attack your own story. Try to come at it offensively, like go after your character's motivations, go after the elements in your world building, attack your magic system. Because if your magic system doesn't live up to the slightest bit of scrutiny like this one does, then you'll be able to come up with counters for it, put things in place to explain, you know, why this rule is the way this is. Why the history of this place is the way that it is. Don't just come up with a magic system, come up with mechanics to explain the magic system. Start with something basic and then explore the possibilities. Get creative. Get weird if you have to. Just make it make sense. Now, Ela not having powers is something that is uh, not just dangerous because she thinks that this puts her at 
special risk uh, within the Centennial, it also does directly impact her realm. Rulers were expected to inject their power into the lands to keep their people strong. It was why Lightlark was so engorged with energy, and how realms had survived in the Newlands they had formed uh, after they had fled the island. Without power to give, her realm was steadily dying. So far, her people had blamed the curses and length of time away from Lightlark for the deaths, but some were beginning to, be, uh, to become suspicious of Hela. Now keep this particular element in mind. It's one of those things that you're going to come back to at the very end, and you're going to realize that it doesn't actually work. I swear to God, the climax of this story ruins so much of the understanding we had of the book and compounds it on a degree that I didn't know could be done. This also establishes a very important rule within the story. One of the six rulers had to die to break the curses, according to the Oracle's prophecy. But it was worse than that. A ruler's power was the life force of their people. So if one died without an heir, all their people would die along with them. And the way that this is utilized, it's not like distant family or cousins or anything can come up. It's like, it's directly familial. If you don't have kids, you don't have an heir. Very simplistic in that way. There's not like some sort of a political lineage that you could reach out to and try to find a distant uncle or whatever. This, of course, raises a number of questions. Because rulers are the life force of their people, if a ruler dies without an heir, their people die with them. Higher stakes for Ela here are good, but the idea of heirs does raise a few questions. Assuming rulers have similar sex life to regular humans, they could have dozens of heirs. Are there assassination attempts to take over? What are their duties? Are people still fertile after 400 or 500 years? Is there a magic power transfer if the ruler dies at the centennial so an heir inherits their parents' power? Uh, is there a ceremony to ensure that the new ruler gets the power, or does the magic work all on its own? Now, I will say it is incredibly fortunate that none of the current rulers actually had an existing heir before the curses were spun. Not a single one of them had a single kid, which is remarkable, all things considered. Like, the likelihood that they could have had, like, some sort of a mysterious son or daughter out there somewhere. Especially someone like Grimm, who I would assume is such a horn dog at this point, he's gotta walk around with a whole series of contraceptives at all times. But because the prophecy doesn't make any sense, the first centennial was a bloodbath, and because of that, and a lot of people dying unnecessarily, it was decided that afterwards there would be rules. The next night, Oro invites all the rulers to, uh, to gather to discuss the rules and to swear by them, and we get a line that says that Celeste uh, looked well-rested, her skin vibrant. Uh, she must have, or Ila imagined her friend had visited Star Isle for the first time that morning which will be important in a few minutes, keep that in mind. Also, because Lightlark is cut off from the rest of the world for most of the hundred years, like the little isles that uh, the Skylings, Starlings, and Moonlings had all have their own sub-governments, which isn't bad, but considering that they are completely separated from their actual rulers, it makes me wonder how anything is really decided or how we don't get any kind of a major cultural shift. Even with brief visits every hundred years to set things straight, you'd figure that after a while, people would figure, you know what? The rulers have been doing this for like 400 years, 500 years, and they haven't accomplished anything. Why do we even still listen to them? And all of a sudden there's a revolution and someone stabs Cleo in the head with a pike. To the guillotine. Chop, 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 chop. But anyway, Oro convenes all of the rulers and they uh, start by, dis by stating the rules of the Centennial, which is fantastic, except by this point, I still don't know what the Centennial even is. And for proof of concept, I challenge any of you watching to try to describe the Centennial yourselves using all the information that has been provided thus far. The first rule. A ruler may not assassinate or attempt to assassinate another ruler until after the 50th day. After the chaos of the first centennial, the 100 days became more structured, split into parts. The first 25 days were de uh, dedicated to demonstrations hosted by each ruler, designed to test one another's strengths and worthiness of staying alive. Each test had a winner. The ruler who won the most trials would decide which pairs the rulers would split into for the remainder of the centennial. Now, the demonstrations themselves are largely useless to the plot for the most part. The, they just need to be summed up at the very end uh, in order to establish a winner who will then break the uh, other rulers into teams. Aside from that, 
they're almost entirely pointless because this whole proving worthiness thing is it never manifests. It's a waste. There is one that Ela and Celeste utilize as part of their plan, and I do think it's clever because it actually meshes in well with their plan, but it's really the only one that I can say that about. The others are either forgettable or laughable. The second rule, all rulers must attend and participate in every centennial event. That rule seemed innocuous, but was dangerous depending upon what it was. That's less of a rule for the sake of the prophecy and more one for the sake of the plot because there is a semi-ceremony on the 50th and the 75th day and they're written like that as kind of an attendance is mandatory sort of a front. Really, it's an excuse to get the characters all in one location together. The third rule, to participate, no ruler can have an heir so their death would successfully eliminate their familial line and break the curses according to the prophecy. It would also mean the end of their realm forever. Forever! 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 Yeah, so like I said before, it's kind of ridiculous how fortunate it is that none of the rulers happen to have kids beforehand or if they did, were those kids murdered? And of course, we don't actually know how the power flows through other people, so it's possible that Air could have uh, referred to like a nephew or a niece. I mean, it worked that way for Downton Abbey, episode one. They're discussing the ownership of the manor because like the uh, intended Air died on the Titanic. Of course, the darker implication there is that they may have had heirs beforehand who were summarily killed off the actual specifics of which might actually be up the individual headcanon. The centennial rules are weak since they don't define how anything really works, but the third rule is the dumbest. No ruler can have an heir. At least four of these people are over 500 years old. How would any of them not have heirs? Are heirs something different in this universe? Il was made an heir when she was a few seconds old, so there's clearly a familial link. Do they abandon their heirs? How does magic react to or acknowledge that? How do they go 500 years without an heir when they could die from anything at any time, like Ela's mother did. And if that happens, their realm is screwed. Now the explanation of the rule is after it's listed is that uh, this is how the curse is broken by eliminating a family line. However, this means that if a realm dies as a whole, as the prose explained three pages ago, this means the death of all their, page, uh, all their people. And keep in mind, of course, without heirs, there is a significant risk to the rulers and all of the people because if the ruler trips down the stairs the wrong way and breaks their neck, there you go! Whole realm dead. That's discounting illness, that's discounting assassination, that's discounting any number of accidents that can happen around the place. The razor's edge that everyone is living just to get to this point and not participating in the centennial, I mean, they are one wet floor away from a realm-wide genocide. I can appreciate high stakes, but they need to make sense. And speaking of not making sense, this is one of my favorite mistakes that Aster makes in the entire book. Everyone decides to agree to these rules by effectively signing in blood, but they don't just sign away on a piece of paper in blood. Oro stokes a quick fire, and then they all prick their fingers, and this happens. Before she offered the stream of blood to the flames, there was another part to the ceremony that she had practiced. Each ruler's blood had special properties in accordance with their abilities. Wildling blood was supposed to bloom flowers. Ela was prepared, petals hidden between her fingers. When her blood finally dripped down her palm, it held a miniature rose. Cleo's blood hardened into ice before being seared by the fire. Grimm's blood became dark as ink. Azul's blood suspended in the air, separating into parts before finally falling. Celeste's blood burst into a mess of sparks. Oro's blood burned brightly before even reaching the flames. All of the rulers have magic blood. I don't know if this extends to everyone in their realms. I am willing for now just to argue that it, this is just the rulers. This is a phenomenally stupid feature. Now, when you are establishing your magic system, you have to consider the small moments that would otherwise shatter the immersion or the logic of the world. And that is something that Aster failed to consider, as I'm sure many of you are rolling your eyes at right now. Because think about how commonplace blood is in your life. Ela 
doesn't have powers, so she has to cheat in order to do this, you know, trick people into thinking that her blood is just like theirs. Okay, in this moment, in this context, that works. But if Ela ever bleeds in front of anyone else, the immediate question that they should have should be, why isn't your blood doing the thing? Do the thing. Likewise, if any of the other rulers bleed, for whatever reason, their blood should do the thing, and we should get some sort of a description thereof. This is, in fact, something that is ignored by the author until the very end of the book. Which I would almost call a shame, because I kind of like the aspect of magic blood in this world, but Aster never does anything with it. Like, on the contrary, this becomes one of the greatest questions that... that never gets raised by anyone, because there are multiple occasions where Ela gets nicked by this or that in front of somebody, and they never raise the question of, what's going on here? There's a moment, I want to say, about a third of the way through the book, where she's out uh, exploring the island with Oro, and she gets attacked by some magic vines that stab her a few times, and she bleeds, and nothing happens. Now, maybe, maybe, when the vines were attacking her, some, like, rose petals fell about, and we're supposed to take that as, like, cover for her blood not doing the thing, but that's a stretch at best, especially because I don't recall that actually being described. But, more broadly speaking, think about how much of a problem that would actually be for the other characters, because it's actually pretty common to, like, go out for a hike and like, brush against a, a vine or a thorn bush and bleed that way, or maybe you cut yourself shaving, or maybe for women, I'm sure you can fill this gap in here. Getting some blood on your underwear once a month is bad enough. Setting your underwear on fire once a month. You need fire-resistant pads. <laughs> and for anyone who wants to defend the light lark, please explain to me how I'm wrong in my assessment here. Because I'd love to know. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. I've gone over this particular section like five times. It's not a special fire. They don't use special knives. They actually use their crowns to cut their fingers. Uh, they're not like reacting to the table. The table's not magic for anything. It's just their blood has special properties. That's it. And Aster does in fact ignore this rule. Like, I'm on page 30, she doesn't bring it up again until 383. This much of the book forgets this rule is in place. I promise you, that is not a nitpick. The next morning, there is a knock on Ela's door, and we ignore that knock as the rest of the page details other things, like what Ela was allowed to bring in her trunk. And this is something that Aster does so often, you could do a separate drinking game on it. She will introduce an element, then she will switch topics with no cohesion at all, and eventually come back to it, like a page later. There were plenty of times, and granted, this is partially my fault because of how I was reading and taking notes of this, but there were plenty of times where I would be reading along, taking notes, and then I would come back and all of a sudden some character is just like walking into the room with no introduction. And it's like, when the hell did you get here? But it turns out that because I spent so much time writing so many bloody detailed notes that I had forgotten that the character knocked on the door a page ago. But this inconsistent break in flow narrative just is indicative of Aster's writing style. And it is so frustrating because there is no rhyme or reason to why the story flows the way that it does. It's like trying to have more than one conversation with people at the same time. But while Ela makes the person knocking on the door wait, she goes over a few thoughts about what she was allowed to bring to the island. She hadn't been allowed weapons, but she had been allowed a trunk of belongings. Granted, we never saw that trunk of belongings when she stepped through the portal, so I'm not sure where it came from, but whatever! It also doesn't make sense that she's not allowed to have weapons, but that is a note for a little bit. A lot of the dresses that Ela has in her trunk are, uh, very revealing, shall we say, and they go along with the plan that uh, Poppy and Tara had for her, and well, that reason made Ela want to throw all of them into the closest fireplace. But then we get another listicle as Aster details the colors that various realms are allowed to uh, adorn themselves in, 
And it's stupid. That day, she chose a dress the pink of tulips, with a plunging back and fabric that clung to her like it was wet. It was tradition to wear the color of one's power source. Starlings wore silver. Sunlings wore gold. Skylings wore light blue. Nightshades wore black. And moonlings wore white. And I hate that this is listed out the way that it is, because this is something that was done uh, earlier on when the rulers were all introduced, when they all appeared at the uh, portal. Everyone was given a brief description as to what they were wearing. Even Ela had the, uh, the green dress, despite a complete lack of any other description about her character. So having everything listed like this just feels unnecessary, especially because you can continue to detail that the rulers wore a particular scheme. Like, after a while, the reader will pick up on the pattern. But maybe the pattern isn't the problem. Maybe the problem is that Aster needs you to really understand how super special awesome Ela is. Because nature was multicolored, Ela was not bound to one shade as long as it did not infringe upon anyone else's. So yeah, nature is in fact multicolored. You know what else is? The sky, stars, and depending upon how liberally you want to apply this, moons. This feels like such an arbitrary way to make Ela stand out. Like, who cares about the color schemes? Like, you can have a central color scheme, but why limit your characters to just that? Why not make it, like, the core thing and then have uh, highlights or uh, complementary colors that go along with it, like on the fringes of one's dress or suit? This feels like it was written just to give Ela more reason to stand out, not to establish deeper world building. The world building in this book is about as shallow as a puddle of cat barf. But then we get back to the topic that was introduced at the beginning of the chapter, the girl who knocked on Ela's door. And this indicates one of the main reasons why I hate the way dialogue is utilized when it's utilized. There's so little characterization, there's like no introduction, you just get this. The starling girl startled when Ela answered the door so quickly. Ela did not waste a moment. What is your name? She asked. No, hello, no, how you doing? It's just, who the hell are you? And this is done to get the story moving as quickly as possible. Why waste time on people actually acting like people or adding some degree of nuance or realism to your story when you can just move things along as fast as possible because, oh my God, guys, the world is so deep and interesting. Astro's got to tell you all about it. I feel like I'm more animated in describing this book than usual because I feel like this is the complete antithesis to how I write. I feel like this isn't a good example to use because, aside from my beta readers, no one's read my novel yet, but I spent literally years researching various topics to make sure that my world building and my nomenclature was as airtight as I could make it. I have a, a series Bible that's 39 pages long, just detailing various aspects of the history of the world going back 75,000 years. I have dredged up, like, etymology in Old Polish going back several centuries just to pick up niche words to detail, like, like give names to certain aspects. I've even gone so far as to pretend to understand multidimensional travel in order to fully comprehend some of the more minute elements of what I'm talking about, because I want to understand every aspect of what I'm writing about. I question myself routinely about this element, that element, this place, the biology of the monsters. I want to be the foremost expert of my series to the point where I can answer almost any reasonable question that anyone throws at me. I have already asked dozens of questions about this and we're on chapter five. It's just frustrating to me because a lot of these are really obvious questions and even though most of the book works to service the climax, most of the elements that are brought in are brought in just so we can have everything in the climax explained. And that's it. Logic between then and now doesn't matter. So anyway, the woman at the door is Ella, and she is going to be Ella's attendant. And Ella notices rather bluntly that Ella walks with a limp. Now, Ella asks why doesn't uh, Ella just go to a moonling for healing, because aside from controlling water, Moonlings are also able to heal, so yes, they are pretty much like waterbenders. 
Um, hi. Are you Yagoda? Are you here for the healing lesson? I honestly have to question how many elements of this book were lifted from other stories. Well, Ella explains that she is a starling and she's almost 25, so what would the point be of healing her? She's going to be dead soon anyway. To which, Ella pulls out a, uh, a tub of paste, which is a wildling healing elixir made from specially grown flora. And she gives it to Ella and this in turn becomes how Ella gets her meals because she can't eat hearts but she can't let others know that she can't eat hearts and i guess Ella's indebted enough that she's not going to rat on her so now Ella's going to be delivering food to Ella in secret in between other events within the story okay good so with the minor detail of eating settled Ella goes out into town because she needs to do some shopping and she's heading to a place called the Agora, basically a marketplace out in town. And I will give Aster some credit here. Agora is apparently an old Greek word, so at least she is capable of doing some research. While she's heading out to the Agora, Ela runs into Grimm, who just kind of follows her along because he hates walking alone. He's turning this opportunity to try to flirt with her a little bit. Okay, a bit of character. We, we do need that from him. And we get a little bit of information about Grimm and Nightshades, like how varied their powers are. They can disappear, move through walls, spin nightmares, wield darkness itself. Darkness imprisoning me, all that I see. Absolute horror. I don't know the words. Super kitty destruction time. More info about Grimm. Apparently he had a reputation uh, as there had been a war between Lightlark and Nightshade just decades before the curses were spun and he had been the most fearsome warrior. Which only made his clear discomfort at Ila eating a heart at dinner more confusing. Why would he care about that? Because, you know, slaughtering your enemies and eating their hearts are totally the same thing. I actually wrote in my note, how is that confusing? Eating a heart is very different from getting a bit dirty during combat. The real shame of so much of the world building ideas being thrust out into the open so blandly is that they aren't bad ideas intrinsically. Different aspects of other realms could have been held back from the reader for the sake of intrigue. Different powers or blood abilities or colors of their clothes could have been uh, could have kept the readers guessing. The fact that Aster didn't have the talent in her writing or the faith in her readers to figure this out is a core problem of the book. We also learned that mind abilities were common in Nightshades, which leads Ela to wonder if Grimm is actually reading her mind. He certainly seems to know a lot about her. He also comments that it's been 500 years since he's been on Lightlark, and almost nothing has changed. And then switches topics and asks if Ela can have chocolate, to which she responds, I can eat my weight in it. Which is a very strange thing for a wildling, because keep in mind, they are supposed to sustain themselves exclusively on human hearts. Now, I suppose she can have stump, like junk food on the side that won't really impact her. Like, maybe she can eat a pizza, but she won't gain any nutrients from it. That's speculative on my part, but I am willing to accept that leniency for the sake of the story. It still sounds sloppy. So Grimm takes Ela to a chocolatier where he orders two of everything and then pulls out a handful of coin from his pocket, not counting it, and then just sets it on the counter, not even making eye contact with the uh, clerk, showing how little regard he actually has for other people. And then he starts feeding chocolate to Ela. Before she could ask for clarification, he plucked a truffle between two enormous fingers. Try this one first. She attentively took it, chewed it, and her eyes bulged. Divine, isn't it? Ela sank into her chair, her head lolling back. She shouldn't be wasting precious time on a chocolate tasting. But getting to know the nightshade, perhaps getting him to trust her, could be useful. She closed her eyes, caramel on her tongue. Wake me up when all this is over. A chuckle. Eyes still closed, she felt something rough against her lips. Open. Open the mouth. She did, and Grimm dropped another truffle against her tongue. This one had a berry cream filling, a hard outer shell. These two are flirting, and everything we know about both of them can fit on a single post-it note. Like, this is really forcing the issue. Okay, I get it. There's supposed to be, like, some sort of a love interest thing budding here for the sake of the story and some drama later on, but it has to make sense. We barely know anything about either one of these two. 
And granted, there is an explanation for why Grimm would be acting like this that's revealed much later in the story because a lot of this is supposed to be cyclical, but right now, going through the, the first time, this just comes off as confusing. Why are they acting like this when they barely know each other? This is forcing the issue because the reader doesn't have enough context between these two as characters to really bring any sort of a link. Like, I honestly, by this point, can hardly describe anything about either one of these two. Why would anyone want to ship them? Who should I ship today? Ah! <laughs> Shortly after that, Grimm gives Ela a, uh, what was this? Chili pepper powder praline and insists that it's not that spicy, but it actually sets Ela's mouth on fire. So he goes through a counter as if it was nothing to get her a jug of milk. Now, this could have been a good way to really unleash his ability to walk through things if this wasn't so benign. It just comes off as odd. Like, the counter can't be that long, so, like, why not just walk around it? It's not like you've got to walk through a locked door to save a starving baby or something. But after that brief flirting scene, Ela continues on her way. Grim goes somewhere else, and Ela finds herself uh, at, a, uh, at a tailor's. And this is a tailor that uses only giant spider silk in his shop. It doesn't stain, it's strong as steel, and the fit is unparalleled. And this particular tailor is actually a starling, and I will say, this is Aster actually utilizing this introduction well, because this is how we learn that starlings are actually telekinetic. He pointed a finger and a spool of rich, Blood-red fabric flew across the room, wrapping around Ela in a flash, so fast that it replaced the pink she had been wearing before, and she only realized it when she saw her old dress and ribbons on the floor. And he then finishes up a new dress, using Ela as a mannequin to model it, somehow not stabbing her in the process. I'm curious if there are any, like, dressmakers or tailors out there reading this section and screaming, What are you doing?! What? No! Fuck no! Did you get this one off the discount rack? Ela then asks for several more dresses in green, red, purples, and pinks. Because remember, the other realms have to be monochrome. Ela is special. She gets to have more than one color clothing. And as she's leaving the tailors, she runs into Grimm again. And Grimm gives her a hint, because apparently his demonstration is going to be the first one. And she's going to need a sword. Which raises the question, if they sell swords anyway, here in the marketplace. She ends up buying one between chapters. So why couldn't she bring any of her own swords? Why is this distinction in place? Is it to regulate the type of weapons that are on the island? Is it meant to restrict outside magic from infiltrating the island? Is it a way to bolster the local economy? I doubt this will be explained, which is a good way to demonstrate that Astrid never thought her story through very well. It turns out that there actually is a reason because Ela gets her sword from a starling shop, and this is something that has to be in place in order to occur during the climax. The levels of things that have to be forced in awkwardly in order for the climax to actually manifest the way the author wants is astonishing. But Ela takes a new sword, we don't know what type of it is, it's, it's just described as a sword, and she brings it to Celeste to show off. And that's when we learn that Celeste is kind of an idiot. Ela had long ago learned that the Starling didn't have the same appreciation for weapons, though her realm was famous for making them with their proprietary techniques and metals. Why would she? Celeste had the power of energy at her fingertips. She could wound an enemy from across the room. In her eyes, a sword was a clunky misuse of iron. Now, unfortunately, this is an aspect that is never really detailed, so I can't say for certain how literally we're supposed to take this, but we know that Celeste is telekinetic. She can fling an enemy from across the room and do any number of things that way. Just like spin them up in the air, smash them into the ground, throw them under a a meat hook, whatever. As far as wounding them from across the room, does that mean that she can, like, tear them in half? Can she, in fact, dismember an opponent with just her mind? With my freaking mind? Because if it's just basic telekinesis where she can fling people to and fro, like, you know, Jedi push and pull powers, then she is incredibly short-sighted because the things that she'd be able to do with the right kind of weapon and a touch of telekinesis is astonishing. Case in point, Alucard from Castlevania. And even if you do want to argue that this sword is magically enchanted and it's not actually telekinesis, 
Functionally, it's the same thing. My point still stands. But this is the chapter where we also discover what the plan that Ila and Celeste have cooked up together is. They're looking for an ancient relic known as the Bond Breaker. No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. The Bond Breaker. That was their plan. In a room full of manuscripts taken from Lightlark, Celeste had discovered a text speaking of an enchanted relic. A giant glass needle with two sharp points on either side that could break any bond that imprisoned a person and their family line, including curses. And apparently this comes at a cost because the bre uh, bond breaker's cost was blood, enough to kill even a ruler. So they're hoping to split the, uh, the blood cost between the two of them in order to minimize the chances of actually dying. Now, according to this random manuscript that uh, cannot be verified in any way, so why are they hinging their entire, like, the fate of both of their realms on this? The Bond Breaker is supposed to be hidden deep within a library on Lightlark, and each one of the um, realm's aisles have their own library. Celeste has been here for a couple of days now, so there's no reason why she couldn't have searched the Star Isle library yet, and yet she hasn't. This immediately screams red herring because if such an artifact were to exist and it's been written down, why hasn't anyone else used it? Because yes, you've got this blood cost thing, but if like splitting the cost between two rulers is all it takes, well, there you go. There's your solution. And if it exists in someone's library, that means it's been cataloged. That means that other people should know about it, especially if you try breaking into other realms' libraries. But while Celeste is trying to save her realm from death at 25, and Ela wants to save her realm from death by turning into mulch, I'm not even kidding, that's what happens, Ela wants to use the Bond Breaker for her own purposes. The Bond Breaker would only break their realm's curses, not the rest. They wouldn't win the prize of the power promise in the prophecy, but Ila didn't care. By breaking the curse of being born powerless, she would finally receive the wilding ability that had been denied her to her at birth, and her realm would be rid of its suffering. So in Ila's mind, her curse is that she doesn't have a curse? I mean, yeah, she justifies that by saying she doesn't have powers and she wants powers because they're super special and neat, but by giving herself powers, would she also be imbuing the curse? And if that's the case, would that reflect by poisoning the rest of the realm because power flows from her? Unless, of course, the power isn't stemming from her and she somehow screws up the realm and makes things worse because she's going against the prophecy. Look, like I said, this is all red herring, but it's one of those things where if you stop to think about it for half a second, even on your first read through, it doesn't make sense. And yet, the first half of the book dedicates itself to this endeavor. But first, she's going to need a disguise. So Ela goes off into the Agora after dark when no one else is around. And to get the clothing that she needs, she visits the tailor that she saw earlier that day. Every light was off. Every window was locked. When she was sure there was no other way inside, she got on her knees and pulled out her pins. On one trip to the Skyling Newland with her star stick, she had trailed a group of thieves, curious. She had watched from the shadows as they used pins and curved needles to work their way into a lock. Ela somehow taught herself lock picking by watching some thieves do it from a distance. She also practiced this at home by breaking into Poppy and Tara's rooms. Lockpicking is a small detailed art. How did she learn to turn tumblers from a distance? And also, where did she get the pins necessary for lockpicking in the first place in order to practice? Is this something that she was able to buy somewhere in a wildling town? So many things don't make sense about this. So on the fifth day of the centennial, the invitation to the first demonstration arrived. The paper was charred, black burned, only a few words were visible, carved into the page with a knife. Be ready to duel. Fortunately, Ela already purchased the ideal sword. It's described as light enough for her to wield almost weightlessly, but sharp and firm enough to strike true. That doesn't narrow it down. I still don't know what she has. Like, until someone convinces me otherwise, I'm just going to assume she has an epe, but that is, again, purely speculative. And apparently the tailor's wardrobe had arrived from the day before, and there is an element that I do find amusing, and credit where it's due. One gown was the dark blue of sapphires, with crystal-shaped shards cut out of its sides. 
One was the purple of fresh lavender with an eye-rollingly low-cut bodice and skin-tight pants finished with a glittering cape that tied around her waist, creating the illusion of a skirt. One, the green of emeralds, was tight and light and sheer enough to make her blush. Another, she discovered, had pockets. It has pockets! Pockets? Pockets, 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 pockets! Ah! The demonstration is something of a spectacle. Apparently this is being held out where a lot of other uh, nobles from other realms are able to sit in attendance. And each trial is a risk, even though the uh, rulers aren't supposed to kill others. One of Ela's own ancestors lost a hand during a demonstration. And uh, this is something of a grim note when you actually understand how the magic works as it's been explained previously, but... Ela's own ancestor had lost one of her hands during a demonstration. It had weakened her ability to wield power significantly, and she was forced to have a child after the centennial ended as a better representative for the next one. Now, I'm assuming that that child turned out to be Illa's mother, here's the problem. The reason they can't have heirs is because the, the magic power would then just go to the heir, meaning the realm wouldn't die as part of the prophecy. And the power, the bulk of the power rests with the actual ruler and not the heir. So if the ruler doesn't die, the heir doesn't have uh, that risk of the, the rest of the realm dying as part of the centennial. So. Ela's ancestor necessarily had to die before the next centennial. Regicide? Suicide? I don't know. You tell me. Now, we do get some detail on the other rulers and uh, their weaponry, and their weapons are crap. So the point of this demonstration is that they're dueling without their powers, and Oro is up against Azul as part of the first fight. The king's sword was made of solid gold to match his priceless armor. Gold is a very, very pliable metal. It's also very heavy. So, not only is it an unwieldy metal to use as part of a sword, it's going to bend very easily if you strike it against anything. Armor, a d another sword, the ground, doesn't matter. Azul's own weapon was covered in precious jewels, sapphires mixed with diamonds. And we don't actually get detail as to what Azul's weapon looks like. I don't know where these jewels are. If they're embedded along the the outside of the blade, well, that's going to interfere with thrusts and slashes. If they're embedded inside the blade, they're going to create artificial weaknesses within the structure of the sword, so it has a greater chance of fracturing. If it's alongside the hilts, okay, maybe that can work as long as it's embedded the right way. Otherwise, you're talking about a texture problem because it's going to slip out of your hand. Armor sets and weapons in Minecraft are not good models to base in your story. So Azul and Oro fight, and the fight is over in seconds. As soon as Oro and Azul's weapons and armor are introduced, the duel finished within seconds. The king struck so quickly she almost missed it. One moment, the tip of his sword was dug into the gravel at the arena. The next... It was at the Skyling's throat. This might not be an action-oriented story, but Aster chose to write in fight scenes. If she's going to include them, she shouldn't slack off with the details. If it's in your book, put your best effort forward. If you aren't aiming for goddamn impressive, you aren't trying hard enough. Next up is Celeste versus Cleo, and Cleo's weapon is described as long and thin like an ice pick, which makes me think that she's using what's called a rondel, which was designed for piercing plate armor. But considering that it's described like an ice pick, and Moon Isle is later described as very uh, being very cold and covered in snow, I think Aster is more going for a theme rather than any sort of logic behind the weaponry. We also don't get a lot of detail on Celeste's sword. It's just described as being lighter than the one that Ela was using. Then Grimm walks in with his armor, and I guess you could say it's a bit edgy. She spared him a quick withering look, retort on her tongue, and... Rose. Grim was a fearsome warrior. He wore a, a helmet of spikes like daggers that shot from the crown of his skull. One dipped between his eyes, shielding his nose. His shoulders had the same sharp metal points that ran down the length of his arms. Spikes everywhere. He was a demon. Death itself. Ooh, edgy, edgy boil out. Chops and sides. Be careful. Be careful you don't cut yourself and all that fucking edge. I'm reminded of Thibbledorf Pwent from the Forgotten Realms. A joke character, but a surprisingly endearing one. Pwent uh, was from Ari Salvatore's series of books. He is a dwarf who 
uh, had his own squadron of Berserker Dwarves, their tactic was to wear armor covered in spikes and then run at enemies and bear hug them to death. I, I always smiled when Quent showed up on the pages. Grim, however, is an edgy clown boy. And as she's looking at him, we get this pointed reference. She swallowed. He watched the movement, staring at her neck far too intently, before almost absent-mindedly baring his teeth, like he wanted to bite her there. Her skin inexplicably, inexplicably prickled at the thought. Like, if that's not an intentional Twilight reference, I don't know why it's there. Cleo wins her bout against Celeste, and then it's Grimm versus Ela, and we do get a bit of a description of Grimm's sword, and it's wrong. His sword is described as being a broad sword, so it's good that we finally have an actual name for a sword, but it's thicker than her thigh. Now, broadswords do come in a variety of uh, different lengths, sizes, and descriptions. You got your hand and a half sword, you got your bastard sword, you got all sorts of things like that. None of them that I'm aware of are thicker than a woman's thigh. That sounds much more like the Dragon Slayer that Guts used in Berserk. Now, going into this demonstration, one of the things that Celeste made clear was that she and Ela cannot stand out that much. They have to utilize the apparent inexperience that both of them have. They are both under 25 years old. They are by centuries the youngest rulers here. So they should allow the other rulers to underestimate them push them aside, not even worry about them. So eventually, when all the rulers are paired up, Ela and Celeste will be paired because they'll just be the irrelevant ones that everyone else can ignore. So the best bet is to go into the demonstration without really winning anything. Don't seem that threatening, don't stand out that much, and Ela wins the fight against Grimm. Ela Grin spun fast as a maelstrom to gather more strength and struck like a cobra, so hard that Grimm stumbled just the slightest bit. It was all she needed. She leapt off the floor with a warrior's cry and landed right in front of him, pinning him to the wall. Her blade was at his throat, his clattered to the ground. Now, I don't care that she actually beat Grimm. I'm, I'm willing to accept some degree of skill or mastery, especially considering that she's been training for this since birth. The problem is, we now have this running counter to Celeste saying, hey, let's keep a low profile, and Ela immediately going against that. You were given a rule, one that makes common sense considering the context, and she goes and disregards that completely for some reason. I'm pretty fucking stupid, <laughs> not gonna lie, bro. I'm, I am a goddamn imbecile. This isn't even, I'm just a dense motherfucker, dude. Then it's Oro against Cleo, Oro wins, and then it's Oro against Ela, and we get this trite moment that I see occasionally in weaker stories like this, and I hate it. The king's sword found hers before she could truly recover, and Ela fought to keep up, mostly on the defense, blocking blow after blow after deafening blow. He knew his strength. His strategy was to tire her, to use up her energy on taking his hits instead of making her own until her arms gave out. She almost smiled. I, I am so tired of the secret hidden badass moments that are revealed when the, the protagonist or the character just smiles at how foolish their opponent's being. Because I like it when characters have to struggle in order to overcome obstacles. I like it when they're not instant badasses and they're never truly challenged until like the climax where they're just given some arbitrary limitation. It's much more interesting when you've got a character who has to fight tooth and nail every step of the way through whatever the conflict they're they're confronted with. So for Ela to have this secret badass, you know, she was actually the one with the upper hand. She smiled at how presumptuous Oro was being because it tells me that the stakes aren't actually that bad, which means she's not really in that much trouble, which means she's not really struggling in this, in this moment, which means that this whole thing is a front. And unfortunately, that is a heavy indicator that Ela is actually a Mary Sue. And I was hoping that Aster had enough wherewithal as a writer to avoid the various Mary Sue tropes, and I overestimated her. Now, in fighting, Trying to take out your opponent, like, sapping the strength, dealing, like, chipping away at their stamina is a very good strategy. Even if you don't actually hit them, you can still wear them out, and if you do hit them, you can probably get them, like, on their, their wrists or the fingers, which are 
very detrimental, especially if you've got a sharp blade. But Ela has entirely too much stamina for that to actually work because, as part of her training regimen, he didn't know that when Ela was 12, Terra had left her hanging on a, uh, onto the branch of a tree 50 feet above the ground for five hours. It seems like she only did this once, too. That's like, that's not how training works. That's not how exercise works. After all, every personal trainer is going to tell you the healthiest way to get swole is to only do bench presses every single day with no breaks for your muscles to heal. Hila almost wins the fight against Oro, except she remembered that she's not supposed to, uh, to stand out here, so she hesitates at the right moment, and then Oro takes advantage and actually wins the bout. But the tip of his sword eventually, half-heartedly, slid up her stomach to her heart, then away. But the king's gaze was relentless, studying her far too closely. Ela shrank under it, folding herself over, bowing, recognizing defeat. She retreated to the wings as Oro was crowned the winner of the demonstration. Her eyes didn't meet his again, but she could feel his gaze on her, not lifeless any longer, but merciless as flames. These are warriors with literally centuries of experience under their belts, and somehow an 18 to 24 year old was able to overpower two of them and had to throw a match. The level of technique that Oro should have by this point should be enough to like flick a wrist the right way and snap Ela's sword out of her hand. I don't like that she so like almost handily beat Oro because it minimizes the stakes against her. Now, how am I supposed to assume that whenever she's in trouble again, she doesn't have some masterful bullshit plan to get her out of trouble? Like, she could be going against a bunch of uh, foot soldiers, and she could be run through with a spear, but aha, uh -huh, it doesn't matter because she had actually been trained on how to survive being stabbed with a spear. You see, when she was 14, Tara had stabbed her with like five spears, and so she grew in immunity. I'll take the piss, Boris. I'll show you now. Fuck you! This story is so stupid. We get a line confirming that Ela and Celeste used to have secret sleepovers, a concept that doesn't make any sense considering how closely guarded Ela was by her guardians. And she and Celeste grew very close, not just friends, but more like sisters. And so it was only natural that she eventually told the Starling her secret three years after they met. So the only people on the planet who know that Ela doesn't have any powers are uh, herself, Celeste, Terra, and Poppy. After the demonstration, Ela and Celeste uh, convene in order to talk about the next step of their uh, plan that is less complicated than the one step of seduce the king. Of course, Ela knew this part of their plan was next. If the Bondbreaker wasn't in the Star Isle Library, they would need a way to get into the protected sections of the other Isle's collections. The gloves were crucial to getting inside them. This particular type of enchanted accessory was well known throughout even the Newlands, gloves that were able to harness a whisper of a realm's power. Ela had researched them obsessively, believing they could help her uh, during the centennial. All she would have to do was capture a bit of Poppy's or Terra's ability to wield nature and use them prete uh, to pretend. Unfortunately, the gloves were dangerous to procure. It was said they were made of skinned human flesh. Only dark markets in the Newlands would dare sell such a thing, and Ela had searched nearly all of them. So they need magic skin gloves, which is about as gross as you can imagine. Of course, the gloves are only one step. You still have to be able to get onto the, uh, the islands and into the libraries in the first place. Ela cursed. How is she supposed to sneak onto Moon Isle and search its library with guards at its entrance? Oh man, that, that is a big problem. If only there was some sort of a, a device or maybe like a stick that Ela could use to, I don't know, travel through the stars. A, a star stick, perhaps. Are you fucking kidding me? I told you it was a plot hole. Some time goes by and Ela heads towards what she thinks is a dinner, but actually is a demonstration. Everyone's staring at Ela as she walks in, so, so she tries to act as nonchalant as possible, stepping in, and uh, Grimm is the first one to really say anything to her. His dark eyes seemed to get even darker as they met hers, and he said, 
I'm not sure what I enjoy more, seeing the way you grip a sword or the way your dress grips you. I want you. I need you. Oh baby, oh baby. The characters are so ill-defined they almost have to be defined through what realm they belong to. That's the same lazy kind of world building that tells you an individual cannot stand out from whatever group they come from. Centennial is an absolute disaster of plot and world building. 70 pages in, I have no idea what it really is outside of a very broadly defined demonstration of varied skills. The Hunger Games were a death tournament between t uh, teens and kids to keep colonies in line. The Maze in Maze Runner was a wonky experiment to find a cure for a disease using fear hormones in certain teens. Even Sarah J. Mass, who I do not like, got this right with the champion tournament in Throne of Glass. So far, the Centennial is ill-defined, and its history and rules seem to change every few chapters, like I'm being gaslit by a book. So Azul is dressed differently, uh, revealing some tattoos that he has, and this gets Ila thinking back on the tattoos that some wildlings have, and this raises questions. Let us begin, Azul said heartily, smiling widely. The Skyling ruler had the most perfect shining teeth she had ever seen. Tonight, he wore robes with triangle cuts along the sides, revealing markings painted across his dark skin, symbols she didn't recognize. Some wildlings inked themselves with needles and paint after their training or honorable feats. Ela was never allowed. Her body did not belong solely to her, Poppy said. It belonged to the realm. She was its representative, its lifeline, even after having been born so wrong. Despite it being a norm among wildlings, Ela isn't allowed to get tattoos. Apparently, many will get tattoos after training or honorable feats which fits in nicely with how tattoos have been uh, used to be seen. However, Ela isn't allowed to get tattoos because she's a representative of her people. If that's the case and tattoos are seen as a mark of honor, then does that mean that wildlings are not honorable? This is another one of those moments where Aster set up one idea, then contradicted it with Ela for some reason, putting it in a way that arbitrarily made sense to her, but actually ruins itself when you step back to consider everything. Wouldn't you want your representative covered in tattoos to show how awesome they are and, by extension, the wildlings are? That's what they got with Maui and uh, Moana, and he was awesome. This is a sloppy, compounded mistake. I almost want to argue that Ela is a self-insert character, and I, at this point, probably would. And Astro wanted Ela to reflect who she was, despite the image or character not fitting within the world that she built. So it's Azul's demonstration, and like the sword fighting demonstration from before, he has a simple idea he wants to play with. Tonight, I would like to celebrate the tremendous abilities that would al uh, will allow us to succeed in shattering our curses, Azul said. Rulers of Realm, that sounds like a typo, would you honor us with a demonstration of your power? Grim goes up first, and he opened his palm. The room changed. Suddenly, there were a hundred Grims standing between each chair, all smirking, the ceiling cracked open, the floor split, large slabs of stone fell right onto their heads, screams pierced the air, everything disappeared. The room went back to normal. There was just one Grim looking bored as if the display hadn't used even a whisper of his power. Nightshades had mind abilities, Ela knew, but this was more, a vision on a grand scale. How dangerous would that skill be in a war? Now obviously, this is significant trouble for Ela. They are expected to display their power, and she doesn't have any kind of powers or backup plan to really speak of. There was a plan in place. Terra and Poppy had prepared Ila for this very possibility. She was supposed to steal a particular flower from the king's personal collection, a wildling flower that was able to multiply and live forever. Because she had focused so much on Celeste's plan, she didn't steal that flower, so she's not actually ready for this scene. And I love it when a character is forced to... Uh, like, use their minds to get out of a genuinely difficult discussion, like, uh, situation like this. It's a lot of the reason why I love Andy Weir as a writer. The Martian is a grand display of how the hell are you going to machine your way out of this one? The obstacles Mark Watney has to overcome in order to just survive on Mars are nothing short of miraculous. And Ela is one of the last to go, so she's got some time to try to ponder this over while the others are playing around with their uh, various demonstrations. Cleo, for example, uses her power to move water in order to pull all of the wine from the room, collate it in the center, and form it into a shark with three rows of teeth. Cleo is the ultimate wino. <laughs> Whoa, is that really the blood of Christ? Yes. Man, that guy must have been wasted 24 hours a day, eh? And then there's Celeste. She raised a finger in the air, and the room exploded. 
Fireworks burst from every corner, silvery sparks showering down like miniature shooting stars. They screeched and roared, flying through the room before shattering against the walls into sh uh, silvery specks. The problem with these demonstrations is that they're neat, but like, what do they amount to? And then it's Azul's turn, who is going now instead of later, which I can only assume is because of like, it's just neater that way, like more narratively interesting. He spins his wrist upwards and then like clouds appear. Celeste and Azul display their powers and it's the same problem as it always is, vapid lists. There's no art in the image Aster is creating, no life we can breathe into the world or characters. These people aren't using their powers as, as a display of dominance or to get around a problem, they're using it because they're being asked to use it. What characterization can you really take from this? I'd much rather read about a pyromancer who conjures uh, fire in order to cook food for a party. That way, his power has a purpose and a goal to appear in the story. With the exception of like Grimm in the chocolate shop and Oro when they were doing the blood pack, there isn't really a reason for, like a character-based reason for any of these characters to use the powers in the way that they have. So then it's Ela's turn and she's out of time and like her back's against the wall. I, I was genuinely interested in seeing how Aster was going to fake a power at the last minute. Maybe Celeste was going to do some sleight of hand and help her out. Maybe Grimm was going to do a mind trick to fool the others because maybe he suspects something and he wants to get on Ela's good side. Maybe Ela does have a backup plan that we don't know about yet. But no, the truth is much worse. Slowly, willing her fingers not to shake, she shed her many rings, placing them on the nearest table before a sunling who gasped at the wealth piled in front of him. She took her gloves off and kept one clenched in her hand. With the other hand, she pulled a pin from her hair. Not an ordinary pin, a throwing star disguised to look like an accessory. How are you going to make a throwing star look like a pin? You know, what's really a shame is that they actually do make throwing pins and throwing needles that you could utilize for something like this. Like, you'd have an easy disguise, like one of those uh, hair needles that you, you keep your hair up with some way that makes absolutely no sense to me at all. Instead, a throwing star is an objectively different shape from a pin. How was that disguised? How did she not slice her hair when she pulled it out? She also asks Oro to give her a hand and has him stand on uh, one end of the room. Ela then somehow ties a glove over her eyes. Be still, child. Do not be easily troubled. You are a warrior. Let them fear you. Let them see what it means to be wild. The star flew. Ela heard the unmistakable clang of metal against metal as it found its mark. She lifted the fabric from her eyes and couldn't help but smirk as she saw Oro, King of Lightlark, still glued in place. His gaze not on her, but on the crown she had knocked from his golden head. Ela's display of plot power is to blindfold herself and throw a star at the king. This isn't a display of magical power, it's a demonstration of skill or technique, yet no one calls her on this! What magic did she display? What unique talent that only wildlings can perform did she put on? Are the other realms somehow undone by blindfolds? I was looking forward to seeing how Ela got out of a genuine problem that would need her to think her way through to solve. But instead, the book just made everyone else really, really stupid for half a minute. This is incredibly disappointing. I want characters to be able to think their way through things, or at least have some sort of a unique skill in order to work through a problem. I don't like it when they get out of the problem because all of their opponents took stupid juice. And then it's Oro's turn and because we have to save the most impressive one for last, or like narratively what we're supposed to believe is the most impressive one. Ela expected fire, a raging inferno from his hand. Instead, the king stood, placed a palm on the table, and the stone turned to gold. It happened in waves. The metal overtook the marble, then dripped down the side and smothered the floor. In seconds, it was all gilded. An impossible power. Thousands of years ago, it was said starlings could make diamonds. Wildlings could make emeralds and rubies grow in their palms like flowers. Sunlings could turn goblets to gold. It represented a complete mastery of power. So in terms of like actual talent or ability, I would have to argue that Grimm has the most impressive power because he like multiplied himself and created an illusion so convincing that it had people screaming because they thought the ceiling was caving in. 
but Aura wins, possibly because he's the king, or maybe, I don't know, transmutation actually is that impressive. We don't get a grand scale of things. It's, it's so difficult to get a read on what's supposed to be seen as normal and impressive in this world. But even with people forgetting what the demonstration was about, minutes after it was announced and Ela lucking out, she still has the problem of she needs to figure out how to sneak onto Moon Isle so she can break into the library and check it out, completely forgetting that she has a star stick. So she needs to go somewhere where she can get information. So she happens to ask the first barkeep that she comes across, a guy named Juniper. Now Juniper is kind of a crutch that Aster has created for herself. He becomes this character who exists for a scene or two to provide some exposition that Aster can't figure out how to deliver otherwise. And I cannot stand how easily Ela gets out of these situations, but Juniper reveals that uh, he doesn't take like money or currency or jewels for his secrets. He requires a different sort of payment. And no, we're not talking sexual favors because he deals in secrets. Careful, there goes the next shadow broker. Not funny. Ela insists that she has none and Juniper insists that we both know that's not true. And so, without any evidence to back up her claim, panic rose in her chest, bile up her throat. Part of her wanted to flee. But to get into the Moon Isle library, Ela needed information. She took a steady breath, and before she could stop herself, said, I let the king win during the first demonstration. I could have bested him, but I didn't. And Juniper just takes that as, as enough. I really hate how Aster keeps setting herself up for potentially interesting conflicts, only to back out at the last second with some easy explanation or hand wave. Here, Juniper says that he deals in secrets, and will give info if Ela gives, uh, gives a secret. She just says that she let Aura win during the sword fight, which can, uh, contradicts her attempt to lay low, a fact that she doesn't even consider at the moment, and is also impossible to prove, yet Juniper takes it at face value as a hard fact. Why not actually challenge the characters or force them to actually fight their way out of a corner? This is weak! But Juniper's explanation of how she can get around the guards on the Moon Island is, is just as weak because he put a finger against his lip considering. There are no guards during the full moon, when the Moonling curse is at its strongest. All Moonlings retreat to the safety of their castle then. And when Yella asks a follow-up question of when's the next full moon, he says the 20th day of the centennial. Now, this isn't a huge note, but it does make me ask, does this world not have calendars? Why is the centennial the go-to method of telling time instead of days of the week, as if everyone just automatically has the day in the centennial in mind? It's almost like Aster was using this to point out how far into the centennial this was for the reader, and not to establish character or universe, but to dictate the timeline of the plot. You bothered me for attention, now you're getting attention. This is how it works. I don't care how adorable you are, you're getting attention. Ha ha ha, take that. Stopping me from my angry ranting about a book. Okay, so next it is time for Celeste's demonstration, and this is the one that I think is actually kind of clever because it actually serves a purpose for the plot. You will see in a minute. First that we do finally get confirmation that if Oro forgets to close the blinds in his room, when he goes to bed, because you know he's nocturnal, then if the sun comes pouring in, it would mean death in the morning. So it only took until page 82 to actually confirm that sunlight is actually deadly. Celeste's demonstration is a test of fear. Whoever conquers their greatest fear first is the winner. And this is set place, uh, this is set in a place called the Hall of Glass. And appropriately enough, Celeste reveals the item they're going to be using for the uh, for the demonstration it is a towering mirror <laughs> and unfortunately this is where Aster backed herself into a corner because with the backstory that Celeste and Ela share with them knowing each other for as long as they have and doing all this intricate planning there was no reason why they wouldn't have both been able to practice this particular moment. There's no reason why Ela wouldn't have already uh, used the mirror in order to make sure that she could uh, get through this without any real struggle. Same thing with Celeste. And so Aster did what I call over-conditioning. With a silver-gloved hand, Celeste tugged at the glittering sheet, revealing a towering mirror. 
It was an ancient starling relic her, the ruler had brought from her own realm. Ila had watched it for over a year, standing in the corner of Celeste's room like a specter. It could only be used by a person once, so Ila hadn't been able to practice. Ignoring for the moment that Celeste didn't arrive through the portal with this thing, so how did it get here? I want to call this overconditioning. Aster set up so many conditions in her world building that it would have countered later events or would have created contrivances. To counter this, she keeps adding small details that come off as a contrivance anyway. Celeste had a mirror that reveals a person's greatest fear. Stupid, but whatever, I'll accept it for the sake of world building here. But she and Ela spent a lot of time together, so naturally Ela would have fa uh, practiced facing her fear and would have passed the test easily, which makes sense considering their plan. To counter this, it's revealed that the mirror can only be used once. Why? What does that add? Why was this mirror designed like this? What's the point? To counter a contrivance, Aster has created multiple breaks in her world building because now the mirror makes less sense than it did 10 seconds ago. Here's a better solution. Ela practiced to face one particular fear, but she's been on the island and faced enough new conditions that she has a new fear and has to face something that she isn't ready for. Maybe she even fails the test, which creates a conflict between her and Celeste. With such a simple change, things are simplified and drama is heightened. I don't know why Aster writes like this. Now, displaying one's fears can reveal a lot about a character, about their ambitions, their traumas, their phobias. But of course, it would take a lot of work and coordination in order to make everything balanced and make sense. So naturally, Aster skips that. All of the rulers, one by one, step up to the mirror, press their hand against it, and they go on a journey that no one else can see. Which means that the rulers all get through their demonstration ridiculously quick, uh, quickly. Like, each one of them is only done in a matter of minutes, and it's not detailed at all in the book. Now, we do get Ela's fear, at the very least, so that's something. Unfortunately, the way Astra presented the whole thing, it really makes the whole not practicing with the mirror especially redundant. Ela was pulled through the mirror into a crystal world. In the many months she had anticipated this demonstration, she had determined her greatest fear, failing her realm. Unfortunately, her actual greatest fear isn't failing the realm, it was being trapped because she's stuck in her uh, greenhouse dome thing uh, back on the Wildling Newlands and can't get out. Apparently she succeeded by uh, in the nightmare world, grabbed a sword, and smashed her way through some glass. And that was just symbolic enough to demonstrate her escaping, so she actually scored the worst. She was out in six minutes, but this does demonstrate that her fears are different than what she originally uh, assumed they were, which meant that she could have actually trained for one fear, but because she's in a new environment, could have grown a different fear. In this way, Aster effectively came up with the same solution that I did, except she, she kept the overcomplicated you can only use the mirror once rule for no particular reason. Although Ela's fear does kind of confirm the whole Disney princess thing because she's experienced a taste of life and now she wants more. But I did say that there was something I liked about this particular moment. You see, Celeste managed to get the skin gloves, which can absorb other essences like a sponge. And now that they have all of the other rulers' handprints on the mirror, they can absorb their essence through that. So it actually does become relevant to the plot. And this is one step closer to searching for the bond breaker, as clunky as the rest of that actually is. So now on the 15th day of the centennial, Ela and Celeste are combining all sorts of things, uh, rose water, ash leaf extract, soil from the ever-changing tulip, and they're doing all of this to make hair dye, and she's doing all this to fit in with the moonlings when she breaks into their library. And Ela's worried about sneaking onto the moon isle because Cleo already doesn't like her, and if Ela is caught, she might get killed. But Celeste has some encouraging words for her. You move like a shadow, Celeste continued. You strategize like a general. You can blend in anywhere. I've seen you. Ela's use of strategy thus far has mostly been incredible dumb luck. We haven't even seen that much stealth from her. It's like Aster thinks Ela is Corvo from Dishonored, but we've seen Corvo do all of these things and more. Nope, my mistake. Uh, she's actually not going to the Moon Isle yet. She's going to the Sky Isle, which is actually a floating little island. You are not in Kansas anymore. You are on Pandora. 
It's been established that uh, at one point, Lightlark was all one massive island and didn't have the surrounding mini isles for each of the different realms. Well, ever since those different uh, tiny isles were created, they are all connected via flimsy rope bridges. It took 45 minutes to reach the Sky Isle Bridge. Once the island was whole, then, thousands of years ago, it was sliced into pieces, so each realm could have its own. All the isles were connected to the mainland by rope and wood that didn't look even remotely steady. Wind whistled through large gaps between each plank. The strings holding them together were f uh, thin and frayed. The entire thing rocked back and forth like a pendulum. Ela looked down at what had to be 200 feet, the water churning roughly below, a soup ready to boil her. You know, for all the pomp and prestige of the rest of Lightlark society, how, like, adorned with jewels Ela is to the point where she considers them, like, just rocks, it's, it's weird. Like, it's this, it's creating this conflicting image that all of their Islands are connected by flimsy ass rope bridges. <laughs> okay. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> like, there's no fantasy element to this. There's no uh, adornment or like magical tree roots that reach out across the gap to act as a, a natural bridge that way. There, there are no bridges of any sorts that can uh, color in a bit of the world that works for each. Uh, different realm specifically. Like the Moon Isle is a very snowy place, so they could have an ice bridge. Sunlings can have a stone bridge with torches along it. Well, actually, no, have them have a covered bridge, that way they can walk around in daytime safely. Wild Isle, of course, would be connected by tree roots. But no, instead, they're all just old, beat up rope bridges. That's not weird. But despite this, we're expected to believe that these rope bridges are still enchanted. She had read about these enchanted bridges. Though everyone was traditionally allowed on any isle they wanted to visit, some realms had been known to restrict access during political turmoil. If Azul or the Lightlark-based Skyling government had decided those outside their realm weren't allowed to pass, the bridge would collapse, sending her hurling hundreds of feet below. Boy, this would be a lot less stressful if she had some way to teleport across the bridge without ever setting foot on it. Maybe there could be like some sort of a, a staff or a rod or, or a stick. I'm not doing that whole bit again. You know what? You already know this. But if the bridge collapsed, wouldn't that cut off everyone from the mainland? Like, how are they going to get that that rope bridge back up? Is there an enchantment to reverse the damage? Are there other bridges or do they travel between islands another way, like via boats? Why does every piece of world building add another question or two? Why does so little of this make sense when you consider it as a whole? And this wouldn't have been a problem for the Skylings at one point because originally they had been able to fly. Now the only person who could fly was Oro because again, he's an origin, whatever that means. And he has access to uh, some of the other Lightlark Realm's powers, but not their curses, which is convenient. Fortunately, Skylings are known for their celebratory nature and are very uh, content, uh, very relaxed, so no one really raises an eyebrow when Ela, in her disguise, walks into the library. And then Ela gets a moment that I don't think is reflected anywhere else in the book, not that I can recall right now anyway, which seems to be part of a pattern that I see in a lot of lazy protagonists, and it's starting to bother me. Ela finds the library, starts looking around all over the place trying to find the hidden section where the bond breaker might be, and she studied the space and frowned. There were no hidden back rooms. Everything in the library was on full display. Shelves built into the walls. Ela started up the spiral walkway, forcing herself not to look too carefully at the books. If she saw any of their titles, she wasn't sure she would be able to resist the temptation to sit down and read. It's fine that she likes books, but it seems like a lot of authors are making the protagonists book nerds, like, out of obligation. It's not something you should feel obligated to do. My protagonist isn't. Most of my characters aren't, actually. But the library just seems like an ordinary library, so Ela can't find where any hidden section might possibly be. Until she goes up a particular spiral staircase and finds... She looked up at the skylight. If she stood on her toes, she could reach it. Her stomach roiled as she carefully grabbed the gloves from her pocket. They felt rough and thin enough to tear if she wasn't careful. She tried not to think what they were made of, of who they were. No. 
She had to keep her mind on the mission, lest she wretch her dinner. Hoping Celeste was right, and Azul's essence was indeed imprinted on the fabric, she rolled them on, then pressed her gloved palm against the glass. It dropped open, along with an elegant pair of metal stairs that unfolded before her eyes. The protected section of the library has very little protection. Ela found and penetrated it within seconds by poking it. Poking the skylight was her first guess, and it worked. It might stop uh, people from other realms who don't have magically enchanted skin gloves, but it wouldn't do anything against someone from the corresponding realm poking the glass and getting in. And there's no indication that it's like a particular sort of charged magic that is like only accessible to the rulers, which is something that's brought up a little bit later uh, on the uh, on the Moon Isle. But right now, it sounds like any Skyling uh, who wants to can go to this, this particular stairwell, uh, poke the skylight, and get access to the hidden section of the library. It doesn't even ask for a password. You could uncover this by, like, bumping into it. Anyway, Ela walks around to the protected section for a minute, uh, notices a few things uh, decorating the shelves, but there is no bond breaker. Rather than use the star stick to teleport directly back to her room, Ela walks back to the mainland castle where Cleo actually glances at her and starts following her along because there's something not quite right about that girl. But as luck would have it, Ela runs into Grimm, who uses his nightshade powers to hide her somehow, and Cleo walks by none the wiser, so Ela has successfully uh, escaped her search. And Grimm turns this into an opportunity to flirt a little. And Ela was shocked by his proximity. She was pressed against the wall, and he towered over her, head bent so low his nose almost grazed hers. He looked down at her. Have you decided to change realms, Heart Eater? He said, reaching up and taking a strand of her colored hair between his fingers. If so, you might consider Nightshade. We can't compete with Skyling when it comes to sweets or inventive drinks, but if debauchery is what you're after... His dark gaze gleamed in amusement. We are most famed for our thorough exploration of pleasure. Penis, 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 Stop saying penis! And she turns him down, and something that I haven't brought up uh, before is that... Yeah, he calls her heart eater as a, uh, as a bit of a tease since, you know, wildling. And then Ela just goes to bed. The next day, uh, her invitation shows up. It turns out that she is supposed to design the next demonstration. But when Ela goes out to the Agora the next day, she runs into Azul, and she's worried for a moment. Does he know that she snuck into a, the uh, hidden library the previous night? Fortunately, he's just there for some friendly banter and for some characterization, which is good, because we know almost nothing about him thus far. He gives some detail, most of it dealing with the history of Light Lark, which is an odd common thread that Aster seems to have as, an, as a writer. She doesn't seem interested in exploring her characters so much as establishing and re-establishing details about Lightlark. Like, I genuinely think that Aster is more interested in the world of Lightlark than the people of Lightlark. And that in and of itself is not a bad thing. The problem is the way that this story is presented, this feels like it's meant to be a character-driven story, and we get very little character. Azul also reveals that the third centennial was the first time they split into teams, and everyone was so distraught by the fourth that uh, Cleo didn't even show up. And Azul says that it's really a shame the curses have ruined so much because they're, like, before them, the realms were very close to unity. Like, all the realms were, were very close to unity, which is part of the reason why King uh, Egan, the, I believe, is the older brother of Oro, uh, was going to marry another ruler, uh, someone named Aurora from the Starlings. And even Azul says that he's not sure if he has it in him to attend for a sixth centennial. In an attempt to make things a little more jovial, Ela changes the subject and asks, are you close to your nobles? And Azul reveals a bit of world building that I find perplexing considering the magic system. Azul frowned, there are no Skyling nobles. She must have looked confused because he continued. We've had a democracy since I came into rule. The Skylings who are invited into the, into, to the smaller events are elected officials. All big decisions are made based on voting from my people. Azul isn't a king by decree, he's an elected president. This doesn't really work though, considering how powers are passed down via the ruler. And uh, Azul acknowledges this, making the practice nice in concept, but ultimately hollow. 
This also has the simplistic view of limiting nobles to a class that can only exist in a fiefdom when we can uh, just as easily argue that the role can be equated to those with money, like how old, old uh, nobles own land and current nobles own property. It all comes down to how currency is utilized. He even states that if he were voted out of power, he would step down, but he admits that that would complicate things, considering the centennial and how powers are passed down. And uh, there will be a moment that I have to bring up later on about the uh, Skyling democracy that really doesn't work uh, when you actually think about it, but that is for much later. For now, Azul leads Ila off to some uh, cliffs where he's able to blow wind through some tunnels and it sounds like a giant mountain-sized instrument and it's very pretty. We will never see this again. Later, Ila runs into Grimm and because he helped her escape Cleo, she decides to return the favor. So she gives him a hint about what her demonstration is going to be because apparently it requires preparation. It's demonstrating the worth of your realm by showing something of value was created for the future of Lightlark. And Grimm nods and then leaves. And Ela recalls that her demonstration was gonna be something that she had planned with Poppy and Tara, something to further the strategy that they are working towards. Ela had convinced them that showing that her people could heal just as much as they could kill might convince the other rulers of Wildling's value, especially over Nightshade, who only destroyed. And this doesn't make sense because obviously Nightshade can also protect. This seems incredibly short-sighted, especially since Grimm used his power to save her one chapter ago, and she thanked him for it one page ago. The, the contrast is so stark that it reads like an entirely different draft. So the demonstration of usefulness begins, and I'm going to read these out of order because some of these are actually kind of hilarious. Astor didn't intend them as such, but when you consider what's actually on display, it's kind of funny. So Azul goes first, we'll get to him later. Then it's Cleo, and she says, her words were simple. We have ships, she said. For the past two centuries, we have built many, many ships. That was it. You're supposed to, like, demonstrate something, and she didn't demonstrate anything, and this is given a pass. Then again, Ela was able to pass the power demonstration without using powers, so I guess I have to excuse this. And yes, it is weird that the one realm that is undone by the ocean during a full moon built a navy. Uh, Celeste is up next. She and a couple of her nobles condense their energy together and they're able to conjure a sword out of nothing. Like, it's just a manifestation of raw power, which is Cool, I guess. Not sure how that worked, but whatever. And then it's Grimm's turn, but rather than participate, he just gives up. My realm has nothing productive to offer you, he said. Ugh. And this pisses off Yula because she had gone out of her way to give him a hint. Like, you know, the way that he gave her a hint. And it's like, and this is how you repay me? What the hell? More like, this is how you repay my repayment. Unlike the other things that have been displayed, or the other demonstrations, uh, Oro actually has something tangible that he can perform in front of everybody right now. We have found additional ways to spread light and heat throughout the island. He lit a fire in front of him with a curl of his fingers. Then he dipped his entire hand inside it before dragging it out again quickly, fingers splayed. The flames came apart, the fire like spatters of paint flying across the room. There were screams. Some islanders blocked themselves using their power. But the flames had been contained in dozens of orbs. They landed harmlessly in hands and laps. They will not go out as long as the original flame is lit. Between the endless hearths inside the castle, torches across the mainland, and this demonstration, the king clearly had an obsession with making sure flames were everywhere. And then he squashes the original flame and all the uh, little orbs go out. But this is a, an interesting display in that he has effectively created central heating. Perhaps a bit underwhelming considering that two demonstrations ago he gilded a table. But there is Azul's, and this one might be the funniest. Azul steps forward and says that he's been, um, his realm has been working on a form of communication that uses wind. He grabbed a piece of parchment from an interior pocket of his cape and wrote a message on it. He folded it carefully into a square and used his power to fly it across the arena, right into Ela's hands. All eyes were on her. She folded open the page and read the words the ruler had scrawled. Of course, we also have our music. 
Ela couldn't help but smile. This can be replicated on a grand scale, Azul added. He motioned to the rest of the Skylings who had joined him. They carried stacks of sheets of parchment. Without warning, they threw all of it into the air. Before her eyes, each page folded neatly, then set off, one after the other, on dozens of paths the Skyling had created in the sky, wind currents for the messages to use as trails to their recipients, a true infrastructure for mass communication. It was a grand display, an invocation that would surely make an impact on Lightlark. Yeah, I'll say it'll have an impact. The man just invented spam mail. Imagine the magic is fading in your world, the, everyone around your realm is dying, and all of a sudden you get a message about your car's extended warranty. Ela's demonstration is last, appropriately enough, and before she starts she asks Oro for a hand, and he creates a column of fire in the center of the room. She then pulls out a vial of uh, thick crimson liquid, and says that the Wildlings have developed advanced healing remedies, and this is something we've seen before when she helped uh, Ella, the Starling Girl, with her limp. And to prove the healing elixir's potency, before she could lose her nerve, the same way she had done a half dozen times before in preparation, Ella took a deep breath and put her entire arm in the flames. Yells, cries of horror, the crowd gasped, horrified, as Ella's skin charred, melted. She did not flinch. Even though the pain threatened to swallow her whole, her arm shook in the fire. Her whole hand was curled so tight, her nails drew blood in her palm. Little flowery thingies didn't actually appear, but nobody questioned this because everyone took stupid juice. I'M ON FIRE! Ah! Of course, she destroys her arm in the process, but she was able to sprinkle a little bit of wilding healing elixir onto her arm and it fixed everything right up or rather it made it look like it did more on that in a second in the end i don't know how this was actually voted but it was decided that azul won meaning that people preferred spam mail over central heating and magic cures this is a dumb world filled with dumb people but there's a problem with the way that the elixir actually works the wildling elixir might have healed her but it hadn't been advanced enough to completely dull the ache it was either take away the pain or heal, one or the other. Of course, the uh, the rulers and islanders didn't need to know that. So, Ela puts on a facade and pretends that her arm isn't in agony. Ela says the elixir either heals or takes away the pain. She means that it either takes away the pain or covers up the wound. As is, it doesn't sound like Aster understands how wounds or healing works. Wounds experience pain to express that they are damaged and you need to use caution around a given item, environment, or whatever. Written as it is, it's like Aster thinks they're entirely separate. This is a very sloppy description. But later that night, when she's still dealing with her wounded arm, Ela's in the process of undressing when Grimm speaks up and offers to help her undress. Such a charmer, this one. She demands how he got in. She, he says, through the walls, of course. Grimm is perhaps the only other ruler who has gotten as much definition as Ela, which is to say not a lot, but... In moments like this, I, I'm conflicted on how I want to see him, because he's either supposed to be the uh, dark and mysterious character that uh, serves as a love interest, or he's the Babadook. Of course, he also has moments like this that make me think that he's a maybe a touch emo. You made a mockery of my demonstration, demon, she said, lest she forget why she was mad. I told you about the trial. I gave you time to prepare. Her inexplicable hurt must have peeked through her expression because his eyes softened. Heart eater, he said, his voice surprisingly gentle. I thought you would have guessed by now, but let me make this clear. I have no interest in winning the centennial, or forming alliances, or playing this game at all. Which raises the question, why are you here then? Granted, the answer is eventually revealed, but the first time you're going through this and you read this line, it's like... But why, though? Compounding, confusing line after confusing line, just to throw the reader off what the author is building towards is not a good writing style. Typically, when you write a story like this, you want to make a story that is amplified by a second read-through. Something that, you know, has plenty of little nuggets and hints and clues that you can gather up and understand with greater clarity and appreciation upon a reread. What Aster is doing instead 
is creating a whole bunch of weird speed bump moments where you have to, like, on your first read through, you're like, but that doesn't make sense, and that doesn't make sense, and that doesn't make sense. All so you can get to the very end where it all sort of makes sense, but not really. Grimm has no interest in playing the game of the Centennial at all, so if that's the case, then why did he come here? Cleo was able to skip last year. Did he just accept the invitation because it was the first time Nightshade had been in, uh, invited and it would have been rude to decline? The politics in this world are so confusing. It's fantasy, so you can do so many things that don't mesh with reality, but it does still have to make sense internally. Ela asks Grimm why he came to the Centennial, because it couldn't have been for her, and he confirms no, he didn't come here for her. And then when she presses him for more information, he just switches subjects, as seems to be Aster's writing style, and asks, Do you know how Lightlark was created, Heart Eater? Ela answers that it was formed by Oro's ancestor, the first origin, some guy named Horus Ray. And Grimm confirms, that's a lie. It was created by two people. It was also created by Cronin Malvare his ancestor. And I do kind of like that Lightlark is this uh, combination creation of both light and dark, because thematically speaking, there's a lot that you can do with that. Except keep this particular moment in mind, because we're going to be revisiting it later. Nightshade's power built this place just as much as Sunlings did. My father believed it was time for us to regain control of a land we had claimed to. That was the reason for the war between Nightshade and Lightlark. Ella spends the next day nursing her arm with a combination of ice packs and wildling elixirs. Really doesn't make the elixir sound that interesting or that powerful if it doesn't heal that well. But the call for the demonstration comes at midnight because only someone as cruel as Cleo would plan their demonstration to happen at midnight. Cleo says that this is a test of desire and all the rulers wind up in an arena that has been converted into a maze of waterways. The other rulers are dressed in clothes that are just described as clothes that would fare well in the water. They are not described better than that, so I choose to believe that they are all dressed in color-coordinated wetsuits. Prove me wrong! Then there's the mechanics of how this demonstration is supposed to work, and you won't believe this, but I've got questions. A true ruler must deny the selfish wants of their heart for the good of their realm. You will be guided through the maze by your own heart. It will lead you to what you desire most. The winner will be decided not by their desire, but by who can reach it first. For worse than desiring something above the good of one's realm is not being sure of what you want at all. Apparently, the rulers will swim through the maze and their desire will drive them forward to what they really want. If they want the good of their realm, they'll find it. If it's something else, they'll fail the test. How does this work? Like, mechanically. How does their desire manifest in a meaningful way to drive them through the maze? How will the others know if someone fails due to bad desire or ill happenstance? What if they get to the goal via dumb luck? Does that still count? How will the others be able to tell what methods a person takes? This is... this is... this is dumb. Before they can actually jump into the water, Ela notices that Oro has a, a, a rash on his hand, slightly swollen, and she decides that that must be something called Gissel Root. Ela recommends a treatment to uh, minimize the rash, and then kind of criticizes how curious it is that Oro would have this rash. She narrowed her eyes. Gissel Root only grows deep in the woods, where the trees are close enough to touch. What in the realm were you doing in a place like that? Her tone said, don't you know how dangerous it is? And this little footnote will be ignored for now because it is time for a demonstration that Ela is totally prepared for because when she was 17, she was blindfolded and left alone in the middle of the woods during a hurricane. Not even making that up. Now, I can barely follow what's really being described in this because it doesn't really sound like a maze. We don't get a lot of detail as to what's going on. At one point, Ela decides, like, like she's, she's just treading water, and she was, like, I guess far behind. She only determines that because a whistle sounded somewhere, which seems to indicate that someone had found the end of the maze. Now, it sounds like they're all taking, like, entirely different routes, so I don't feel like this can be too terribly complicated because, I mean, they're all, they're all treading water, so there's like only one plane that they could really be working on. This is, this is a two-dimensional maze. 
and there's six of them. Like, how complicated can these mazes be? Because we don't get a feel for how big this arena is. Are we talking, like, proper football stadium? Roman Colosseum? Like, high school gym? So there's no distinction made for the reader. Ela just fo uh, follows her heart, chooses a direction to swim, and goes that way. And then she eventually finishes the maze without, like, any ceremony or even any real indication that she did finish it. Like, the way this is described, I couldn't even tell you if she failed. She clawed through the ice-cold water like it was the only thing standing between her and everything held in her heart. Her vision went in and out, but she felt the end of the maze. She grabbed the glowing tablet of ice waiting there and hauled herself out of the water with all her remaining strength. Ela didn't see what was written on the slab, didn't hear the crowd. All she felt was something warm washing over her body. Ella. The starling girl draped a towel across her back. And Astor at least tries to play with this in such a way to reveal more of Ela's character. Like, she was pushing down, denying her desires for so long because, you know, her entire life she was raised to fight for the sake of the realm, prepare for the centennial, for the sake of all the wildlings everywhere. And now she realizes that she's been pushing her desires down and she can't lie to herself any longer. She wanted many, many things. She was willing to do terrible things to get them, which runs directly counter to the maze scene and how the maze was supposed to work. Because if you desire something other than the good of your realm, you weren't going to win. Like, the imagery is there. I just... It doesn't seem to mesh. Like, if Astor was actually using subtext to explore this, and it could have... It could have worked, but instead she just bluntly explains everything. It really takes away from the mystique of the moment because now the reader isn't able to come to this conclusion alongside Ela. It's just given to us. Now, consider what Ela has experienced in the last couple of days. She barely managed to finish the water maze thing, and uh, not long before that, she had her demonstration where she set her arm on fire. Well, now it's day 20 of the centennial, the full moon, and she has to infiltrate the Moon Isle Library while her arm is still screwed up and she's still recovering from the maze. I'll give her a pass on the maze because she didn't plan that one, but she did know that the, the full moon was coming up and she still set herself on fire. Hila's a very smart character. You're an idiot! Not that it really makes much of a difference because the whole burned arm thing doesn't really come up. Not in a substantial way, anyway, especially considering what Ela goes through. Now, we remember that the Moonling Curse is one where the sea tries to go out of its way to kill Moonlings. There were no guards on the bridge that night. The Moonling Curse meant that every full moon the sea sought out Moonling blood. Ships were cracked in half by hundred-foot waves. Girls were swept off cliffs by monstrous surges. The sea swallowed them, then went still. Tonight, it was ravenous. Now, I can accept that on a basic level, the sea just goes out of its way to murder moonlings. Okay, whatever. Except when you consider how this actually impacts the world at large or other people, questions arise. Apparently, tonight the sea was ravenous. Does that only work around Moonling Isle? Does it also follow them wherever they go? Is it dangerous to other people who aren't Moonlings? How can Ela safely cross the moon, uh, to the Moonling Isle if the sea is acting that erratically? Does the sea kill more than Moonlings on this night? Is this curse location-based, and if so, can the Moonlings just move inland to avoid it? So many questions. This is why you need to attack your ideas to see if they hold up to scrutiny. And you can call this part a nitpick on my part, but I say that this is poor word choice. The entire aisle was empty. It was so quiet, Ela could hear the sea banging against the cliff of the castle over and over. Knocks on a door. Death demanding its due. The aisle is not, in fact, empty. Everyone is piled into the castle because that seems to be the only structure that can withstand the waves. Saying the streets were empty, or the town was quiet, or something akin to that might have worked. You actually get a better image. Instead, it said the entire aisle was empty, meaning no one's on Moon Isle, except yes, they are, because Ela runs into some of them. Who proofread this? And Ela, of course, is wearing a disguise to fit in with Moonling society, but this does raise a particular question. Her hair had been painted white with wildling elixir. 
She wore the right dress, but something told her that being a moonling was much more than that, and if any of the guards took one look at her, they would immediately know she was an imposter. Being outside during the full moon was the greatest hint to her identity at all. No moonling would survive being outside the palace tonight, so Ela needed to move like a ghost, get inside undiscovered. She stuck to the shadows, should anyone be watching from above. Just take this as a suggestion. Maybe if she used the star stick to teleport onto the aisle during the daytime, before everyone piled into the castle, she would have had an easier time sneaking inside because apparently that's where the library is and that's where everyone was convening anyway. Wouldn't she have been able to get inside without raising suspicion? Because now she's outside in the streets during the full moon. That's very unusual. And so she's got to go even more out of her way to avoid detection. But now, because she missed that opportunity, because she didn't actually plan that, but remember, she uses strategy like a general, now she has to circle the castle to try to find another way in because there's no way she can get, uh, get in through the front gate. There would absolutely be guards and they would absolutely have the doors shut to prevent the water from, like, I don't know, reaching in and pulling somebody out. I don't know how this curse works. Maybe that is an actual thing they have to consider. Fortunately, Ela does find a way inside. Throw a window, 50 feet up. Climb until your muscles learn the movements. Leave your mind out of it, Tara said. And Ela climbed the tree, the cliff, the wall, again, again, again. Her hands were used to this. They moved on their own, looking for grooves in the stone, finding them, going up and up and up. Another move, one hand latched onto a slight bump. Her fingers, her other fingers felt around for purchase. In addition to being a master swordswoman, a ninja, a lockpick, an alchemist, a stateswoman, and a survivalist, Ela is also an expert rock climber. After a while, a character having a diverse set of uh, expert skills can work, but it needs to fit their environment and their story. Batman is an expert in a great many things, but that's because he needs to be in order to match his opponents. He's up against geniuses and madmen with their own expert skills and needs to know how to uh, counter them. Ela has not met such a match, despite the apparent high stakes with the Centennial and other rulers. Everything is so vaguely defined or unexplored that this doesn't add up. It feels more like uh, Ila is this way because the author thinks it's cool. What we see here isn't a need for incredible skill. We see an excuse to show off. Oftentimes, it's better to give a character one area of expertise and have, uh, have him or her apply that skill set in various unexpected ways. It's like a new take on Sanderson's depth not width argument in regards to magic. Same principle applies. Give me a deeper, more clever protagonist instead of someone who is somehow an expert in so many things despite her young age. Another easy way around this would be if Ela was a century or two old. Considering that some of her other opponents, the other rulers, are over 500 years old, that's not a stretch. If Ela had been training in all these skills for 100 years, my argument is dead in the water. Instead, she's like 20? Oh, is it? Is it cuddle time? You're still an hour early for food. Not that you need food. You're getting fat, boy. So this is the problem that Ila's age really has. While I suspect that it was she was written that way to relate better to the reader, it also makes it much less believable because now we're straining our suspension of disbelief to uh, like understand how she could have so many expert skills in such a short period of time, relatively speaking. Now, an argument that Aster or people defending Lightlark might try to bring up is that at one point, Ela makes a wrong move and the, uh, like a chunk of rock holding her weight gives way and she starts falling down the cliff. You see, she does still make mistakes despite being an expert rock climber, apparently, except that argument is then ruined by this. So fast it was a muscle memory, Ela unclipped the back of her necklace, a dagger made to look like a choker, sharp point instead of a clasp, and dug its hidden blade into the rock with all her strength. She stopped falling, barely. Now, the fact that it's described as having a sharp point instead of a clasp leads me to believe that this is actually a very flexible blade that fits around her neck as a necklace, like as a choker, as opposed to being a separate a thing hanging from around her neck, kind of like uh, Mihawk's tiny dagger. And there are blades that are made to be that flexible. Sword belts are a thing that uh, that I've come across. 
I'm not sure if you'd really want a sharp edge around your neck like that. I mean, one good throat punch and you're bleeding from the jugular. But I will accept that this idea exists. What I won't accept is that a blade that would have to be that flexible would be able to support any kind of weight, even if it is a small blade. Like if it is designed to be hidden as a choker, it's gotta be very bendy. So once she stabs it into the rock, that should just like either give way entirely and just be totally malleable or not support her weight at all and go flying off. And yes, the blade does give out a moment later, but how did she like get any purchase with it in the first place? But whatever last minute badass saves are notwithstanding, she does manage to climb back up the uh, cliffside and into the window 50 feet up. She had to ninja her way down the hall, but uh, some patrolling guards uh, had uh, had spotted her. So Hila runs into a small closet or a small room or something when she overhears this conversation from the guards. How would they get past the Legion? The woman said, Legion? Cleo was building an army. Why? What was she planning? The Legion, whatever this happens to be, is a force so impressive that Ela didn't even register it as she snuck onto the island. But before she can wonder for long, the door of the room she was hiding in starts to open. Fortunately, armed guards with hundreds of years of experience are not a real issue. Ela didn't give the guards time to reach for their ice blades or wield the sloshing water held in vials across their belts. Before they could even yell for help, she had hit them in six different places. Special points Terra taught her to target. Their muscles slackened. One good hit each in the back of the head, and they slumped down to the floor, passed out. Not one drop of blood. Adding to the list of accomplishments, Ela is also a martial arts expert and can knock out two guards, possibly with hundreds of years of combat experience between them, in seconds hitting their exact pressure points. Legolas fights like someone who has hundreds of years of experience to his name. So this scene makes it sound like Ela just knocked out the equivalent of two rent-a-cops. Astra had a moment where things were going to be difficult for her protagonist, so she pushed the easy button and all of a sudden, Ela can knock these two out, no problem. I am, I am so tired of how many times Astra will set up like a, a real genuine challenge and then Ela just happens to luck her way through it or badass her way out of the problem without so much as a hint of a struggle. Show me effort. Show me struggle. Scenes like this are annoying. Because the hallways are being patrolled, Ela has to make her way through the castle quickly and quietly so she can find the library and find the um, hidden section so that she can verify if the bond breaker is there at all, uh, or not. Unfortunately, Ela runs down the wrong hall and winds up in a dead end with the sound of guards charging closer and closer. Oh no, what will she do? Well, she takes a moment to notice that the waves are crashing against the castle wall, but they don't feel like they're hitting like right against the wall. There's kind of a gap, like there's a hidden room just behind her. How very fortunate. So Ela puts on the skin glove, touches the stones. This is another hidden section that is broken by poking it. And the stones kind of start folding inwards and she falls backwards into the library and then the puzzle undoes itself and uh shuts the door before the guards can actually get to her and it's not that she barricades the door or something so the the moonling guards can't just like poke the wall themselves and open it up Apparently it's enchanted so that only Cleo would have access to the entire library, which meant that they can't get in, so they have to resort to... She's inside! Get the ruler! One. Two. I think it's worth noting that calling all of the rulers just ruler is weird because like, they don't have kings, queens, presidents, regents, monarchs, nothing like that. It, it's all, with the exception of Oro being the king of Lightlark, everyone is just ruler. While this is incorrect, the image that came to mind when I read that for the first time, when they were like, get the ruler, I was like, what are you going to do? Draw straight lines at her? It would also be very revealing if the rulers all went by different titles. So Cleo could be the queen, um, Ela could be the the warden celeste could be a professor or something this is something that i i believe that they handled pretty effectively with uh 
Alpha Centauri, a game that's got to be at least 20 years old by now. But Eli starts hurriedly looking around the library, trying to find the hidden section because it's, it's got to be in there somewhere, but everything is just books and frozen floor. You know, there's, there's nothing to indicate like any kind of hidden panels or anything inside as far as she can tell. Fortunately, one of the waves crashes against the wall nearby, and this time it throws her off balance, so she falls on the floor. For a moment, there was just blinding white. She blinked, willing her vision to come back, telling her body there was no time to waste, no time to give in to pain. Her cheek had nearly stuck to the ground. Her mind spun as she lifted it, and the world tripped before righting itself. Her arms shook as she made to get up. That was when she saw it. The floor was frosted over. Her body heat had warmed it enough that the icy coating had cleared, revealing a second library beneath. And somehow, through this minuscule cheek smudge, she's able to get a clear picture of everything inside this basement library room, which I guess is supposed to be the hidden section. And she can see an arrow with a snowflake point, crystal daggers, books with locks on them, but no bond breaker. Just as well, we're about a third of the way through the book. There's no way she's going to find it this early. But uh-oh, more guards are uh, standing outside, and they say, We have the entire Legion out here! Plus, with Cleo on the way, it won't take long for them to get the door open. So, what could Ela possibly do? How could she possibly get through them, through the only escape? Well, now she uses the star stick! She didn't know how to use it accurately for small distances or places she had never been before, but her room in the mainland castle was neither. The wall came down just as she portaled away. I'm calling bullshit on the way that this actually works because we, we get a hint later on of how she actually utilizes it. Because if she doesn't know how to use it accurately for places she had never been to before, easy solution. Visit the Moon Isle as part of a diplomatic effort, perhaps even with an apology to Cleo because she was so rude that first day. Please accept this random gift as an offering and apology. And there you go, access to the Moon Isle. Now she can uh, show up there with the star stick, blend in with the crowd, get into the castle, explore the library, get out with the star stick, and she's done. Also, I call bullshit in this whole she doesn't use it well with places she'd never been to before. She teleported to different continents before the book started. How do you think she met Celeste? I mean, the contrivance that that would require in order to make sense. Now, if it was the sort where she couldn't properly teleport because, like, if one wrong move, she'd wind up in the middle of the ocean or something, and then, okay, then maybe there's a little bit more that you can do with that. But we don't see any real counters or costs or potential deadly flaws of using the star stick. So, the question... Like, if you're, if you're approaching this book with the slightest bit of critical insight, your question becomes, why don't you use the goddamn star stick more often? Oh, I made my shirt a liar. After the failure at the Moon Isle, Hila spends two days sleeping, apparently dreaming about Grimm occasionally. But the Bond Breaker wasn't in any of the isles that they have explored. Uh, it wasn't the Star Isle, Sky Isle, or Moon Isle, which means it was only in one other place, Sun Isle completely ignoring that there is a wild isle that she should know about. The king's own land. It made sense that a relic as powerful as the Bond Breaker would be kept there. Except if it was, Aura would definitely know about it because he has full access to it and has had full access for five centuries. Why wouldn't he have used it? Three nights after the botched raid on Moon Isle, the rulers are invited to tea by Oro. Ela describes the tea room, says that it's lovely, mar uh, marble columns all over the place. They lined the way that guards might if Oro allowed them inside, and then we get this odd line. The king didn't need guards, however. Not even against rulers of realm. That has got to be a typo. So everyone sits down to tea, and they all have uh, different flavors, and they're all very lovely. And Cleo taunts Ela a little bit by asking how do wildlings take their tea with a splash of blood and Ila just says that they drink it from the skulls of their conquests but Ila is certain that Cleo knows that it was her who broke into the uh, moonling uh, library so she is very much on edge to the point where she doesn't even notice that this whole tea ceremony is actually a demonstration the king's pointer finger circled the lip of one of his teacups this is no ordinary tea he continued his tone steady it is a truth tea. Ela went still. Dread dripped down her spine. 
Your greatest secret is written in the leaves. She risked to look down into her cups, and she saw her greatest truth written across the three of them in careful script. I have no power. Now, the trial here is that whoever shares their secret wins. Everybody shatters their cups so that all of the secrets are hidden. Unlike the fear mirror, this is one time where I think it's actually appropriate that Aster doesn't reveal everybody's uh, innermost thoughts. The only person who doesn't shatter his cups is Oro, and he reveals that his secret is that he is dying. Now, this is particularly dangerous because if he dies, apparently all of Lightlark, like at least all of the magic, dies and possibly the island crumbles and collapses into the sea. But of course, that is the final demonstration, and Oro has gotten the most points and has won the most trials. And the, the concern that Ela and Celeste have afterwards, there's a bit of time before the teams are paired up, is that maybe their, their, their plan has been screwed up and maybe they won't be paired together. Celeste frowned. She placed a gentle palm, still buzzing with energy, against Ela's cheek. I know how incredible you are, my brilliant friend, she said, but they do not. The king is not going to pick you, or me for that matter. There's almost no point in trying to blindside the reader with something like that, because everyone can tell at this point the king's going to pick Ela, as he does three pages later. But before that, we finally get the prophecy that has been mentioned so many times on page 152. Only joined can the curses be undone. Only after one of six has won, when the original offense has been committed again, and a ruling line has come to an end, only then can history amend. I'm not one who thinks that prophecies and spells should always rhyme, but when they do, they should actually rhyme. Offense does not rhyme with again. Also, the meter is off. Now, there is a reason why Oro wants to work with Ela specifically, and... Actually, more than one reason, but getting ahead of myself. But this does kind of ruin the plan that Celeste and Ela had been working towards. Because now that they're not teamed up, they can't work together to search for the Bond Breaker. Which is weird, because they've already searched all the places they think they can. Still, Oro tries to be supportive and makes a deal with Ela. He lays his long fingers together. I have a theory about the curses, one I've been working through the last half century, and I believe you are able to help me. She wanted to laugh and say if it was power he needed, he should ask someone else. She wanted to make any excuse she could. You see, I require a knowledge of nature, one you clearly possess. So that was why he had saved her that first day, why he had paired them together. He did need something. What is the deal? You are, of course, aware of the second-to-last line of the Oracle's riddle. One of our realm must fall for the curses to be broken. Ela nodded. As we are a pair, I cannot harm you. And if you help me find what I seek, I will do my best to protect you from the other rulers as well. Search for something vague and get a potential bodyguard as, as part of the deal. Arguably the strongest ruler who's there. That's just vague enough to work! Well, Ela doesn't even ask what they're searching for, and it doesn't feel like this is in character, it feels like this is just something that's being saved for a dramatic reveal later. Oddly enough, that's exactly what's going on. But rather than just be upfront about what he needs, Oro decides to be a bit cryptic about how he and uh, Ela are going to search around on the island for this particular thing that he needs. Oro blinked slowly, annoyed. During our excursions together, no one can know you are a ruler of Wildling. She stiffened. Why? Lightlark doesn't like you. No kidding. Still, Ela scrowled, uh, scowled. Excuse me? Some ancient creatures on the island, the ones that still live in the deepest pockets of Lightlark, believe wildlings abandoned them 500 years ago. If they sense you or hear rumors that you are near their lands, they will attack, which will only end in spilled blood and too much attention to our efforts. There are ancient creatures on the island, and I want all of you to start thinking about what some of those might actually be. Now, consider this is a fantasy world set in a completely original uh, plane of existence. There are no rules that Aster is being bound by. These ancient creatures can be just about anything. 
try to guess what they are. For added fun, put it in the comments so everyone can see the variety of creatures that people could come up with. And don't feel bad about not getting it right. I didn't get it right. Mostly because I overestimated Aster. So these ancient creatures don't like wildlings, so that means that Ela is going to have to dress differently. Fortunately, she doesn't need to worry about powers. I can't sense your abilities, wildling. Her stomach collapsed. She made to step back. I can tell that you're cloaking them, he continued, without missing a beat. I just ask that you keep doing that when we're on the aisles. Oh boy, is that luck out. Well, even though she's getting ready for bed, Oro, because he's nocturnal, insists that they begin their search right then and there, even though Ela is in her pajamas. And the reveal did make me laugh, credit where it's due. So they start off on their exploration of the rest of the island, and Oro just says that they're headed towards the storm. So we'll get to learn a little bit more about that after we get a subject break and Ela starts thinking about uh, some old stories from her homeland. Now, this is something that Aster has done sporadically and rather annoys me. Her use of literal and figurative prose just gets confusing. In wildly lands, the wind whispered. So take that sentence right there. It sounds very uh, figurative, right? You know, the wind just like hushes through the leaves and it sang using wind chimes as instruments or something. But then you read the rest of the section. It sang songs and passed along gossip and whistled melodies high pitched as clock chimes. Before Tara and Poppy had sealed it shut, Ela had sometimes kept the loose pane in her room open during the day, hoping to catch bits and pieces of what the wind said. The wind spoke of heartbreak from wildlings who had made the mistake of falling in love, of hearts eaten and torn open by nails sharp as knives. It told her stories that seemed old as the trees themselves, born of seeds that were rumored to come straight from Lightlark. The wildling Newland had been formed just 500 years prior, but its foundation was ancient. It was said that after they fled the island and its cursed storm, a hundred wildlings sacrificed themselves to create their new land, relinquishing their power to the dry, infertile dirt. Flowers bloomed from their blood, forests grew in a matter of weeks, and the new land was born from their bones. That was what the wind said, anyway. Ela found it to be quite dramatic. Astrid's use of figurative and literal prose irritates me. At the start of the paragraph, Ela says the wind whispered. Figurative, presumably. At the end, Ela says she used to keep her window open to listen to the stories the wind told. Literal. She's usually literal in her usage of descriptive passages, but it's framed in a way that sounds very figurative. It makes figuring out what Astra's really trying to say a challenge in a way that shouldn't be a challenge, like figuring out the convoluted controls on an underdeveloped video game. So every once in a while, you get lines and descriptions that are flowery and poetic, and they set one sort of image but because of moments like this, with the whispering wind, you're not sure how literally you should take it. The entire book becomes an exercise in patience because you have so much that you have to juggle, not just of the expositional information that's already been dumped on us, but the way that information is spread out sporadically and told in this unclear manner. Aster accidentally utilized the author's assumption as a writing style and she isn't aware of it. Aster thinks she's giving us one clear image, but she's not actually putting the real effort that she needs to forth, so what image we do get is cloudy and unclear. She thinks she's done the work to set everything up properly and she genuinely hasn't, as evidenced by all the questions I've come up with thus far. I have so many questions! But then we get some detail about how the storm actually works and how it stops, uh, or how it cuts off Lightlark from the rest of the world. And that's good, except it also contradicts a little bit with some of the other world building. Dark clouds like blotches of ink stained the sky above the beach. Silver lightning strikes thick as blades shot out of them and down to the sand, glittering and jittering energy. A ringlet of fire hovered close by, its flames stuck in time. Enormous, Deadly spouts leaked from gaps in the clouds, like she long sheets of water, like beams of moonlight tinged in purple. The sea had been pulled back like a blanket and stacked high, a wave tall as a tower crested but never fell. It was frozen, though not in ice. Even from her height, Ela could see the water running within it, bubbling, waiting. It had left a long stretch of seafloor uncovered. 
Sparkling gems and long lost ancient trinkets covered the sand alongside shells. It was the curse on the island temporarily subdued the enchanted storm. And small note, but Azul constantly visits the beach and stares out into the storm. That will be revealed why later. So, okay, there is a giant literal wall of water uh, as part of the storm that now surrounds the entire island. Makes sense. I can accept that because it's magic. Whatever. Except if the sea has been pulled back and forms this wall that way, then what crashes against the castle in the Moon Isle? How much ocean is left here? Because the way that this image is presented, it sounds like a lot of the water is being used in this giant uh, water wall. So how much water is there to actually attack the Moonlings? You would think that they would be safest deeper inland on the mainland of Lightlark instead of on their island. Like, if there's not that much water surrounding the island, because most of it's being utilized as part of the storm wall, shouldn't they be safer inland because the water, like, there's not enough water to reach them? Why didn't they go inwards? Why don't they establish a city deeper in the mainland? I mean, there's something to be said about cultural pride or something, and then why they wouldn't want to give up their, their, uh, isle, but... This is like a matter of survival. That should trump. While they're walking along, Oro confirms that he was the one who saved Ela on the first day when she fell from the balcony, and she starts to scold him because she did land in the water. Couldn't he have gotten to her sooner? Well, you might have hit the water before I got to you, but you also had a head injury that you would not have woken up from if I hadn't healed you. Oro leads Ela to a big hole in the ground where it's just wide enough to jump down, and it's apparently very, very deep. Oro has the advantage because he can actually fly, so he gets to slowly hover his way down the hole, but rather than carry Ela down, she has to jump herself and eventually lands in a pool of water. The whole thing was a test to see if Ela actually trusted Oro. Whilst they're down in this cavern, Ela and Oro confront each other on the matter of trust, and Oro finally confesses that they are looking for Lightlark's heart. Ela raised an eyebrow. It's what? It's source of power. It's life force. She tilted her head at him. Isn't that you? Oro gave her a strange look. No. I am the island's conduit, if anything. My connection to Lightlark, through blood, binds me to it. Through that bond, I can funnel power. But if you die, Lightlark dies. If its power cannot be funneled or is unbalanced, the island will crumble. Not because I am its heart, but because everything we have built, everything we are, relies on the power I channel. And he explains that it is an actual heart, but not like the kind Ela eats, supposedly. They walk down a cave into an oasis, in the center of the mountain they're underneath, and there are hundreds of plants growing out of the cave floor. Magic left over from the wildlings from when they did used to live in Lightlark. The heart of Lightlark blooms every hundred years, attached to a living thing, a plant. If you could identify which types of plants something like the heart might be drawn to, they could guide our search. We could go where they originate on the island. So that was why he needed her. And okay, as far as reasoning goes, that makes enough sense. And despite her lack of powers, Ila does at least have an understanding of plant life. So this isn't going to be something that becomes a problem later on. It's like, oh, we need you to psychically move these trees out of the way or whatever. Ila starts examining the various flowers that are present in the cave and she details a few things like uh, water lilies or this type of made up flower called a purse that is able to carry things without killing them, blood red roses that only grow over dead bodies, all sorts of things. And these are plants that will make uh, appearances later in the book. They will be central to a lot of the searches that these two have to go on, though I couldn't tell you why these particular plants when there are hundreds of different species present here. Oro takes the list of plants that uh, Ila has arbitrarily chosen and has decided that, or will decide on a few places that they can look uh, in order to try to find the heart. But after Ila's assessment, uh, they need to leave before the sun rises, otherwise Oro will die terribly. And she realizes that the only exit from this cave is for them to, uh, is for him to fly up through the hole they came in from 
while carrying her. An idea she does not like. Absolutely not! You must have spent too much time under the moon, you lunatic! I see Astra's first year English lesson is showing. And while carrying her and flying through the air, Ela screams into Oro's ears, and uh, her nails dug deeply into the back of his neck, so much so that she was sure that she drew blood. And despite that, there was no fire, as there was supposed to be. But to get back to the mainland castle, Ela and Celeste uh, convene the next morning, and uh, Ela uh, admits the whole, you know, there's, there's a uh, heart of Lightlark somewhere on the island, and Celeste insists that, you know, they still need to keep looking for the bond breaker but Ela is going to help Oro for now. In fact, they start later that night. There's a hill uh, full of the flowers called purses that uh, Oro knows about, and they start searching there. And apparently they'll know when they get close because the power of the heart uh, radiates is unmistakable, but only detectable from a very close distance, which explains to Ela why Oro hadn't abandoned her in the cave. He still needs her. And the two of them go off and search on their own for a good long while. Oro has been described as untrusting plenty of times beforehand, and he is very off-putting. At one point, even flicking Ela's crown, I'm not sure why she's wearing it out here, but whatever, and apparently flicked it so hard that he actually dented it. Keep this in mind. And you can tell with these small moments that Aster's trying to work towards Ela and Oro as another love pair, but it's really telling that both of Ela's suitors are dark and mysterious loners. You think Aster's got a type? But their search is in vain. They do not find the heart anywhere among the purses. When Ela does get some sleep later, she has a uh, particular dream about Grimm. She whipped around, and there he was, Grimm. He was dressed in armor, shining sheets of black metal. He was the thing of nightmares, the monster in the dark. For a moment, she was nervous, but not afraid. Still, she took a step back until she and her shadow were one and the same. He stepped closer, reached up to pull the helmet from his head, dropped it to the floor with a loud clatter, lifted her from the ground by the back of her thighs, just as her hands fisted in his hair, and she said... Then she wakes up. You know, it makes total sense that she's having these uh, sexy time dreams about Grimm, because, you know, he's so... describable. You know, he has such a vibrant personality... somewhere. Apparently it's been a week since she's seen Grimm, and she notes that this is weird because before he had sought her out whenever he could, and now he's been gone for several days. Which would be something interesting to consider if he had actually sought her out whenever he got the chance, but there are plenty of opportunities where that never happened. It just feels like Asser is drawing us to a particular conclusion that doesn't really mesh with what we've seen thus far. Yeah, they've bumped into each other plenty of times, and he has gone out of his way to try to find her on more than one occasion, but to the point where he sought her out whenever he could, it just seems like a stretch. But with her dream of Grimm still in her head, Ela gets up to try to make a, a sleeping potion to help her get back to sleep, hopefully without thinking about Gr uh, Grimm again. She walks down the hallways to gather some ingredients, but she overhears a conversation, something between Oro and Azul. What were they doing, meeting in such a strange hidden place? Ela crept closer to the voices, walking silently, just like Tara had taught her, tips of her toes, then the sides of her feet, her heels never reaching the floor. You will be sentencing thousands to death, Oro snarled. She didn't dare take a breath. There was a pause. A realm has to die, Oro, Azul finally responded. And she accidentally uh, makes a slight noise in the hallway, so the door closes and she doesn't hear the rest of the conversation, but it is very strange. What could they be talking about? What secret alliance are they working towards? Well, when Ela confronts Oro about this the next day, he says Azul's harmless. He's, uh, he's not really trying to do anything. But Ela's still not convinced. She, th she thinks that something happened to Azul, so Oro placates her. Seconds ticked silently by, and Ela thought he was going to ignore her again. But he finally said, Azul lost someone. Someone he loved. Oh, Ela wasn't expecting that. She supposed all rulers had lost someone close to them the night the curses were spun. This seemed different. A partner? She guessed. He nodded. His husband. And this is a particular selling point that Aster had made when advertising Lightlark. She 
promise that there was going to be like a prominent gay character and Azul's pretty much it. I mean, you've also got Cleo who's bi, but that never really manifests or amount to anything. And Azul is very much a background character for most of this story. Now, I'll at least credit Aster for including this well, because in previous examples we've seen with Ernest Klein and Chuck Wendig, uh, it doesn't feel like Azul is just being thrown in there arbitrarily, you know, simply for the sake of including a gay character just to earn brownie points. It feels like she actually made an effort not a great effort, but the inclusion also feels more natural. It's not this moment that's arbitrarily wedged in like the way that Wendig uh, in, discussed Sinjir being gay in uh, Star Wars Aftermath. It fits nicely into the conversation. I would still prefer if this info came from Azul directly, because now it feels more like you're just describing something about a separate character as opposed to that character revealing something about himself. But at this point, I will... I'll take it. It's better than what we've seen before. But the mention of Azul's husband is utilized to include the topic of marriage between realms, because Azul's husband was not a Skyling, and that gets Ela to ask, is marrying between realms common on Lightlark? It has become more common, was all he said. She frowned. How does that affect power then? Children, are they born with just one realm's ability? She looked at him. They don't get both, do they? He shook his head. She waited expectantly, wanting a better explanation. The king sighed. They are born with one power, wildling. Also, another typo, there is a missing comma after common. But this also harkens back to King Egan, who was proposed, uh, who was uh, engaged to the starling woman. And King Egan keeps getting brought up because he was the sunling ruler uh, the night that the curses were spun, and he died as a result of that, so that they could get the prophecy. As Oro and Ela continue their walk deeper into the woods, Oro points out that the entrance to Wild Isle is near, and Ela asks, well, how do we know the heart isn't on Wild Isle? Wouldn't that be where the most plants are? Wouldn't it make more sense to try checking that out? And he points out that all the nature on Wild Isle is dead. Part of the curse or lack of a groundskeeper, you tell me. Apparently, wildlings used to be advisors in the Sunling court back before the curses were spun, and now that they've left and they've pretty much isolated themselves on the uh, on their newlands the wildlings are something dangerous something to be feared at least that's what oro seems to imply and they start searching around a bunch of uh, coffiner trees and of course hours go by and they find nothing oro says that it would be easier if Ela was able to actually use her powers but the creatures it would draw out i'm not sure it's worth the risk and this is weird because I'm not sure why these creatures hate the wildlings. I don't remember if this is ever actually explained later in the book. But right now, this doesn't seem like an aspect of the curse. It seems like the uh, these creatures just hate wildlings for personal reasons. But the night ends in failure, of course, and they uh, both go back to the mainland castle. Now consider how long this video has been going and how much plot and how many different aspects of the world has been introduced when we're this far into the book, not quite halfway there yet. I'm currently on chapter 26, that, is on, that starts on page 188. Normally when you have a plot this complicated and eventful, it's because you're following multiple storylines. This is all centered around Hela, so it's harder to justify her rushing about as much as she is. A more cynical take is that this is a story about how unique and creative the Island of Lightlark is, characters be damned. During their third night together in the forest, Hela asks Oro, uh, why didn't Cleo attend the last centennial? And they start talking about Cleo personally, uh, including such things like she hasn't even taken a lover since she came into power because she is that dedicated to her job as a ruler. She's that dedicated to her realm. And Ila wonders if she would be willing to just randomly murder somebody else uh, in order to protect her realm. After all, that's part of the prophecy, right? Well, Oro has a counter to all of that. He had never looked as repulsed by her as he did then. Don't you understand, wildling? Killing a ruler isn't the hard part. We all have had several opportunities to fulfill that portion of the prophecy. Do you know why killing isn't allowed until the 50th day? He looked so upset, she didn't dare form a response. It's because choosing the right ruler and realm to die is the difficult part. Not just because we would be sentencing thousands to death, but because all of our futures depend on making the right decision. His voice became louder. She had never seen him more impassioned. 
or angry. All of our realms are connected. You can't begin to understand the consequences of lo uh, losing one of them. Even if we did know for certain the offense that needed to be committed again, the decision of who needs to die would be nearly impossible. That, more than anything else, is why the curses haven't been broken until now. Convoluted rant time! Oro reveals that rulers aren't allowed to kill each other until the 50th day because the hard part is deciding which rulers should die in order to fulfill the prophecy. Alright. But if the actual date isn't something decreed by prophecy, why wait until day 50? Why not wait until the very end to give the maximum time to allow as much decision and debate on the idea as possible? It sounds more like this rule is in place to allow death threats later in the plot rather than to create a cohesive narrative. Oro also states that the realms are all connected and they can't begin to understand the consequence of losing even a single realm. This is because if the ruler dies without an heir, the magic dies with them, somehow, and I guess that means the people also die, but that hasn't been explained yet. Oro finishes by saying this is why the curses haven't been broken until now. If that's true, then what was the point of the other centennials? Was this prophecy something they just came up with this year? It's not, but it feels like that in concept here. Then what made them meet every century before this? Why are they going along with any of this? Why hasn't any other ruler gone off the deep end and just murdered someone out of desperation? Why does so little of this world make sense? Nothing survives even basic scrutiny. This is why critical beta readers are so important. Now, consider everything you know about the book so far, and uh, consider especially everything in the demonstrations. If you had to make a choice at this moment, what realm if you had to, would you kill off? Ela suggests, why not just kill Grimm? Because he's not part of Lightlark, isn't he the obvious choice? It's okay to ask for help. You're not a burden. Murder is okay. To which Oro gives an ominous reply. His smile was mocking, cruel. I can't, he said. Perhaps it was because he was so angry, so eager to throw it in her face how little she understood. He told her more than she expected he would. Grim is the only thing standing between us and a greater danger you can't even begin to fathom. Hear their susurring thoughts. The terrible secrets of the universe. The night's almost over and they're wrapping up their uh, search when Ela steps a little deeper into the forest where she discovers a series of rose bushes and a wall of vines. Well, somehow the vines react to her and they start attacking her. So the uh, thorns wrapped her up, uh, pulled her into a nest of spikes, and dozens of barbs start stabbing her all over, especially like along the back. And blood ran hot down her back. And remember the magic blood thing? Well, Oro comes by and rescues her, and she insists on pulling all the barbs out of her, uh, out of her back, somehow. If I were to play defense for this, you could argue that there are flower petals all over the place, and maybe Oro made the mistake of thinking that, you know, those were formed from her blood. But that just feels like a weak defense, because she's actively bleeding as she's pulling these out, and the magic blood thing doesn't happen. No flower petals or whatever stems from the blood coming out of her skin. And she's bleeding right in front of him. Like, he offers to help pull some of them out, but she wants to do it herself. Like, he's, he's right there, kneeling in front of her. Eventually, Oro convinces her that it would be faster if he helped, and he starts pulling some of the thorns out. So, no doubt, he's coming directly into contact with her blood. And darkness wouldn't really be a thing, because the flower petals are tangible. He would feel them as they were... well. Were they forming, he would feel them, and the fact that he never does, never gets raised. The magic blood thing becomes too inconvenient for this scene, so Aster ignores it for the sake of the plot continuing the way that she wants it to, because the magic system that she built doesn't work at this particular moment, so she puts a pause on it! But with his latest attempt, resulting in failure, no Heart of Light Lark discovered. Oro says that it might be time to meet one of those ancient creatures he told her about. Did you vote on what one of the ancient creatures might be? Do you think you're close? Five days go by as Oro's off doing something about the ancient creature thing, when Ila is out in the, uh, in the town in the Agora, when someone passes her and gives her a note, it just says, you're in danger. Now, it's still day 40, so 
Uh, they're not allowed to kill other rulers yet, so she's not quite in that much danger, but she does still have a little bit of breathing room. She looks around and she finds the person who th she suspects handed her the note, so she follows that person down a series of uh, alleyways and passages, eventually winding up at a harbor. But when she rounds a corner, Ela took a step and gasped. Chains from nowhere locked around her wrists and ankles, and the cool edge of a sword pressed firmly against her throat. That was a little too easy, a low voice said in her ear. Ela yanked against the chains and found that they uh, weren't chains at all. They were braided water, firm as a rogue wave, strong as the tide. What? Five more men peeled away from where they had been hidden, behind ancient boathouses and landlocked ships. They wore crisp white suits with diamonds in place at the, of the top button of their shirts. Moonling nobles. She recognized them from the demonstrations. A growl escaped her throat. She became a little more of the beast they believed her to be. The person in the white cape appeared then, and Ila bared her teeth at them, her gaze promising violence. The figure didn't even glance her way before it was handed, uh, before it was handed a handful of coin and slipped away. A trap. She had been tricked. Fool. No. They were the fools. That's cringe. You're cringe! And this reveals a glaring, obvious threat that I think most people reading the book would have figured out a long time ago, because the Moonling nobles here give their motivation. I'm sorry, one of the men said, surprising her, and the rest of his group, it seemed. But the Centennial isn't just a game for rulers. One of the realms must fall, and we have families. He shook his head. We don't want it to be us. This is actually a point that I came up with way earlier in my notes. This is a sort of reckless assassination that some rando citizen could have attempted at any time, especially considering how often Ela goes out into the Agora. Even with the, the fear of how dangerous wildlings apparently are and how skilled we've seen Ela is with any number of weapons, you, you haven't seen anyone make an attempt on her life at this point. You don't even have to be sensical. You just be some sort of a crazed, desperate loner with a hammer. You take the right swing at the right time and boom, he's a hero to his people, at least for a few minutes. But Eel is actually in trouble. She can't fight with the chains around her and she doesn't have any powers to call on. So it looks like she's actually in some degree of trouble. How is she gonna get out of this? Especially because the moonlings seem like they are intent on killing her right then and there. They're not gonna carry her off to a dungeon and then have Cleo stab her with an icicle or something. But no, Celeste shows up out of nowhere and pulls one of the guys away and uh, he disappears in a mess of silver sparks. And this gives uh, Ela just enough time to un like unshackle the bracelets and anklets so now she can really fight and sends two throwing knives into two separate moonling hearts at the same time. My turn. <laughs> We get another moment where she smiles in the middle of combat and I roll my eyes. This also undercuts the tension of the moment because now it doesn't feel like it's that big a deal. If she's smiling in the midst of combat, she's probably not dealing with very high stakes. Why undercut the tension of the moment like this? Carry it through to the end. Celeste comes to the same conclusion as uh, Ela that Cleo tried to have her murdered, so they need to send a message. So they leave a little note that says, Try harder. Just get good. The attempt on her life leaves Ela wanting power more than ever before in her life. She goes and she gets another new weapon from the Starling shop that I suppose uh, I suppose she got the sword from before, and uh, gets a dagger, one with a curling snake around the hilt, fit for a wildling. Which again raises the question: If they're allowed to purchase weapons, then why can't they bring any from their homelands? After purchasing the weapon, she twirls the dagger around, cutting the air to pieces. When Grimm approaches, and Ela chastises him for being indecisive. One day you act like we're friends, and the next, strangers, you disappear for weeks. And when Grimm asks if, uh, you know, what would she prefer if they were friends or strangers, Ela responds. She swallowed, begging her emotions to stay in check. Neither, she lied. I just want you to stay away from me, consistently. He stepped uh, toward her, grinning just a little. Is that what, truly what you want, Heart Eater? Her breath hitched. He felt her everything. 
She turned away before he could feel even uh, feel any more. Grimm's grin vanished. He suddenly became deathly serious. We really should stay away from each other. That's got to be a Twilight reference. Bella, we we shouldn't be friends. But rather than stay away, he actually leads her to the Wild Isle. There's uh, something of a path they need to follow, and he takes her to a structure, something kind of in the middle. And uh, remember, the Wild Isle is, like, there's nothing alive on the island, and there hasn't been for several centuries. In the center of death stood a structure. Grimm was by her side. They call it the Place of Mirrors. Every inch of the palace was covered in reflective glass that cast back the bare forest, mirroring its surroundings. Its edges winked in the sunlight. The Place of Mirrors looked fragile, like a strong wind could shatter it. But it had survived when everything else on Wild Isle hadn't. It was shaped like the carnival tents she had seen on the outskirts of the Skyling Newland when, with her star stick, bulbous, as if blown up by air, and pointed in three places. So this monument to her people, standing from ancestral times, looks like a circus tent. Got it. <laughs> Clowns are funny. Also, Place of Mirrors. Are you kidding? And why is the palace in the middle of the Island for the Wildlings reflective glass? I'm making an assumption here, but maybe the idea was that you wanted to reflect nature as much as possible, which you think you could do even better with a treehouse. Wouldn't it be that much more convincing if instead of a big artificial building, you had a massive ass tree with, you know, like standing up on its roots with people having tunneled underneath it, using the tree as support with you know, like ladders climbing up into the branches and structures built into the tree itself. I mean, how much cooler would that be? I mean, even dead, something like that would be an absolute monument for the strength and potential the wildlings at least used to possess. And uh, granted, this is a nitpick, but it does display sloppy world building. They step inside and a few leaves sweep inside as well. Leaves generally take about a year to disintegrate, and this place has been absent for 500. Where did the leaves come from? Are we to believe that the leaves somehow fell from trees on the mainland and then the wind blew them over with enough precision for them to wind up inside the place of mirrors. And while I might not be impressed by the notion of this thing, Ela certainly is. She and Grimm wander around inside the uh, place of mirrors for quite some time when Grimm asks, Is it everything you hoped it would be? Grimm asked. She turned. It's much more, even if it's almost empty. Ela hadn't gotten to explore the entirety of the palace, but she guessed she would find it cleared out, the same way the other rooms were. The fact that it's still here, she pressed her palm against the wall, gives me hope that wildlings can survive all of this. To your future career in the circus. Ela explores the place of mirrors, a fragile castle in the middle of a dead island. This is about as desolate as you can get in this world. Despite this, Ela says, the fact that it's still here gives me hope. The wildlings can survive all of this. We don't have a frame of reference for what happened or when. This all could have happened well after the wildlings left Wild Isle. So Ela is making a pretty big assumption here. If she isn't, this is something that should have been reinforced, so it's a mistake either way. How does a dead island give her an ounce of hope? What survival is she talking about? What's worse is that right after this line, Ela asks Grimm what his land is like, and he says he may show her. This carries the emotional through line from her hopeful comment, meaning all this was just to cement a budding relationship between her and Grimm, something the book does only sporadically and without clear direction. And considering that she left the Wild Isle right after this, I can safely assume that budding romance was the only point of the scene, not only to dis uh, not to discover something meaningful about the wildlings. These tissue-thin characters need some serious bulking up. 
We're expected to see this as character growth in chemistry, but none of it is built on anything foundational. And yes, we're told earlier that the wildlings abandoned this land, so a lot of the death could just be their magic not being around. But that still raises questions because Lightlark itself is supposed to be teeming with magic. After all, that's where the heart currently resides, and that's where a lot of their power stems from. If the heart is still present on Lightlark in the mainland, why doesn't that extend to the Wild Isle? And how does an artificial structure do anything to reinforce the idea that wildlings, the group that is closely associated with nature, can survive all of this? Like I said, if this had been a giant treehouse of some sort, her message, her idea might have actually carried through. But considering that it's all this weirdly constructed hall of mirrors, a lot of the assessment doesn't make sense. It's like there's this really constricted metaphor that Aster's trying to play with, and I'll be honest, I don't get it. Also, it's been a little more than a month, and Hila and Celeste haven't done any scouting of this particular island. Why is Grimm the one to introduce this to Hila? She and Oro passed the pathway that leads to this while they were doing their inspections, like, some number of days ago. And at no point did Hila consider Maybe we should check out the Wild Isle in case there's a library there. They haven't had any luck with any of the other libraries they've searched. What would it hurt to double check? But Ela goes back later that night to check out the, uh, the Place of Mirrors, does a little more digging around, and actually discovers a vault. Obviously, this could lead to some sort of a library or hidden chamber where the Bondbreaker could be, right? And you would think, Oh, well, all she needs to do is find any kind of wildling presence, because she doesn't really have any powers herself, so she can't poke the wall and open the door. She needs to go out and find it, use the skin gloves to absorb the magic, and then poke the door and open the... Just... <sighs> can't get over how stupid that is. But instead, unlike every other hidden library they've come across, this one needs to be opened with a key, but not just any key. This one is strange. Hila studied the wall and spotted a gap. A place for a key! No, it was too long for a key to fit, unless it was massive. That's what she said! <laughs> she looked around for something that matched the intricate design, a strange pattern like a miniature mountain range. A short candlestick holder seemed to fit close to the right size. She tried to shove it into the hole, but it didn't fit, not even close. And she tries a few more things, but nothing works, the vault stays closed. So, needing information, she goes to find Juniper the next day. He, of course, needs a secret in order to trade a secret, and she says that Moonling nobles tried to assassinate her. And he just accepts that at face value. You know, Juniper's gotta be the easiest guy to get secrets out of all. You just walk up to him and make up anything, and he'll probably believe it. It's a well-known statistic that 83% of people married longer than six months are seeing someone on the side. He doesn't know much about the place of mirrors, and even admits that he doesn't know anything about, uh, uh, a vault or anything possibly hidden inside. But there is some information he can trade her. I do know something about the Place of Mirrors, however. She sat down again. Juniper had used the castle's name, the same one Grimm had told her. What is it? The Place of Mirrors is the only place on the island where all powers other than wildlings are repressed. Only wildling ability works inside. This of course begs the question, why doesn't that work anywhere else on Lightlark? Why are there no other palaces that suppress powers? Wouldn't that be a tremendous defensive advantage? Wouldn't you want something like that in case your your island was invaded? There was a massive bloody war on Lightlark 20 years before the curses were created. The possibility of a massive war is still something that is considered later in the book. No, unfortunately, this is just another thing that we will discuss later. Okay, I wasn't planning on doing story time with Taka, but somebody was howling because he missed his mommy. So he's going to spend a little bit of time with me while I go over some more notes. Hila goes back out to the... Oh, Hila goes back out to the Agora and runs into Grimm because... Why not? He's probably stalking her at this point. When they both get caught in the rain, so they run inside of an abbey for cover. And we get a bit more flirting scenes from Grimm. Now, you remember that dent that uh, Oro made in Hila's crown when he flicked it too hard that one time? Tuck, you want to read this one? With a final tug, he freed her crown. 
He frowned down at it, and Ela watched as his thumb ran down across the dent Oro made days before. It smoothed over instantly. He handed it to her in the limited space between them. Tuck's so good at reading, he doesn't even have to look at the book to know what the words are. Tuck, what do you think of Grimm so far? He sounds like a putz. Grimm also confirms that he became the ruler of Nightshade the night that the curses were formed. Uh, that's because the original sacrifices included his father. Now, Grimm opens up uh, kind of with some degree of vulnerability, and Ela says, you know, she's, she knows what it's like to have responsibility that, you know, you never wanted, never thought you deserved. And this turns into a conversation about the display of power. And Grimm offers to show off what he can really do. So all they have to do is go outside into the rain. Fast as lightning, he turned, hand shooting in front of him, and darkness erupted in a violent line. A wall of ink that rippled like water, peaked like flames. It whipped right past her, inches from her face. She stumbled back, the force of it almost making her fall over. As quickly as it had struck, the darkness dissolved. Ela took an unsteady breath. In the place as night had touched, life had been ripped away. The grass was set charred and matted. Trees were reduced to hulls that decayed into ash right before her eyes. Oh no! And there he goes. So I'm reminded of the scene from Avatar The Last Airbender, the episode where Katara learns about bloodbending and uh, I believe the character's name was Hama. And she demonstrates how available water is as a resource by drawing it out of the uh, grass and whatnot all around her. And that works visually because there's a stark contrast between not just the utilization, like how easily accessed water is, but also at the cost because all that grass is now dead. Ela, the ruler of the nature realm, sees Grimm kill all of this stuff destroys all of this life. Grass and trees were completely reduced to ash right in front of her. And rather than say, oh my God, that's terrible, she reacts thusly. He had turned back to the cliff, hand fisted at his side, a hand that wielded terrible, terrible power. Grim went still when she trailed two fingers over the back of that hand against her better judgment. When she said, show me more, he grinned. I'm wet, can I come in? He just killed a whole bunch of nature, and she barely reacts to the whole display of power, something that costs something that she should be, if not intimately familiar with, at least associated with. But instead of recoiling in horror, she's biting her lower lip and giving Grimm goo-goo eyes. And that's not all he can do. Instead of grinning again, Grimm's expression darkened. The ocean curled with a giant wave that crested before them and collapsed into cliffs just feet away. His mouth was suddenly at her ear. I could open a black hole that would swallow the beach. I could turn the sea dark as ink and kill everything inside of it. I could demolish the castle brick by brick from where we stand. I could take you back to nightshade land with me right now. His voice was deep as dreams dark as nightmares. I could do all of those things. His lip pressed against the top of her ear for just a moment. And I might, if I didn't think you would hate me for it. I'm penis man! Ah. Grim lays out more of his powers, telling instead of showing. He says he can teleport Ela with him back to uh, Nightshade Lands, open a black hole on the beach, pour ink into the ocean and kill everything, and even dismantle the mainland castle brick by brick from where this, we're standing on the beach. These could all work within the power scale, but none of this will matter. Great power is meaningless if we don't get to see it. Readers generally react better to feeling these displays, uh, not being told them. In Justice League Unlimited, there's a great moment that I really like where Superman's fighting Darkseid, the battle's not going well, Darkseid's like standing strong against everything, and so Superman gives his speech in which he says he feels like he lives in a world made of cardboard feel like I live in a world made of cardboard, always taking constant care not to break something, to break someone, never allowing myself to lose control, even for a moment, or someone could die. But Darkseid's different. He can take the punch, and so Superman winds up and gives a, this, this wonderful display, like one of the best punches I've ever seen Superman throw. That 
is how you display power and give it meaning. Incredible display, along with him expressing his feelings, works well and stands out. Grimm is otherwise the troubled bad boy archetype with a depth you'd find on most used tissues. On the 43rd night of the centennial, Oro finally visits Ela again, and she points out that it's been eight days, and he says that that was necessary because he found the ancient creature. I hope you all have your guesses locked in. It took five days to find her, two to coax her out of hiding, and one to make a deal. And to find this ancient creature, they have to go to the Star Isle, which is good because we, the reader, have not been able to see that yet. So this is going to be another place that we can see in order to give the world a little bit more life and understanding. Or at least that's what would happen if we weren't given another text crawl. The Isle was glittering, beautiful, but in ruins. Unlike Sky Isle, run by its people and the representatives, or Moon Isle, run by the strict Cleo and her harsh nobles, these lands were unkempt, overgrown. It was a wonder the castle still stood. All other structures looked either unstable or were already partially fallen apart. This is what happened when an entire realm died before 25, she supposed. Their government was almost non-existent, run by nobles who were practically still children when they died. The reason I don't like this is because these are observations that are being made in passing as Ela is walking through Star Isle without really interacting with it. Now, I'm not a huge Wheel of Time fan. Personally, I think that the pacing is a bit slow and the plot a tad meandering. But if there's one thing that I have to give Robert Jordan credit for over anyone else, is that this man can paint an image and breathe life into a a town, a villa, any location better than almost any author I can list. He does this by having his characters interact with the world in ways that made sense, in ways that provide detail, that provide depth. In the first book alone, for example, the characters don't just visit a set of ancient ruins, they explore a set of ruins and end up discovering a knife that, well, things happen because of that. Egwene and Perrin don't just walk with the traveling people, they ask them questions, they get involved in their culture, they attend a dance and a feast. Matt and Rand don't just stop at an inn for the night, they work for their uh, room as, uh, as Gleeman uh, entertainers. All of these steps breathe a little bit more life into each different section of the world so that you don't feel like you're just passing some tiny little stable village with nothing really substantial to say. Every location has something memorable about it, and that is incredible for anyone to be able to achieve. These aren't places you just pass by and forget about. You remember everything. Although, side note, Wheel of Time fans have probably got to be the most inviting fandom I've ever come across. A passing compliment about the books, and they're like, Hey, I like you now. You're my friends now. We're having soft tacos later. Oro leads Zila to the edge of town where they find some ancient building, all arches and columns, and they start descending down a set of stairs until they get to some sort of a cellar. Oro grabs a nearby thorn, pricks his palm with it, and a drop of blood drips onto the floor. It doesn't sizzle or burn like it should, but whatever. And this is to summon the ancient creature. And a woman stepped out of the wall. She wore a simple dress that floated around her, just like her hair, both suspended as if she was underwater. Her body was silver and slightly transparent. A specter. This was the ancient creature? A ghost? What the... a ghost? The ancient creature they were going to meet was a ghost. Just a ghost. The day before I read this chapter, I was actually playing God of War Ragnarok, and I saved a flying jellyfish the size of a building with a name that sounds like a sneeze that I can't pronounce. It flies? Of course it flies. It's a half goofa is the best thing that Aster can come up with for a mystical ancient creature just a ghost? This thing is supposedly as old as the island itself. I was hoping for a kraken, a leviathan, a toddler in a kaiju costume, something! <coughs> this is so devoid of creativity that I'm really feeling let down. I was hoping for at least a giant turtle in a pope hat or something. This is the being that took five days to find, two days to coax out, and one day to make a deal with. What a letdown. Though, if I'm being fair and transparent, I will say that there is a line that amused me. The ghost starts 
approaching Ela, checking her out, complimenting her figure. Ela pulled her new dagger from her waist and brandished it. Don't take another float! Now, it turns out that the ghost actually has some insight to where they might be able to find the heart. But in order to give that information, Oro had to make a deal with the ghost. Ela was a moment away from plunging the blade into Oro's side. You have one second to explain before I run from this place screaming and never speak to you again, she said through her teeth. He conveniently hadn't mentioned this on the walk over. His expression was bored. The specter's price for helping us is being allowed to walk in a body for a few moments. Her hand tightened on the knife's hilt. Why not yours? I offered, but she requested... something specific. The specter was suddenly at her side. The most beautiful girl on the island. That's what I requested. She reached out a silvery finger, making to touch Ela's cheek. And you're perfect! Now, this sounds more like an indirect compliment, as Oro brought what he believed was the most beautiful girl on the island. But the real point of the scene isn't just to get the hint from the ghost, which we'll get to in a minute. It's that this allows Ela an opportunity to make a demand of Oro. She wants to visit the Sun Isle Library alone. And as soon as he says, fine, something cold plunged into her chest. He had stabbed her. That was her first thought as her mind went dark and she drifted far, far away. She was suspended, weightless, a whisper in the night, free and bound, loose and tethered, dancing, falling. That's enough, Oro, she gasped, and then she's free. Ela gets possessed without permission given to the ghost. Very scant detail, but she did describe the sensation as feeling like she was drifting far away. Still, if agreement wasn't really part of the deal on her part, why did the ghost wait to possess Ela? It's almost like this was a speed bump moment that didn't actually cost anything. Ela walks away unharmed and presumably unfazed once the scene is done. This is confirmed. It never comes back to affect her later on. Why put this bargain in here at all if it doesn't cost anything? Unless this has a cause that we learn about later, like the ghost and Oro actually went on a date or something, then came back to the cave, it just comes across as a lazy waste of time. This ultimately led to a lazy way for Ela to get solo access to the Sun Isle Library. I love creative solutions, but this was weakly fit in, coupled with some weak solution that you could come up with in a matter of seconds like a throwaway gag. But then there's the matter of the ghosts portion of the deal. The Spectre sighed. She sat in an invisible chair. What you seek is not on Star Isle. Not this time. This time? Before Oro could leave, she said, A warning, King. The underbelly of the island is rising up. Darkness is at work. We feel it. You listening? Okay. Grass grows, birds fly, sun shines, and brother, the darkness is coming. You need to run. This isn't really useful because Oro wanted to know where the heart was, not where it wasn't. But at least they can cross Star Isle off their list of places to check. And as they're leaving, Ela demands to be taken to the Sun Isle Library. Might as well get that out of the way while they have the opportunity, right? But instead, Oro just keeps on walking because he said he would take her to the Sun Isle Library, but he didn't specify when. Now, this pisses off Ela, understandable. She was tricked after all. And Oro insists that, you know, this must be some part of her plan, win his heart by tormenting her. And Ela confirms that she has absolutely no interest in uh, Oro whatsoever. In fact, the moment pisses her off so much that she swears off the alliance with Oro and she just leaves, saying, I'm done with you with this plan. Oro says he'll take her to the library once they find the heart, but Ela swears that their deal is off, and you know what? She doesn't need his help getting into her, uh, onto his island, so she's just gonna go there herself. Now, this might seem like it would present a bit of difficulty, because now, uh, Ela doesn't have Oro's backing. She's gonna be on the Sun Isle by herself, and who knows? how much trouble she's going to have with the guards, even during the day. But that doesn't matter. The next morning, when she walks into the castle, she encounters a guard who says that they've been expecting her. I've been given orders to take you to the library. Ela was silent. That couldn't be right. It had taken her three days to find the nerve to venture into the Sunling land. The guard had been waiting right at the doors. There was no way he, or others, had been waiting for her to arrive. Before long, he stopped in front of an entrance. The king has ordered the library to be closed this week. You will be alone and are to have full access to any of the floors. I expect nothing. 
and I'm still let down. And in between there, we also get another moment where she's passing through and just observes that everything is gilded, just like walking through the star aisle, just listing things and not interacting with them. Now, she didn't really do anything to work at the solution. Basically, at best, you can argue she guilt-tripped Oro in the last scene. So this is another occasion where it feels like Aster is pushing the easy button for her protagonist. Honestly, the most difficult thing that Ila's done so far was fight a thorn bush. She begins searching around, spending however much time poking around, checking out titles, observing that the uh, books are covered in gold and gems, until she gets to a hall with a big hearth, uh, one big enough to swallow her whole. The flames inside crackled, almost like a beckoning. And that's when she figured out the pattern. The Skylings had their secret, uh, secret uh, vault hidden at the top of a tower. The Moonlings had one hidden engulfed in water. Perhaps Sunlings were hidden behind flames. Considering that she does in fact have experience at sticking her hand into fire, Ela puts on the skin gloves and reaches towards the flames. But before she could think better of it, Ela reached one glove toward the fire, knowing it could very well wilt to pieces. She braced herself for the pain and smell of double layers of flesh burning. It did not. The fire vanished immediately, and she stepped into the mouth of the hearth, pressed another hand against the stone wall behind it, and watched the brick fall away. So, of course, she hurries her way into the hidden section of the library, starts digging through every little item and enchanted whatever thing that she could find, and none of it resembles a giant needle. There are three days until the uh, 50th day when rulers are allowed to be killed for some reason, and there is no bond breaker to be found. Celeste insists that there must be another library somewhere, but so far this whole bond breaker thing has been an entirely fruitless effort. They have no evidence that this thing even existed. At best, they've got ancient texts, but how could that be enough to go on? Even if there was something like that you could confirm that way, it doesn't make any sense for that to still be in place. Why would no one else have used it? But Celeste insists that they keep looking for the bond breaker. It must be somewhere. An old book told me. And books never lie. And Ela thanks Oro for allowing her to walk through the uh, Sun Isle library. And they kind of make up. And so the Alliance is back on. And they've got to figure out where they're going to go to search for the Light Lark Heart next. But not before they deal with the 50th day celebration, the Betwixt Ball. Balls. So it is the midpoint of the centennial, the 50th day after which people will allow to, uh, rulers will be allowed to start killing each other. As part of the ceremony and pomp and show, I guess, of the centennial, which seems really unnecessary when you think about it for Again, half a second. Lightlark puts on the Betwixt Ball. Balls. It was the Lightlark event of the century. I figured the Centennial was the Lightlark event of the century. But what do I know? Because she doesn't know what to expect and thinks that she may be attacked, Ila hides all sorts of weapons all over her person and has chainmail stitched into her fabric, which makes her cape effectively a shield. The whole ceremony is a polite occasion Ela makes some presents, walks around, hobnobs with some of the other rulers a little bit. Eventually, Ela runs into Grimm, much to her hidden delight, and the two make off for deeper into the castle, where he decides to give her a gift. I'm thinking, he said darkly, thinking what? He reached for her and blinked. His entire expression changed. The hand he had reached toward her now reached inside his pocket that I have something for you. He pulled out a necklace. It had a dark chain holding a black diamond as large as a plum. Grimm explains that this is a summoning gem, and while he respects that Ela is more than capable of protecting herself, in the event that she does need help, all she needs to do is pull on the diamond and he would show up for her. Presumably this is something that's been passed down from his father, so all Ela has to do is pull on Grimm's family jewels and he'll come. And to make sure no one notices it or grows suspicious about a secret alliance between her and Grimm, Grimm turns the family jewel invisible. And then we get a hint of spice as Grimm tries seducing Ela a little bit. Grimm reached towards her again, all restraint gone, and trailed his knuckle down her cheek, the necklace, her collarbones, down the center of her chest. 
Heart eater, he said gently. You don't want to know what I am thinking, he finally answered. Her body tensed in anticipation, taut like an arrow a moment away from careening through the air. She wanted his hand lower, higher, everywhere. And instead, he drops his hand and they just walk back awkwardly to the ballroom where the rest of the rulers are hanging out. Balls. Celeste runs into Ela and uh, points out that there's half an hour until midnight when the killing can start. What should they do? Hide or fight? And Ela chooses to fight. A brave answer to be sure, but she doesn't really know what she's up against. And it's not the other rulers because the castle starts collapsing. Air shattered with high-pitched snaps of metal chains as the fiery chandeliers fell, taking most of the ceiling with them. The floor split into fractures, strikes of lightning across the marble, cracks of collapsing stone and hissing fire filled the world. Everything solid turned out to be delicate, crumbling like cake, breaking as easily as glass. As the castle collapsed, nothing and no one was safe. Ela only had time to reach an arm up in front of her eyes as a ring of fire fell right at her face. But before it broke her skull, Celeste was suddenly there. The starling raised her own arms, and it stopped midair. Chunks of wall are actually breaking. Uh, people are actually getting crushed and burned and killed. And it's then that Ela sees Oro uh, on his knees at the back of the room, his face twisted in pain and she realizes Light Lark was falling, just as the king had described. While the other rulers react in their own way, Ela runs to Oro's side and tries to get him to regain his strength, if only to stop the, uh, the castle from collapsing and killing everybody else. Ela took his shirt in two fistfuls and shoved him against the wall with all her strength, tearing his fingers from the floor. She screamed right into his face. You might be dying, but you're not dead yet, you miserable wretch. Now get up and do something before you allow your brother's sacrifice and everything we have all lost to be for nothing. And with this burst of inspiration, with another ruler by his side, Oro collapses back on the floor and people keep dying. Screams and calls for help and final breaths became a symphony that overtook the violins and harps that lay in splinters in the corner of the room, along with most of the orchestra. I just had to point out the particular line because it's it's really stupid so much dumb so little time I wouldn't think of panic screaming as a symphony in normal context because you're mixing something horrible with something wonderful final breaths are usually quiet I would hope the screams would overtake the violins because no one should be playing as the castle is crumbling to the ground all around everyone like the way it sounds like it's described the way that the screams overtook the violins and harps it like is anyone still playing why else would we need detail of the screams overtaking the violins and harps? This isn't like the band playing as the Titanic sank. Gentlemen, it has been a privilege playing with you tonight. Eventually, Celeste finds Oro and Ela, and uh, they all rush out of the room. And Ela realizes that with Oro dying and with light lark crumbling because it's not just the castle like the the island slowly starts to uh splinter a little bit it's not just that this centennial is another chance at breaking the curses it might be their last chance but as the broken room doors managed to slam close and the screams were swallowed up Ela wondered if the island would even last the rest of the hundred days and we are only a little bit halfway through the book that was chapter 33 we're on page 251 of about 410. Immediately in the aftermath of the palace collapsing we're told that the mainland became a place only for specters and rulers and while it's true that there are fewer people on the mainland this is a statement that doesn't really amount to anything because we'll never see it manifest anything. In fact, we'll actually see it contradicted later. But Ila and Oro have to hurry through and find some more ancient creatures in order to get some, some real answers for where the heart is. And while they're walking, they start talking about who created the heart in the first place. And Oro is quick to admit that Horus Ray, his ancestor, was uh, involved and is has to be prodded in order to admit that Colin Malvair, the Nightshade ancestor, was also involved. Ila admits that Grimm was the one who told her about Malvair and that he's so much more forthcoming than the other rulers. Keep that in mind for later and the fact that Oro had a uh, an opportunity to say something here as well. Ila takes point in searching 
until she feels the unmistakable burn of rope against her wrists and gets pulled along until I guess she winds up in a cave. And that's when we meet the new batch of ancient creatures. They had long, transparent wings that hung limp at their sides. Their skin was light blue, like someone had stuck a paintbrush in the air to get the color. Their eyes were too large, limbs too long. Now, these creatures are never named until much later in the book, when they're given a name in passing, in a way that honestly feels like a mistake. The way this was described originally, my first thought was Janos Aldrin. It is heartening after all these years to hear my name spoken without contempt. But it's just as likely that the inspiration for these things were an angelic form of the Navi. <laughs> these guys are a little less understanding than the ghost girl, who was actually never given a name. The presumable leader of the Janos Aldrin cosplayers here summons a blade and actually threatens Oro with it, sending a droplet of his blood spilling down his neck. No hint of fire, of course. The leader angel guy actually slices across Oro's throat. It doesn't specify precisely how bad or what was really damaged. I'm guessing he punctured the jugular. And this is contradictory because, as has been established, if Oro dies, then the conduit that the magic through the heart creates dies, and the island will collapse. The fact that Oro is dying and the castle has already suffered an earthquake is kind of proof of that. So the question comes down to why would these blue guys try to put Oro's life uh, in danger? Are they just trying to rip the band-aid off and just get it over with? Or do they have some other way to survive that we don't know about? These questions, of course, will never be explained. But in exchange for Ela agreeing to visit the blue guys once this is all over, that was easy. The leader is willing to offer a hint on where to find the heart, because he doesn't know where it is currently, but... It seems to always choose a place where darkness meets light. That impressively vague statement is something that will carry through for most of the rest of the book. It doesn't... I'm getting ahead of myself. It's stupid. Let's just leave it at that for now. I'll grant at least it works with the whole darkness and light angle that the island's creation apparently blends with, but just keep it in mind. But as they're leaving, Oro actually collapses. You see, the uh, the neck injury is actually a lot worse than Ela had originally assumed. A neck wounds are generally pretty serious. So she's not actually able to do anything, because again, no powers and she doesn't have any of that stupid wildling healing cream on her. Fortunately, because Oro was ridiculously overpowered, he has water bending healing ability. So all he has to do is get near some water and he'll be able to heal himself. So Ela eventually drags him to a river and just pushes him in. And that seems to work because, you know, very slowly, the uh, skin knitted together, but that presents a new problem. They're out in the open, and if they don't move, Oro is going to be exposed to the sunlight when dawn comes, and he's going to burst into flames and die horribly. But Aster is a very generous author and offers a boon in the form of a serendipitous cave not 20 feet away. So Ela gathers all of her strength and just pulls Oro into it, and then we get an entire chapter of just them chatting in a cave. Granted, that could be an interesting idea, and it could reveal a lot of character. And if I'm being fair, Aster does at least utilize some of the dialogue to unveil some information between the two of them, mostly through like 20 questions. The execution's a bit sloppy, but at least the intent is there. But that doesn't mean that all the lines work. She gave him a look. I'm not as weak as you think I am. He didn't return the glare. I've never thought you were weak. She blinked. He couldn't mean that. Well, now we're even, I suppose. That day on the balcony seemed realms away. Why is Aster using an assumed physical measurement to measure time? It's like when someone uses a light year to measure time. When Oro wakes up, he and Ela start talking about what the plan is now, because now they've got this incredibly vague hint, and it 
works even less when you consider my previous rant about how Astra utilizes uh, literal and figurative prose. Like, if you're reading this book and you've caught on to that tick in her writing, the question then comes down to, okay, it's in a place where darkness meets light. Metaphorically or literally? Because if it's metaphorically, God only knows how many places that could actually apply to. If we're talking literally, we're talking potentially every square inch of the mainland and all of the side aisles because sunrise meets darkness when the light just casts over the land. And unfortunately, it's not really explained or explored because while we do get to see some... I'm getting ahead of myself. It's just, this book is so frustrating because it is so easy to slip from rant to rant to rant without actually explaining anything beforehand. It's... it's, it's we get to see some of the places that they'll explore. If any of you can explain to me the whole darkness meets light thing in those moments, I'd appreciate it, because I don't get it. Fortunately, Oro's already ahead of the game, because even though he just woke up, and he just got the information about darkness meets light, Oro was being unusually forthcoming. She needed to get every detail out of him that she could. How many total places are left, then, where darkness means light? Eight. He has somehow, despite a, an impressively vague clue, able to narrow his search down to eight physical locations that they need to search. I get that he's been at this for a while and that he's been considering everything about the heart and has been searching, possibly even re uh, researching through old texts for... 50 years now, I believe he said it was. How can he still be so confident that there are only eight places to search and he's barely even thought about it? This feels more like you just got to establish this now because it would be too difficult to include a scene where they go to a library and start researching ancient texts. That's just lazy writing. We're not talking about a quantifiable thing like the number of museums in a city. This is an abstract concept with undefined parameters. Ela continues questioning Oro and comes up with the idea that, uh, according to the Oracle's prophecy, the original offense must be committed again in order to break the curses. And she asks if Oro thinks that the original offense was wielding the height of Light Lark somehow in the first place and using its power. And Oro nods. And that explains why he brought uh, Invited Grimm to uh, the Centennial for the first time in however long, which, when you consider the actual prophecy, should have been the obvious thing to do in the first place, because it's all about everyone coming together. And even though he didn't know about the whole darkness and light, whatever their ancestors' names were, uh, creating the heart in the first place, because he only knew about the heart 50 years ago, he still knew about the creation of the island in the first place, so that should have been some consideration, or at least should have been worth considering. It is impressive how overcomplicated this book is. There is so much exposition that's just thrown out there. While I can appreciate a, a good, healthy, detailed story, this is too much. You've got so many things and so many parts to consider that branch off into so many different tendrils. I, it's just, it becomes too much for Aster to actually properly hold up. What were the blue guys, for example? But the sun comes up, and while they are safe in the cave, it can't actually reach that uh, far in for how deep they are, uh, it does mean that Aura was stuck there for the rest of the day. And rather than allow the man to rest, considering that he almost died, and he normally sleeps during the day, Ela suggests that they play a game so that they, they can pass the time a little faster. You know, it's not like he just suffered a near-fatal neck wound. Hey there, Mr. Terminal Eel Man, you want to play 20 questions? But at least the game that Ela suggests is low effort is just asking questions back and forth. Not much of a game, really, but whatever. She decides to start it off by asking if he ever tires of wearing gold. And apparently he does. Okay. I'm reminded of a scene in Midnight Sun when uh, Bella and Ed just start asking questions back and forth. And while we do get more lists of things that Bella is interested in, it's not the lists that make character. It's not the lists 
of things like favorite colors, favorite bands, favorite songs, whatever, that make a character interesting. It's the why they like those things that makes this interesting. So a lot of this chapter is not entirely useless. Some pertinent information is provided, but the whole, uh, do you tire of wearing gold? And he just says, yes, though I can wear blue, white, or silver if I choose. That doesn't really tell you much. He doesn't go into the why. And that's a missed opportunity. That's something that you should always consider when you're trying to explore a character's deeper motivations or ideas. And because this is a story with a love triangle, naturally, the conversation eventually stems to romance. And I've got a theory on this. Oro says that he's never been in love because it makes uh, kings of Lightlark vulnerable. Our power becomes unprotected. And he, suppose, he supposes that Ela has that in common, being a wildling, and love being a horrible, deadly thing for wildlings. So consider everything that we've seen of both Oro and Grimm. Oro is the prim and proper, kind of off-putting sort of a guy that Ela can't seem to stop herself from being around. At the same time, Grimm can't stop being around Ela, and Ela can't in turn resist staying with him whenever he's available. There is a definite amount of desire, more physical desire, on Ela's part around Grimm, and much more of, as we're seeing in, you know, this game of 20 questions, more of an intellectual, intimate uh, nature and relationship that she has with Oro. In this way, I theorize that Grimm represents a carnal desire, where Oro is a, a deeper, more soundful romantic interest. Or as South Park put it, Saddam, you're an asshole, and you'll never be the friend that I want. And Chris, well, you're a pussy, and you'll never be the lover I want. You know, I'm not a fan of love triangles because they're almost never done well, but even when they are done, at least the authors usually give their characters personalities. Sarah J. Mass did a love triangle better in Throne of Glass because the men the protagonist was chatting with had their own good qualities. One was strong and protective, and the other was kind and rich. There's reason for simultaneous attraction, but Astra has been pretty heavy-handed on either Grimm or Oro one at a time. These two aren't competing against each other so much as taking turns. The love triangle in this book is like reading about some torrid affair between paperweights. And Oro states that his brother Egan loved Aurora, the woman that he was um, set to marry, but not in that way. Falling in love meant sharing uh, access to one's powers with her beloved, it was what made uh, rulers falling in love so dangerous. And again, I'm just, I'm so annoyed at how little this actually works, even in context. It's an element of the world building of the magic system that seems to exist only for the sake of the plot. Magic systems should feel like they exist within, you know, their own spectrum, realm, dimension, however you want to describe that. It should be an independent factor that blends with the world building. It shouldn't be this arbitrary thing where it just happens that way because it just happens that way. It's like if I came up with a magic system with rules that made no sense, had no coherency behind them, and was like, you can only use your powers on Tuesdays, but if you summon fireballs, you'll become lactose intolerant. And if you become invisible, you'll become allergic to bees. Where's the blend? Where does it make sense there? You know, ironically, you could actually make it work if you could only use lightning on Thursdays, but that's because of the Nordic references that, because, you know, Thursday was Thor's day. Etymology's weird. More questions go on, and eventually, Ela works up the courage to ask Oro about the bond breaker directly, asking, is there a relic on the island that can break any bond that can break the curses of the ones that wield it? She studied his face desperately, looking for any sign of recognition, any hint of surprise. The king's eyebrows did come together, but more than anything, Oro looked confused. No, he said firmly. If there was, I would have found a way to use it. Da, 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 da. She believed him. It was a foolish thing to do, but she did, which meant the bond breaker either never existed or was destroyed before the king had learned about it. Is that what you were searching for? He asked. He, had knew, uh, he knew she had been looking for something in the Sun Isle library and that she hadn't found it. 
No use in hiding it now, she nodded. And then it just... That makes it her turn again, so she asks a question, and then the whole thing moves on without any real resolution. And Oro has previously confirmed that he does not lie. And with this in mind, it kind of cements the suspicion I've had from the beginning. The idea of the Bond Breaker was a stupid red herring since page one, or whenever it was introduced. So they wait out the day, eventually they're able to both escape from the cave, and then the search begins for all these eight different places where darkness meets light. And even though Oro specifically stated that he wanted to explore Moon Isle last, because if Cleo found out what they were doing, she would probably try to intercept the heart and use it for her own purposes, because she's horrible like that, they actually start looking at Moon Isle first, which makes me think that this just feels like a really lazy way to rewrite what Aster previously wrote without going back and editing it. Oro and Ela fly to Moon Isle. When they land, there's a large blue bird, like the ocean made into wings, that landed on her shoulder and then screeched into her ear. This will be, believe it or not, important for later. But it turns out that they're not going to a place where darkness meets light, not yet. They're actually going to check on the oracles. Yes, they're not some long dead group of people that gave a prophecy and then croaked. They're actually still alive, but the way this is described sounds logistically impossible. They fly to what looks like a large glacier when Ela notices something strange just beneath the surface. Three women were trapped within the ice. The oracles, he said, hands falling from her shoulders. She blinked too many times. I thought there was one. Only one has thawed in the last thousand years. Why are they here? Aura stepped to her side. A king far before me trapped them in ice so they would never leave or die. Three women born with the gift of prophecy. Enraged at being imprisoned, two of them joined forces with Nightshade, calling to the dark part of the island. When Night Isle was destroyed, they froze forever. So this is a place where darkness meets light. Oro nodded as he placed a hand against the ice. It immediately began to thaw. So you've had these oracles around who probably could have filled in some information about the prophecy that they told beforehand, or any number, uh, any amount of information. But it also kind of confirmed that the whole darkness meeting light thing is not literal, because they're in the middle of night at a glacier. I mean, where is the literal or physical embodiment of darkness and light in this moment? It's got to be metaphorical, right? But at the same time, like, how does this work? One thawed in the last thousand years? What happened to that one? And was this one, like, part of the three that are within the ice now? Did they just happen to be all together when Night Isle was destroyed? And how were they frozen? Was it, like, was it something that they were sentenced to? Or did it, like, as soon as the the night isle disappeared they were imbued the, they they were they were trapped in a block of ice again aster's use of the literal and the figurative becomes so difficult to parse what she's actually trying to say and again if these three have the gift of prophecy why didn't oro go to them before a question that is not asked also if the oracles were imprisoned why was the one thawed or did she thaw naturally? Was she taken out? If Oro can thaw them right now, why doesn't he leave them thawed? Because they eventually go back to being frozen in the ice by the end of the chapter. Like, is this part of their own curse that they have to live with? But anyway, the one oracle that does wake up has some information, but has been warned not to help Ela and Oro. But she does, because this is just too curious. A sunling and a wildling side by side. And somehow, Ela was able to confirm that this was the same woman who spoke the prophecy of the curses previously. And Oro demands who warned the oracle not to say anything, to which the oracle says, that I cannot say, because if she did, it would ruin the big reveal later on. But considering the only other person on the island who would be able to thaw ice, aside from any number of moonlings, I suppose, is Cleo, the safe conclusion is that Cleo 
warned the Oracle not to say anything. Ulro demands to know where the Heart of Lightlark is, and the Oracle says it is near, nearer than you know. And my suspicion at the time was that it was actually going to be Ela's heart somehow, which would also tie in with how her powers don't manifest, but whatever. That turned out to be wrong. That one's on me. But the Oracle does confirm that the heart is somewhere on Moon Isle. And Oro confirms that there are only three places on Moon Isle that qualify for this nonsense darkness meets light thing. So this is fantastic. They've narrowed down the places they needed to look from eight down to, well, I guess if the oracles count, it was four, but now it's three after this. The oracle does eventually freeze back over, uh, reinforcing the idea that one of the six rulers will be dead before the hundred days are over, uh, which is in line with the prophecy. But she also says, know this, the oracle said, there are lies and liars all around you, Ela Crown. And then she freezes over in the glacier, and then Ela bangs on it with knuckles that immediately spot it with blood, and her blood doesn't do the thing, and Oro doesn't ask, why isn't your blood doing the thing? I'm sorry I keep bringing that up. It's just such a consistent problem. Or maybe... The oracles are part of the three places. I honestly don't know. It is not clear. I can't recall how many places they actually visit. But because it's almost sunrise, they can't search anything now, so the chapter closes with them concluding their search and going back to the mainland. There's a lengthy rant that I've actually got in my notes for this next part here, because when they get back to, or when she gets back to her room, Ela is standing there with her star stick and she's reflecting on who she has become in the 50... I'm gonna say 55 days of the centennial so far, whatever how long it's been. And she talks about how much she has changed as a person. Now, so much had changed. She wasn't the same person who had arrived on the island two months prior. Before, she had never even spoken to a man unsupervised for more than a few minutes. Now, one had touched her up and down her body. Before, she thought she would cower before the rulers. Now, she had beaten them in trials, threatened them. She had even saved the king. Before, she believed it was wrong to want anything other than to break her and her realm's curses. Now, she wanted everything. And I've talked before about how stories are fundamentally about change. Either, you know, this thing alters from this event to this one, or how a character goes through this thing, and then how they become better as a person, or whatever. And while it's true that Ela is not the same person that she was at the very start of the book, there are some issues with what she's describing. She had never spoken to a man unsupervised for long before, and now she let Grimm and Oro touch her. We never saw her not speak to men before, so this isn't really a fair comparison. Besides, she didn't really change anything meaningful. She just allowed herself to feel the feelings that she'd always had and didn't resist them this time. That's not change at all, especially since she didn't take any action or alter her perception. She thought she would cower before the other rulers, but instead she beat them in demonstrations, threatened them, and saved the king. Again, this is something we haven't seen evidence of before. While she was a little meek at the start, she also put up a front so she never once cowered before the others. Hell, she stood up to Cleo and mocked her to her face for on their second meeting, on the first day of the centennial. Not much of a change there, and saving the king isn't something that really took courage, especially since she was in panic mode when that happened. The one about wanting everything instead of just wanting to break her realm's curses is something that I'll grant because that's the uh, one thing that's even remotely true. She was very concerned about her realm and saving her people from before the curse and through the course of her journey discover the joy in experiencing more in life. This does work, but one out of the three examples listed doesn't depict the same pattern of growth. And there are a multitude of ways that you can actually try to explore or display that sort of growth. One that I'm rather partial to myself is having the protagonist commit some sort of a mistake and then work to redeem themselves from that mistake. I'm actually going through the Tales of Symphonia remaster, buggy as it is, and one thing that I had forgotten that I really do appreciate is very early in the game, the starting village gets destroyed and the protagonist, Lloyd, uh, is largely at fault for it and this is something that burdens him for quite a while, and he does what he can to try to make amends. Mostly through helping the Chosen of Regeneration try to complete her journey because he's been exiled uh, from the village, so he can't just, like, help 
build a barn or whatever. But then we get a description of how the star stick works and boy oh boy, does this not fit with how anything else works. She drew her puddle of stars, almost hoping that her old self would click back into place at the sight of her realm and people. The edges quivered, alive, spilled ink and diamonds. The stars faded into different colors, the hues sputtering and forming quickly before her eyes. They scattered until she was looking at Wildling. Blood drained from her face. Her heart became all she could hear, beating unsteadily in her chest. It was gone. The forests had been razed. The Wildling Palace was nearly destroyed. Villages were empty. And she scans a little bit more until she finds one person whose tan skin had hardened, turned into sheets of bark. Strands of her hair had become vines. One hand was already roots in the ground. It was Terra. So she's not dead yet, but she's getting close. She is dying. I feel happy. I feel happy. <laughs> Mm, so many problems with how this is, is designed. So the star stick makes a star-filled puddle on the ground that I'm assuming functions like a portal. Interesting idea, but it doesn't mesh with the image we've been given thus far where it sounds like she was traveling down a tunnel. I always assumed she flew through it, guided by the star stick, kind of like how Thor would fly with uh, Mjolnir. I, I used to spin it really fast and it, it, would, it would pull me off the- Oh my. God, him I pulled you off. Stuff like this is important to describe early. Also, Ely uses the star stick to scry on her old home, so the star stick is multi-purposed. If that's the case, then why hasn't she been using it to spy on others this entire time? That would have been amazingly useful, especially considering that Ela doesn't trust Cleo at all, and Cleo's got that whole Legion secret army thing going on, right? I will grant that she apparently needed a bee somewhere before she can portal to it, although that doesn't work because how does she teleport to the other continents, but whatever for now. That does explain why she can't just pop a portal open inside of one of the libraries and gaze around to try to find the hidden section or the bond breaker. But this is creating an OP device and not thinking about how this affects other aspects of the story, just like the magic blood from the start. Fortunately, Poppy is still alive and is walking around applying elixirs, hopefully to delay the transition into mulch. And Poppy assures her, we still have time. Our little bird is still fighting for us. It doesn't make any sense that people I've never met call me Sparrow when I've never resembled a bird or drunken pirate captain of any kind. Now, seeing the devastation of the Wildling Newlands gives Ela a new resolution, considering that uh, in order to actually restore the people that are still alive and try to bring back life to the, the dying forests and the dying earth, uh, she would need immeasurable power, something that the Heart of Lightlark is supposed to permit. She now thinks that she actually has to win the Centennial, where beforehand she was only worried about breaking the curse. This gives her a new mission, and that's fine. It's perhaps a bit abrupt, considering how suddenly this scene was introduced, but whatever, I will take it. Unfortunately, witnessing the devastation of her homeland has left Ela a little fragile, so she needs to confide in someone, and she asks Oro if she can trust him. At which point, through a lot of, I think, unnecessary prose, eventually she reveals to Oro that she was born powerless. That was fucking stupid. And Oro is actually speechless at this, and Ela just turns and leaves. Simple as that. Now, we're finally on chapter 38, and while you can argue that there have been some twists up to this point, this is where the big ones really start. So place your bets on what could happen for the remaining 130-ish pages. It is day 60 of the centennial, and Oro has decided to convene a meeting with the other rulers in order to give a progress report. Like, anyone can try to jump in with any kind of update that they've had. But because that would require actually filling in stories for the other rulers, Oro just goes first and admits that he and Ela have been looking for the height of light, uh, for the heart of Lightmark. Ugh. Now, Azul actually comes out with a bit of common sense and says, okay, if you're so sure that this is a real thing, then shouldn't we all search for the relic? And Oro says, no, we cannot take the risk of focusing our efforts on one avenue, should we be incorrect. Which of course begs the question, what are the others doing in order to break the curses? If the author is going to introduce the idea of there being other avenues, then naturally your more inquisitive readers are going to ask, okay, what are those avenues? 
because the other rulers up to this point, ever since the teams were assigned, they could have just like literally been sitting around with their thumbs up their asses and functionally it wouldn't have changed a damn thing. While there's some wisdom in not putting all their eggs in one basket, not sharing this info earlier meant that Oro and Ela had to sneak around lots of places in order to learn anything, like when they snuck onto Moon Isle with the Oracles. If the rulers were smarter, they would have taken the di uh, diplomatic route and tried to work together to share info. If they can't trust each other as far as someone betraying everyone else for power, then why are they here in the first place in this pseudo-cooperative effort at all? Theirs is a veil of cooperation while everyone remains separate, so this plot point is, uh, is the story trying to have its cake and eat it too. And Aster sort of worked her way out of this problem with the heart being rumored to imbue the uh, winning ruler with unimaginable power, and that's fine. There is still a cooperative edge that you can play around with, but at the same time, if they don't actually solve the curses, everyone's going to die and the magic is going to vanish forever. So there has to be some degree of cooperation regardless. But that's not all that happens during the meeting because Oro suggests that they change teams because maybe if they mix it up a little bit, they'll have a greater chance of success. And he wants to work with Cleo so that they can explore the Moon Isle and look for the relic together. And Ela takes this personally, because she realized that Celeste was right, and Oro had just been using her up until the point where she had become useless. And now that she's revealed that she doesn't have powers, Oro doesn't want to bother using her. And then it gets worse. Are you really sure, King? Cleo said, staring at Ela with pursed lips. I have to admit, I'm suspicious. This isn't just a strategy between you and the Wildling, is it? A sprig of hope grew in Ela's chest. They had worked together for weeks. She had saved his life. Then he saved hers. Maybe he wasn't betraying her. Maybe this was a strategy. Oro's smile was, a, was pure mirth. I'll let you in on a secret that might explain my decision. He said loudly for all to hear. He turned to look straight at her. Ela Crown doesn't have the powers. The world froze, then shattered. And Ela remembers the Oracle's words about lies and liars being all around her. She tries to run, but Grimm grabs her by the hand and they vanish just like that. So the question arises, how is Ela ever going to trust Oro again? Will it ever get to that point? What is this, uh, what effect will this moment have on their relationship going forward? Well, there'll be time to worry about that later because right now she's trying to get her bearings straight when she realizes that Grimm didn't just like turn invisible and lead her out of the castle, he actually teleported her to the other side of the mainland. And that's when he confesses that this was actually his flare, which is a series of abilities that the rulers have that is actually sorely underutilized. And Grimm reveals that he actually knew that Ela didn't have any powers beforehand. Nightshades, our powers include curses. I can sense all the others. I knew from the first time I saw you that you weren't bound to them. She remembered how he had saved her from eating the rest of the heart, demanding it be taken to her room during the first dinner. He had known then. He had known the entire time. And this is a good little reveal because it actually gives a substantive reason for Ela and Grimm to get a little closer together because now he is actually on her side and considering that he hasn't really done anything threatening or betraying like what Oro just did. So Team Grimm just got a, a massive win for their side. Grimm even gives her a new nickname and stops calling her Heart Eater and starts calling her Heart. Ela says that if she's worried about the others, you know, they're gonna try to kill her for not having powers. So, you know, considering that one ruler has to die, that is not an unreasonable claim. And he promises that if she yanks on the pendant that um, he gave her, he'll show up. You know, very much in a this sort of emotion. So as long as she pulls on his jewels like this, he'll show up. <laughs> and there goes my monetization. Now, this is a pretty substantial twist because now she can't interact with the other rulers, Celeste and Grimm notwithstanding, and she can't search for the heart. She can't, like, she can barely do anything but survive. 
The only place you can really go is the Place of Mirrors, because while it is very obvious of a hiding location, if Juniper is correct, then it's the only place where other rulers won't be able to use their powers, but she'll still have her abilities and her uh, daggers and uh, all her weapons. Now this of course assumes that the rulers don't really have much mu uh, martial prowess themselves, and it ignores the fact that many of them have at least some degree of a guard force or army, in Cleo's case, and doesn't matter how good you are, after a while you will get tired and you will be overwhelmed, so numbers are still a thing, but whatever. There is the matter of supplies. Hila is still going to need food and water, and because everything on Wild Isle is dead, she's going to need a way to get into town and get them, or have someone bring them to her. Will Grimm be able to teleport food or visit her almost every day with supplies? That's one solution but it's not the one Aster goes for. Ella risked grave danger in the deadly forest, venturing to Wild Isle to bring her whatever she needed. Food, water. One of the last times she had stopped in, Ella had handed her most of the gems she had brought to Lightlark, a sack full of diamonds and precious stones. Hire a healer, she had said. And Ella returns every day, uh, as does Celeste. And it would be very, very easy to follow Ella from the mainland to Wild Isle while she's carrying presumably a sack of supplies for no other apparent reason. So if, if any of the other rulers actually wanted to find and kill Ella, it wouldn't be a challenge. I also have to question where Ella got the gems, not because it's not like she didn't have them beforehand, but when she fled, she didn't have time to go back to her room and grab them, and then leave, she just teleported instantly. What Aster should have done is said that Ella gave Ella permission to take the jewels that were in her room. But I guess that wouldn't have sounded as generous. During one of the visits, Celeste says she's still convinced the Bond Breaker was an option, even though Oro and Common Sense dictate that it shouldn't exist. Now, I hope you guys are paying attention. As a reminder, Aster stated that no one was able to guess all the twists in her book, and I want you to try to figure out what the reason for that is, because I've got my own solution that I'll reveal much later in the video. And there's nothing wrong with being wrong. Now, we get a stylistic choice with chapter 41, letter, because while we do have some designs in the corners of the pages, once chapter 41 comes around, all of a sudden, the pages look like they've been burnt. And I like the design. Artistically, I think they did a pretty good job with the shading and some of the little spots that you've got scattered, uh, scattered throughout. The question that I have is, why is this a thing? I can't really think of any reason why this would be the case, especially because by the very next page, the effect is done. Like, if I were being generous with my interpretation, it almost seems like the pages are burnt to represent Ela being at a very low spot in her life. She's got this very dour mood at the start of the chapter, uh, with even Celeste saying, you've sulked enough. But she's been in bad moods before. She's been really low on other occasions, and we haven't had this effect. And things will continue to be difficult for Ela. Appropriate, it should be. But, I, like, in terms of visual choices, I don't know why these pages are like this, and it kind of bothers me. But Celeste is able to eventually get Ela out of her bad mood. They have exactly what they had when they started the Centennial, each other. And that's just enough for them to work together to, to still somehow come out on top. You know, sisterhood, hurrah, and all that stuff. Except there's one other person who has proven useful time and time again that they might be able to rely on. And it's very accurate because she's talking about Juniper, and I do believe that he has helped her twice. Time and time again, it is in fact an accurate description. So Ela writes a letter to Juniper saying, details of my greatest secret in exchange for yours, even though at this point it's entirely possible that her not having powers is well known throughout the mainland. You know, some sort of a massive scandal like that would be quite popular among the nobles. 
But whatever, she writes a letter, gives it to Ella to deliver to Juniper. Now, Grimm made his attempts to visit Ella to help comfort her and get her through this hard time, and he brings her chocolate from the market, which is interesting because it's the one from the Agora that supposedly closed when the island started to crumble, and we're told that only specters and rulers were left. And chocolatiers, I suppose Aster forgot that part. And she's been having an increase of the sexy time dreams with Grimm, so much so that it's actually starting to become a little suspicious because they're very, very detailed in just the right way. Wink. And this makes Ela suspicious. Heart eater? She blinked. He grinned, so wickedly that Ela scoffed. Her eyes narrowed into a glare. Did you, did you send me that dream? She asked, voiced very tight. Nightshades had that ability. With her own eyes, she had seen him create illusions during the demonstration. Have you been sending me all of them? Feels like I'm wearing nothing at all. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. <laughs> Stupid sexy Flanders. And he confesses he doesn't know what she's talking about. What dream? Although he would be very interested to hear more about this dream, at which point she just leaves. Also, how is Grimm sending her dreams when she's in the place of mirrors where his powers wouldn't be able to work? Now, you might be thinking that this is creepy and manipulative of Grimm to do. I will just let you know now, he's not actually doing it. This is, this is an assumption that Ela's making, and she just happens to be wrong. So all you Ela Grimm shippers can be happy or something. Now, it's been a little more than a week by this point when Ela decides to leave the place of mirrors because she hasn't gotten a reply from Juniper in quite some time. It's actually starting to get a little worrisome. Maybe he's not going to help her. Maybe this is all part of a trap. She walks out expecting to see uh, Cleo's legion or uh, Oro's guards there waiting to kill her, which is weird because she's leaving in the morning and if Oro's guards were there, they would die. Sunlight and all. Nice job proofreading, Aster. Oh, and apparently Celeste is there, but she's not there when the scene starts, so it's like, where did you come from? It's a funny name, Critter. Some fellas gave me that name when I was in the school. I'm back. Yeah, you know, it's between <laughs> Indian and Tibet. I helped the uh, natives her Yeah, you're kidding. Anybody notice that I'm here now? Critter. Well, they've got to go find Juniper wherever he is. Hopefully he's still somewhere at his pub but she finds something else instead. Ela raced to the bar and peered over it, only to gasp. A scream scraped the back of her throat. There was a message, scrawled in blood. No, not just a message, a response. She remembered the words she and Celeste had painted after the attempt on her life at the harbor. Try harder. Written across the wooden cabinets that housed shelves of bubbling drink were the words, hard enough. And below the words, Juniper was dead. Reverb. For the next three days after Juniper's death, Ela returns back to Wild Isle, where she really doesn't have any clues or any leads for what to do next. So what she does is she just goes running around the island, exploring it, checking a few, a few new things out, because running was one of the only activities that cleared her head uh, as of late. And she realizes that there wouldn't have been a need to kill Juniper if Cleo and Oro had already found the heart. It does immediately raise the question of where are Ella's loyalties, so it's you're, you've got the logistical question of how she's going to get food and water now, but whatever. That's a problem the story doesn't concern itself with, and I've got plenty of other notes to talk about until the end. Especially because Lightlark is still disappearing. The island was a pastry, crumbling into the sea day by day. Ella then recounts her mother's backstory about how she died and her father turned the knife on himself because the wildling curse demanded its blood information we already know, so it's like, why are you bringing this up again? And again, I have to wonder how the curse actually manifests, because Ila's father immediately succumbed and murdered her mother. So it's like, for men, must kill! But for women, it's like, damn it, I really like him. I guess I'll stab him in the head and get it over with. Women fall in love, we're like, I love you. Fucking again, you dumb bitch. 
You were supposed to love you first. You keep skipping that part. Now, during one of her runs, Ela actually goes from the place of mirrors onto the mainland. Very ill-advised. Uh, she goes at dark, where Oro would have the best chance at killing her if he wanted to. So, really, really ill-advised. Ela's actually kind of an idiot, but as she's wandering, Ela sees Cleo in the distance and decides to start following her, because Cleo's at the center of all of her suspicions. Cleo was the one who has been uh, antagonizing her since day one. Cleo was probably the one who screwed with the oracles and forced them not to say anything. Cleo's the one who is now working with Oro, who betrayed Ela. So she might as well try to get some intel out of her, right? Well, especially considering that the uh, 75th day had Carmel, the 24-hour long celebration, and uh, attendance was mandatory. This is what I was talking about earlier when I said that there are these arbitrary moments along the centennial calendar that exist purely for the sake of the plot and not because of any sensical world building. Carmel is a celebration where all rulers will need to attend because it's mandatory and if Ela doesn't show up it'll look like she's forfeiting. It's weird that the magic would work that way, and if it's not the magic, it's the people just making arbitrary rules? Why Why would the heart care if she didn't attend this thing? Why is that important to the heart? So Ela's in hiding for fear of her life, but she's going to attend some weird party we've never heard of before, while the island is literally collapsing because if she doesn't, she'll lose some vaguely defined competition. It feels like this plot point was introduced just to get Ela back around the other rulers, as if the story was being written piecemeal by the seat of Aster's pants instead of being planned out like so, uh, this kind of world building would often require. Why even play around with the pretense of the competition when it doesn't make much sense with the recent developments, not that it ever made sense, because things are so desperate now that reason and logic would likely be thrown, uh, thrown away in favor of instinct and survival. So Cleo's basking in the moonlight, uh, which is fun for her because unlike sunlings or nightshades, Moonlings could still access their power source, with which makes me wonder what restriction does Nightshade have? Can they not go outside at night? Because that's what it sounds like. It's one of those things that could have been explained in a passing line, but if so, it wasn't done well because I can't recall that ever happening. If your world and your magic system have too many rules, your audience is going to forget stuff, and it's going to be that harder for them to connect to things. Keep it simple, stupid! But as she follows Cleo, Ela realizes that Cleo must have been the original one to spin the curses. She's old enough, she's got nefarious motives, she's working behind everyone else's backs. Uh, it would make sense that she had Juniper killed in order to silence him. It all fits together so very well. Besides, Moonlings have the dumbest curse, one which is remarkably easy to survive, unlike the Starlings, the Sunlings, the... I don't know what the Skylings do, or the Nightshades, actually. This is this book is not complete. Cleo leads the way back to Moon Isle, and uh, Ela is following not far behind with the intent of killing her, just the way Cleo killed Juniper. But before Ela actually had an opportunity, there was a loud shriek in the air, and that bird from before comes flying in and distracts Ela just long enough for uh, Cleo to, I guess, throw like a sheet of water smacking Ela against a frost-coated mountain, and uh, the water freezes in ice because of Cleo's powers. Aha! Uh -huh. Attacking an opponent roughly four times your strength in a one-on-one -on -one battle! A cunning strategy! Ela tries to fight back, but she can't get out of the ice. It's too strong for her, which is good. She needs some moments of weakness. And she accuses of Cleo of doing all sorts of terrible things, of murdering Juniper, of starting the curses. And Ela thinks about reaching for the family jewels that Grimm gave her, but her hands are frozen, so she can't actually do that. Good move. An actual, genuine problem that she can't just badass her way out of. I like this moment. And we also get this random aside about how once a ruler had children, they began to age more properly, but how does proper aging really equate in a world like this? Because Cleo's over 500 years old, and she apparently looks like she's, you know, still very youthful. What kind of comparison are they using for this? Is, like, is this immortality thing just for everyone else? Because that doesn't make sense, because there was the Elders at the beginning of the book that had been around since uh, Lightlark's creation, or the creation of the Curses, rather. It's just one of those things where the author is talking directly to you, the reader, 
uh, kind of unintentionally breaking the fourth wall and it doesn't work when you stop to think about it. Although as much as I like that scene, we can't have it last too long. Ila can't stay in the ice for like the next hundred pages. You can't keep your protagonist out of the story for a quarter of the total length. I mean, what is this? Handbook for mortals? So weak as she is, she can barely register it when she hears something cutting through the ice, carving her out like a statue. It's her, isn't it? A voice said. It was wickedly deep and amused. Another voice. Look at that face! Of course it is! She felt something sharp against her cheek. A blade? No, a nail. A long one. We'll make a broth from her bones that will fill us with power. We'll burn her hair and inhale the smoke to make us beautiful again. And when I find her, I shall take my great knife and cut out her heart while she still lives. And the glory of our youth shall be restored. Although as much as I like the difficulty that Eel is having, it does kind of hinge on the idea that Cleo's an idiot. But Eela's removed from the ice. Apparently there's a moonling helping them unfreeze the ice when the bird comes back and starts shrieking in the air above. The cannibals try shooting the bird, but none of them are able to hit it until there's screaming and blood spattering in places and someone drops Ela, and then she's flying through the air and then she's out. When she finally wakes up, Ela's actually in Oro's room with Oro standing above her and of course like, she demands an explanation. Reasonably so. He did betray her after all, but not according to him. Oro sighed. I did not betray you, wildling. Ila opened her mouth, but he kept talking. Though you believing so helped tremendously. Helped what? She growled. He was lying. She didn't trust a word that came out of his wicked mouth. One of the places where darkness meets light on Moon Isle was impossible to access without Cleo. It had been encased in a maze centuries before to keep others out. I needed her, so I changed the matches. I am altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. Now, Oro claims that he didn't betray Ela, even though when you look at the grand scheme, the way that everything works together, he didn't actually need to out that she doesn't have powers and put her at unnecessary risk. There's a bunch of reasons that you'd be able to come up with for why he would want to switch teams and work with Cleo. She's stronger. Ela's annoying. Ela isn't pulling her weight. He wants to mix it up because their current strategy wasn't working. And that's just off the top of my head right now. At no point in those scenarios does he actually have to come out and say that Ela does not have powers. Did it bolster his story? Sure. But it also put her at unnecessary risk, and as, a, as an indirect result, Juniper is dead. And I'll accept that he did need Cleo's help in order to get through the maze, but why not save that for last? If she's so untrustworthy, then all the more reason to exhaust your your uh, options before you've got to work with Cleo and possibly clue her into the idea of the heart being a thing in the first place. Because even though Ela is convinced that Cleo used the heart beforehand and is the reason the curses are a thing, why get her suspicious of your motivations? She had no reason to believe that they were going for the heart in the first place, but now she knows conclusively that that's their aim. And to make matters worse, there are three locations on Moon Isle that he has to search, and in the, we get it confirmed that Ela has been in hiding for two weeks. During those two weeks, he has searched one location. Time is of the essence, and he's only done the one thing. Now, granted, Aster wrote it this way because she didn't want to exclude the reader from these other locations that she so uh, that she came up with. And I can appreciate wanting to show more of the island. I can appreciate wanting to show more of the world that she's built. She should feel obligated to write that way because it actually allows the reader to get more invested with the world by getting it more life and dimension. But it doesn't fit logically within the story that she has constructed. Therefore, this looks like Oro is sitting around with his thumb up his ass when he's not on page. Now move your privates, private parts. Move it! You son of an exhibitionist! But that's not enough to get Ela's trust back. That was a pretty substantial blow that Oro had uh, dealt her. So the next couple of pages are dedicated to try to work, uh, building that trust back up and I don't think it works when you actually think about it. Oro says that Cleo has become increasingly convinced that Starling 
has to be the realm that dies because they are the smallest realm, the least developed in the last 500 years due to their curse. And he told Ela's secret, not just to get Cleo to trust him, but to cast doubt on her decision to wipe out Starling. Cleo couldn't have murdered Celeste before because they were teamed up. But once Cleo was teamed up with Oro, that became an option because these rules make no sense. This is a stupid rule because what's the penalty for uh, killing Celeste while they're teamed up? What if it looked like an accident? Something which Ela herself came up with the first night that uh, she and Oro went exploring the island and she had to do the trust fall down the hall. If she had died to that, he wouldn't have looked like he was at fault. And that's not me saying that, that's the author. So putting all the focus on Ela would have saved Celeste, except no, it wouldn't. Ela being powerless does nothing to Cleo's belief that Starling is the weakest realm. It could have given a, a personal reason for Cleo to target Ela, uh, but if she doesn't have powers, then it's logical to at least guess that killing Ela wouldn't affect her realm. Therefore, the Starlings are still a logical target. This is why uh, when writing a character going through some plan, you have to attack your plan to look for flaws. It is a good tactic for real life too. Because if you can find a flaw that easily in someone's plan, you should reevaluate and rewrite. Although Ela takes all this information and doesn't really give it any critical thought. Everything he said sounded logical. Uh, the fuck you say? And Oru reveals that he has never lied to Ela because he knows when people are lying. Why is that a flare? Why does that, like, that doesn't... How do these flares work? Are these just random abilities they have for the sake of plot convenience? Yes, goddammit! Yes! 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 And Oro tries to say that he never would have actually allowed Cleo to hurt her because he was always close. You put me in danger, she said. Cleo could have killed me. I was never far from you, he said. I knew when you moved into the place of mirrors. I guarded its entrance, had guards stationed nearby. How do you think Ella was able to get through unharmed? Wherever you went, I followed. And when I could not, I had guards monitoring Cleo so I could ensure she wasn't anywhere near you. Except, you know, for any time during the day when he or his guards would have died if they were out in the sunlight, why didn't you think this through? Dumbass! Jesus Christ. And also, if he spent so much time worrying over Ela, it sounds like that was more of a distraction to his overall plan, which could explain why he has only explored one place in this critical mission to save the planet. So, at this point, Oro has actually gone and made things harder for himself because now Cleo knows all about the heart and is likely searching for it in force because it's confirmed to be somewhere on her aisle. So Oro has not only not finished checking all these darkness meets light places like he should have been, he has not only granted himself a tremendous distraction in having to guard Ela from Cleo or her forces, he has given himself a very potent adversary because now Cleo is likely searching for the heart on her own terms with her own people in an attempt to circumvent and cut the middleman out and grant herself who knows how much power. Oro has made this job much harder on himself, far beyond what he actually had to do. So even though Oro is an idiot, his plan doesn't make any sense, he did betray uh, Ela, and the logic that he used is faulty at best, Ela decides to agree and join up with him again in secret. Fine, she pinned him with the coldest look she could manage. You know now that I don't eat hearts, she said slowly, but betray me again, earnestly or otherwise. Ela bared her teeth at him, and for you, I'll make an exception. So it's chapter 44, and this is where we get the caramel celebration dance meetup thing. It's described as a celebration for the realms of all islanders, not just nobles, but I'm sticking with the whole, no, this is in here because Aster needed to force everyone together for the sake of interpersonal drama. And Ela is following Oro to the caramel thing because Oro was bound to the rules of the centennial with his life. And I don't know why that means everyone has to show up to this thing. Oro was bound to the rules of the centennial with his life. But how and why? Sure, they did the blood ritual thing at the beginning, but the rules themselves seem arbitrary. On page 29, 
At the bottom of the page, it was stated that the first 100 days of the centennial became more structured because the first centennial was chaotic. Therefore, they had to come up with rules after the fact, and they are not in fact linked to the magic system or the curses. These are rules that were designed to push a story not deep in the world building. It should be the other way around. Construct a logical, cultured world, then add the rules for the centennial that makes sense afterwards. You know, there's a term that you hear a lot if you play D&D enough called metagaming. It's where you take real-world knowledge and place it into the game and basically use player knowledge instead of character knowledge. If your character is dumb as a stump and doesn't actually understand certain cultural norms or basic science or history or anything, but you as the player understand, oh, the, the story we're playing reenacts an old Shakespeare story. Therefore, if my character does this, he'll be able to save the day. That's metagaming. That's cheapening the moment. And that's largely what this book feels like. It feels like things are constructed artificially for the sake of advancing the story, not because that's what the characters would do naturally. It feels hollow because instead of having real characters actually living out their lives through dangerous scenarios, we jump from event to event that happen just because. We get a hasty line that says Ela had moved back to her uh, room in the castle at Oro's insistence. Seems like it was just put there to quickly dismiss the whole she was living at the place of mirrors thing. And Celeste gets a one-off line where she criticizes Ela for looking ridiculous. A chance at playful teasing, a little bit of banter between Ela and Celeste, considering that they are in fact like sisters. But we only have the one line from Celeste, no response from Ela, so the moment feels hollow or incomplete. This would have been a great moment for a bit of characterization on both Ela and Celeste's part, where Ela responds with her own dunk on Celeste's outfit. Oh yeah, well I look ridiculous, but you look like a the middle of a fireworks explosion. I don't know. Now, it's obvious if Oro has kept Ela under uh, close guard that he would know that Celeste has been visiting her. But despite that, Ela decides to stay separate from Celeste, lest Oro grow suspicious of her friendship with the Starling Queen. Starling Ruler, rather. So Oro and his guards are watching out for Ela at the party. Celeste is going to be nearby, keeping an eye out. Grim, of course, is doing his own thing but uh, we'll likely be able to help Ela, so she's pretty safe. Despite this, though, she does start twirling a blade between her fingers, and that's all it's described as, so feel free to insert literally any edged weapon if you want here. Just imagine her twirling Cloud's Buster Sword or something. Because she has never had alcohol before, Ela decides to take her first drink of wine, and Ela is an impressively sloppy drunk because that one glass is all that it takes to really get her tipsy. Now the drink is called a haze and I believe there are some hallucinogenics in it so you can be a little forgiving in this but I don't recall that being confirmed anywhere. Wasn't there a video game called Haze that was about drugs? Heads up my boys, it's that time again. Sure is better than coffee and a slap in the face. I am so ready to liberate the natives. Hell yeah! Boosh! So she's singing in the halls, can't really remember her way around the castle. Uh, Oral runs into her and offers to guide her back to her room. When they get back to her room, Ela asks Oro how he found her when she was frozen on the moon isle. And he said it was because he followed the bird, the one that was flying overhead when the cannibals were about to eat her. They have some tea together, they lay down in Ela's bed, and they end up falling asleep. When they wake up, Oro's feeling a little rested and he says that, you know, tomorrow they'll go back to Moon Isle and uh, search one place for the heart and the, the next day if they don't find it they'll search the only other place that then they'll be done. But an hour later she's uh, at her balcony in her room where there's a pounding on the door. Uh, Ella has come back to warn her that a ruler was attacked. Which one? she asked, roaring, filling her ears, filling the world. Ella's silver-gloved fingers shook at her sides. Starling! And Ella bolts down the hallway, trying to find Celeste in a moment that is immediately derailed by how badly this line is written. Ella moved through the castle like a storm. If she'd had power, it would be everywhere. She ran like she was running from something, wielded her dagger like she might throw it. Now, I'm absolutely being pedantic when I do this, but typically, when you take a throwing knife, you're gonna hold it like this, 
because it gives you better control over just throwing it softball style. You can also throw it like this, but I am not enough of an expert on throwing knives in order to differentiate one or the other. The problem is, she's described as having a dagger, so one of these things. And I don't think you're really going to be able to throw this as well. Now this particular example doesn't really work too well because the handle is way heavier than it should be, but it gives you the idea. Also, I'm just showing off because it's more entertaining right now than reading this book. When she finally reaches Celeste, she sees that Celeste is floating in the middle of a miniature maze looking like she was sleeping. Silver fog and string thin as a spider web wrapped a thin veil around her. Apparently, this is the result of a poison, some sort of a poison that makes you float. So, Willy Wonka reference. You stole Fizzy drink, and now the ceiling has to be washed and sterilized. You get nothing, sir. Good day. And what's really plot convenient, I mean, very unfortunate, is that only her body can bend itself. Moonling healing ability strengthens the poison. Wow, if only they had another option, like, you know, a wildling elixir that could heal something. This, of course, is never considered. But considering Cleo's past interest in wiping out the starlings, she sounds like the most likely suspect. Fortunately for Hila and Celeste, this poison isn't enough to kill Celeste, so as long as no one comes by to finish the job, she should be able to recover. So Ela summons Grimm and asks him to hide Celeste and make sure that she stays safe, which he agrees to do. Everything changed in an instant. Now Ela wasn't just fighting for herself or Terra or her people. She was fighting for Celeste. She was already fighting for Celeste. Ever since the whole bond breaker thing, it's been obvious that she's been fighting for Celeste. This is an example of, that sounded better in your head, didn't it? Now, even though there's no reason to believe that Ela has run out of the wildling healing cream, uh, she thinks that while Celeste couldn't be healed by moonling ability, perhaps she could by wildling remedy. And she thinks that there might be some in the vault at the place of mirrors. She had to open that vault by any means necessary. There could be ancient wildling remedies inside, plants that could draw Celeste's poison out. She hadn't seen any in the oasis Oro had taken her to so many weeks before, but perhaps they had been locked away here instead. You know, this isn't a long shot Hail Mary pass because the Hail Mary pass assumes that there's going to be someone on the other side of the stadium to catch the ball. This is more like blind firing a Hail Mary pass, but the receiver may or may not exist. Hell of a lot to really waste your efforts on. But of course, she has no way to know how to open the vault, so she has to skip out on that for now to come to uh, Celeste's rescue later. Right now, she has to meet Oro so they can investigate the first place and hopefully find the heart. Maybe if she gets the heart, Ela can magic some remedy together and save Celeste directly. The place they're going to is some abandoned palace that is partially submerged. The section that they need to investigate is actually completely underwater, and this is an excuse for Oro to begin taking off his clothing. <laughs> this isn't necessarily a mistake, it's just an excuse for cheesecake, like how nobody actually watched Aquaman for the plot. Dressed like a bat. You're out of your mind, Bruce Wayne. And much like many of the people who saw Aquaman, Ela spends plenty of time looking at Oro for her own reasons. Oro stared back at her, surprised. I'm sure you've seen plenty of bodies before, he said flatly. Out of context, it sounds like a reference to Vietnam. Now, what's particularly key about this submerged castle thing is that it also houses water lilies, one of the plants that Ela arbitrarily said the heart might attach itself to. Before they jump in the water and start searching, Oro reminds Ela that these waters house ancient vicious creatures and that they should be on guard. Naturally, because she has no powers and underwater your mobility is limited, the smart thing would be for Oro and Ela to stick together. For reasons of upcoming fight scene, this doesn't happen. And what's more, Ela immediately falls victim to one of these ancient creatures. Her gaze traced the edges of the floor beneath the furniture. No sign of any plant. She turned to try a different room and almost swallowed a mouthful of water in shock. A face 
lovely and vicious as a nightmare, floated before her. Half of the girl's face was scaled. Half of her hair had the transparent silkiness of a koi fish's tail. Her arms and legs were scaled too, creating the effect of submerged silk around her limbs. Mesmerizing. Ela squinted. Her mind had suddenly become just as murky as the water. There was... Uh, she was there for something, but she couldn't quite remember what that was. This mermaid thing then leads Ela underwater through a bedroom and into a hall. And eventually, Ela does figure out that this thing is up to no good, and a fight scene ensues. After getting a few scrapes herself, Ela is able to counter effectively. She grabbed the dagger she had hidden in the middle of her chest, tucked in the wiring of her bra, dropped it, her free foot, caught the blade with her toes, and she stabbed the dark figure right in the eye. So I'm not going to worry about the whole dagger in the bra thing, as uncomfortable as that sounds, but whatever, I've seen women use bras as pockets before, so it doesn't matter. I'm going to let it slide. What I am going to call out, though, is the way that the fight scene evolves, because it says that her free foot caught the blade with her toes, and then she stabbed the dark fi uh, figure right in the eye. How does she do that with a foot? That's, that's remarkably agile. It's not a matter of ability, it's a matter of accuracy. The whole thing just sounds absurd. And I think the way that this is described, the mermaid is like, pulling at Ela's feet, so at least there's like, it's not like an impressively flexible thing where Ela has to like, lift her knee above her head, or do an underwater somersault or anything. It's really, it's just stabbing downward, but the flexibility at that moment is impressive, and not in a natural way, more like a goddamn you're a Mary Sue kind of way. You know what they generally don't teach swordsmen? How to fence with your toes. I I'm reminded of one of uh, Ari Salvatore's books. The character, like the famed mercenary Artemis Entreri, at, at one point had his shoes off and clicked a collected a bunch of pebbles with his toes and flicked them at his enemies' faces. And the pros pointed out that where the, the pebbles landed were completely incidental because even that kind of skill was beyond Artemis and Treri, or however you pronounced his name. I don't feel like looking it up. So Oro shows up just in time to not be of any help for the fight and explains that that was a night creature. So even the mermaids are not called mermaids. Who's a pretty girl? That's right. You are. Also, he shows up so suddenly, it demands the question, where the hell were you five seconds ago? But Oro was not able to find the heart anywhere around, and they give up after a couple of minutes of searching. Which means, it can only be in one place. And before I forget, can anyone explain how this palace is an example of darkness meeting light? Is it because there's water, and the water's kind of murky? Also, here's a mistake. So the water is described as being murky because Ela's mind becomes as murky as the water around her, and yet somehow she's still able to clearly see all the things around her, like the environments, or the water lilies, or the mermaid during the fight. God, this is, this is such an impressive mess. But anyway, there's only one place left for them to look, and this is in the middle of Vinderland territory. Who? It's right at the center of Vinderland territory, he said. Her face scrunched in confusion. The group that tried to kill you? Oh. Who were they? She asked. She hadn't seen them, but their voices, what they had wanted to do with her. Oro blinked. I thought you knew. Knew what? They were wildlings. What? Her face twisted. There aren't any left on the island, and they were men. There aren't any left. They were wildlings. Their group left your realm long before the, uh, even the curses. They had already renounced their power, so their kind wasn't affected. If your response to this moment is to flip your table and just pause the video for a couple of minutes so you can absorb how impressively stupid all this is, you ain't far off from what I did. The Vinderlands were former wildlings who gave up their powers, how the hell can they do that, and so avoided the curse. Also, Vinderland was the group that ambushed and tried to eat Ela earlier. This is what I mean when I say that Aster's claim that no one can see the twist coming is meaningless. Also, if there are people who don't have powers, then why isn't this more well known? Are these people outcasts somehow? Why are they living on Moon Isle? 
Why is the idea of people without power such a unique concept all throughout the book up until this point? Ela hasn't had powers, and this has been a remarkable twist, but it's suddenly not? Are there other groups like them? And why did they cast aside their powers in the first place? None of this adds up or makes any sense when you think about it. So the next night, time is of the essence, so Ela and Oro step foot on Moon Isle as soon as they can, and are immediately met by the bird that apparently lives on the island and keeps bothering them for some reason. She's convinced that the bird belongs to Cleo and may even be like some sort of a pathway to communicate with Cleo. Like the bird is clearly some sort of a spy, which explains why the bird was hovering around her when Oro found her. So the Vinderlins, despite being wildlings, live in the northernmost stretches of Moon Isle, apparently beyond the reaches of Cleo's Snow Kingdom. And even though they don't have powers, I have to wonder why Cleo hasn't wiped them out because they're infringing on her territory or what one would assume is her territory. And they barely stepped into this area when a whole bunch of guys from the Venerland gang or whatever this is, step out from the trees. No words are exchanged. They just start charging forward. And of course, Ela smiles, undercutting all the tension of the moment. Just don't ever do that in your fight scenes. Boy, what more can the two of us do? Speak for yourself. I don't need tricks to beat you. And the fight is so mind-numbingly easy that you just, you wonder why it's in here in the first place. This feels like it's been put in because, well, Time for a fight scene because arbitrary and it doesn't work. Not only does Ela fire three arrows at once, each fighting a target, how did you do that? But throwing stars from her pocket flew from her other hand into the neck of a man half a moment away from burying his blade in Oro's neck. They landed in a perfect line across his throat like a macabre necklace. Oro's fire hissed and roared as he took out five people at once, their metal weapons dropping into the snow with barely a sound. He froze one against a tree, another he sent hurtling back with a burst of startling energy. One thing to consider when writing a fight scene is, why is this fight happening? People don't fight for no reason. It could be a bad reason or a petty one, but there is a reason behind it. Pride, jealousy, just needing to let off some steam are all easy possibilities when not fighting for something greater like saving or enslaving the world. However, I have no idea why Ela and Oro are fighting this group or why the group is fighting them. Aside from some supposed territorial claim, what reason does the Vinderlin gang have to ambush and attack for? Why are they fighting, really? To stop Oro and Ela? Why do they care to stop them? Is it because Cleo paid them off? Why would the gang take money to fight them? There's no personality in the enemies, so there's no deeper impact for the reader. A fight can sometimes be treated as a violent conversation. Each side has their piece or beliefs, and those positions are made clear through the fight. When Ned Stark fights Jaime Lannister at the end of A Game of Thrones, you understand why they would fight before the fight uh, even begins. That's because they're well-established characters with clear motives. This fight is such a mess that the gang hasn't even been established as the ones ambushing Ela and Oro. Considerable disappointment. There's no exchange of information. There's no declaration that this is the Vanderlyn gang. There's no cause or anything put up. It's just Bad guys, fight scene now! And near the end of the fight, it's revealed that Oro is something of a Green Lantern because he was able to create a silver sword out of starling energy. And I'm confused by this because Ela says she hadn't known a thing like that could be done, even though we saw Celeste do that during the demonstrations when she utilized her power and that of her nobles in order to conjure a sword out of condensed starling energy. Did Astrid not read her own book? But anyway, pointless fight scene is over and they start looking around. There's, I guess they're searching trees, which again, I don't know how this reflects the whole darkness meets light thing. Why are they here? But, oh my God, the heart's not anywhere to be found. So either they were wrong about this place or they were right about this or some other place and Cleo got to it first. But if Cleo has the heart, there's no way that Celeste or the Wildlings are gonna be saved, so uh-oh, we still have a bit of conflict going on. They still look back to the castle and we get a timeline confirmation that there are 
20 days left in the centennial, but Illa doesn't think the island would make 10, or that Terra would make it 5. And when she's reflecting on her failure to find the, uh, the heart, we get this line. Ela had made countless mistakes in the last 80 days. She had trusted the wrong people. She had made the wrong plans. She had followed the wrong leads. She had blindly chased power when she should have done everything to protect the people who loved her. And I can't help but feel like this is Aster's built-in defense for why she thinks Ela is not a Mary Sue. When discussing Mary Sue's, the topic of perfection often uh, gets brought up. They're really good at certain tasks, they're beloved by everyone, they don't make mistakes. And I will say that Ela does share a lot of Mary Sue traits, but I'm not exactly comfortable calling her an out-and-out -out Mary Sue. Yes, she has mastered an unreasonable number of skills, and yes, the story does feel like it exists in part to show off how cool she is, but there is something that's kind of stopping her from being a full-on Mary Sue. The problem is, a lot of the decisions and a lot of the mistakes that Ela has made were in defiance of common sense, even though the book doesn't seem aware that that was the case. Like when she went hunting after Cleo sometime after sunset, when Oro could have gotten her as far as she was aware. There's also how she immediately fell victim to the mermaid, moments after Oro left her to her own devices in the uh, underwater castle thing that they went exploring. You see, the reason, the defining defense that I think Ela isn't a full Mary Sue is that she's too stupid to be a Mary Sue. This is no doubt something that Aster would disagree with me on, but when you think about a lot of Ela's decisions, some of it can be chalked up to youthful inexperience, but a lot of it is, where was the logic when you were thinking this? When you think about the decisions that Ela has made up to this point, a good portion of them only work if Ela is an idiot. And that's probably the first time I've ever been able to dismiss a Mary Sue claim quite like that. Ela and Oro reconvene and try to decide what's next. All of the locations they've checked so far have been a waste, and they know that the heart is supposed to be somewhere on Moon Isle, but they're running out of time to check every square inch. So what are they going to do? Well, they go back to the beginning. Where did Oro learn about the heart in the first place? Apparently, he read about it in an ancient text that he found in a hidden library. And this comes back to the beginning. Another library, one they haven't checked another possible location of the Bond Breaker. And yet with this new revelation, we get this line that suggests that the Bond Breaker wouldn't save Terra, who was currently turning into mulch, which doesn't make sense because the Bond Breaker is supposed to break curses and Terra is going through the effects of a curse. Why wouldn't it break the curse? Celeste was on the brink of death. Ela couldn't use it with her in that state. And even if she could, the Bond Breaker wouldn't save Terra. Only an excess of power would. Only the power promised to the person who broke all the curses would. So, aside from the fact that Celeste probably could use the Bond Breaker, you just need to stab her. Why does Ela come to the conclusion that only an excess of power would save Terra? The Bond Breaker is supposed to break curses, and Terra is suffering the effect of a curse. So... Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why not, you stupid bastard? Before they actually start researching anything about the heart, Oro says that there's something that Ela has to know. I would have informed you at the beginning, but after what Grimm told you, I was waiting for him to reveal the information himself. She swallowed. Tell her what? What could be so important? I'm guessing he never did. Ela just stared at him, waiting. My ancestor, Horace Ray and Grimm's, Crone and Malver created the island. She nodded. She knew that. And so did yours. She blinked. No, that wasn't true. Ila placed a hand against the table just to feel something steady. Wildlings weren't even really accepted on the island anymore. They didn't help create it. That doesn't make any sense. Lark Crown. She made the land we stand upon. The island was named after her. And apparently this is something that happened thousands of years ago, and the name of Lark Crown was lost to, uh, lost to time. Take a moment to think, why is this here? Why is this information provided now, at this moment? Because they go on 
to like the only thing this leads to is a twist that apparently the heart of light lark could have only been uh, used by someone who had used it before or something oh jesus this is confusing this is used to open up the idea that only a sunling wildling or nightshade would have been able to utilize the heart as far as lark crown herself pretty much once this page is done all relevance is stripped from the uh story this should have been a huge revelation something that goes back thousands of years about you know buried secrets and lost history that has some sort of a devastating impact on Ela's worldview for like the, the, the history of her people this is monumental and it's mentioned in a blip and then it's done light lark is no doubt a direct reference to lark crown this is a foundational shift to everything we understand and it means nothing. This is like if it turns out that George Washington was a time-traveling space alien and it doesn't actually impact anything else about the foundation of America. This moment is just used to open up the idea that now a sunling, wildling, or nightshade would be able to use the heart. This whole revelation is just so that Asher can rewrite the rules that she set in place from earlier in the book. Again, if she had simplified it and had written it so that anyone could use the heart, as is apparently the rule, it wouldn't have mattered. She wouldn't have had to include this little revelation and we wouldn't have this dull nothing of a twist. And why even hold this back from Ila in the first place because we had that moment where Oro was able to actually reveal it but chose not to because oh I want to see if Grimm tells you what logic is there in that decision why does that make sense at the moment it seems manipulative of Oro to play around with what Grimm does in an attempt to hopefully control Ela later on. What reason does Grimm have to not mention it at all? No, this was included so that Aster could use it as a twist right here at this moment. That is weak ass writing. And despite the idea that only a Sunling, Wilding, or Nightshade would have been able to access the heart's powers, she still determined that Cleo had somehow spun the curses in the first place. After a little bit of research on the heart, nothing we get to see, but whatever, Ela goes to visit Celeste and see how she's doing, and uh, to sort of convey that, indeed, Celeste was right. There was another hidden library, one that Ela doesn't check at that moment. She had full access to it and could have looked around and didn't. Like even secretively, but whatever. Anyway, though Celeste couldn't hear her, Ela's voice shook as she finally said, you were right, Cell, about the hidden library. She grabbed her friend's hands, knowing how excited she would be if she was awake. And that was when Ela noticed one of them was curled into a fist, as if she had been fighting right before the poison had made her go still. Not fighting, Ela thought, as she carefully pulled her friend's fingers back, sending a message to Ela. There was something in Celeste's fist, something she had managed to grab to tell Ela who had done this to her, a clue. She finally fully pulled her friend's pale hand open, and the diamond ring she had given Azul fell to the floor. So yeah, that whole acorn-sized jewel thing comes back... God, what was that? More than 300 pages later. And I can appreciate a, a very long setup and a, a very lengthy payoff. Sometimes it can be phenomenal. My my favorite example being the white mage joke from 8-Bit uh, Theater, if you know what I'm talking about. But this is a moment that was so inconsequential when it was introduced that I didn't even notice it the first time. I had to go back and double check. Kind of a, yeah, okay, I guess that did happen moment. Although that does raise the question, how did Celeste pull the ring off of his finger while he was presumably poisoning her? Why would he not recover the ring? Because that's such an obvious clue as to who attacked Celeste. It's almost like this is just a lazy setup 
for the sake of advancing some drama. Although it is good because God knows Azul needs a bit more definition, even this far into the book. And we will discuss this in greater detail in a little bit. We will be coming back to it because it is made retroactively really, really stupid. So Ela has so much she has to balance at this point. The heart of White Lark is somehow missing. Oro just revealed this new hidden library that she didn't know about before. Cleo might have the heart. Azul, turns out, is not the jovial haunted ruler that everyone assumed he was. But first, Ela has to give some information out of Grimm. Namely, why didn't he inform her about her ancestor, Lark Crown? And his reason for not revealing this big secret doesn't work. No need to skirt around the reason she had called him here. Why didn't you tell me that Wildling created the island with Sunling and Nightshade? His expression did not change, not the way she had thought it might. For a moment, all he did was study her. Finally, Grimm said, Some things are better uncovered ourselves. His gaze was steady. There are many things others told me that I would have preferred to have learned on my own. In time. When I could understand it all better, what things, she wanted to ask, but she stayed focused. Were you ever going to tell me? In time, of course. I brought you here, answered your questions, but I didn't want to force anything onto you at once. He shook his head. You had just arrived somewhere new, not knowing much, forced to carry the burden of the curses to represent your entire realm. Powerless, you were terrified. I couldn't make it worse. I didn't want to. Some things are better uncovered ourselves, and she somehow expected to uncover a centuries-old secret that isn't apparently written down anywhere. How was she supposed to discover this herself? And why not reveal it when he did? This doesn't sound like, because the, the whole thing with Malvair wasn't something she knew. It sounds like that would have been a perfectly fine time to explain the whole, oh yeah, and your ancestor too thing. Except, it wouldn't have worked for the narrative twist that Astro wanted to use, so he didn't tell her then. Again, this is meta-knowledge that doesn't actually work within the context of the story. Anila asks Grimm if there are any other secrets that he's not telling her, and he hums and haws for a minute until he says that, yes, there is one secret. He frowned. It was an unfamiliar expression on his face. He frowned at other people, a lot, but never at her. With her, he always grinned. I haven't told you what you do to me. She blinked. What? I haven't told you that you've ruined me. Ruined? He nodded. Ruined! Tortured! You haven't stopped tormenting me since the first moment I saw you. And then they banged. I'm... Not even making that up. She dug her nails into the back of his neck, their foreheads pressed together, and she had never felt more alive, more bare, than she did in that moment, having him watch as endless sensations overcame her. Grimm looked her right in the eyes as every feeling intensified, saturated, more than she had ever thought possible. And something about it all was so familiar, like falling asleep, or humming to the rain, or breathing like she'd already done it all a thousand times in her dreams. And I do like the way that Aster actually colored in this image without being direct. It shows that she can use creative artistry to paint the image without directly hinting at what she's talking about. It's a high mark of writing, and I do wish that we got more of that in this book. The problem is she's overcomplicated so much of everything else that it doesn't have time for that artistry to really flourish. Although, because... Ela summoned Grimm here. This does kind of retroactively turn this into a booty call. Ela reconvenes with Oro when they go over everything that they know about the heart, uh, like how it's supposed to be on Moon Isle. It's somewhere where darkness meets light. Really not a lot to go on. And out of nowhere, Ela is able to determine that maybe the darkness meets light thing isn't a place, but a time. This is also where we learned that there, the uh, blue guy was named Remlar. How nice to so very much later actually name him, but whatever. Really makes me wonder why Aster couldn't fit that name in during the scene, but okay. And they determined that where darkness meets light must refer to a place that only appears during dawn or dusk. When they get to the Moon Isle, they start passing small talk about what are you going to do when we break the curses, which is 
given all the weight of what are you going to do after graduation, and Ela very quickly announces that Azul was responsible for attacking Celeste, and Oro dismisses that by saying there must be a mistake. Azul has never wanted to hurt another ruler. He's never even tried to form an alliance, which, when you're going through this for the first time, is like, then why was he talking to you about how a realm has to die? It, it doesn't make sense in context until much later. And it's another one of those moments where you've got all these compounded events that don't work until they're explained near the end of the book. And while they do work at the end, going up to it, you just get the impression that Aster is very, very, very amateur. These aren't cleverly weaved in footnotes that you've got to remember later on. These are just moments that are designed purely to fool the reader. And I'm getting tired of them. Unfortunately, we're not done with them. They wander for a bit until they find that blue bird. And they start following the blue bird. The bird wasn't the heart. She knew that. But it would lead her to it. They actually go near the uh, glacier where the oracles are frozen. And the bird nestles down in a tree and, and has a nest. And, and we just... This reveal. This is... Mm. Fortunately, there's a plot convenient cave nearby that they can watch the bird's nest from so that Oro doesn't have to die when the sun rises. So they just sit and watch a bird and wait until the dark sky was brightening, the moon was fading, Oro was on his feet in an instant. They both rushed at the entrance, watching, waiting. In the rising light, Ela noticed something. She squinted. Right below the nest, something was floating in the air, untethered to gravity. Is that an egg? she asked. Just as the words left her mouth, the egg fell, slowly, too slowly. It plunged to the ground and cracked open. From its shell emerged a shining gold yoke. It rose from the ground in tandem with the sun rising from the horizon just across the cliff. The full egg represented the moon, she said, her voice hoarse from singing. The yoke is the sun. How many times had she thought the full moon looked like an egg? that the sun looked yoky. She turned to Oro, eyes wide. That's it, she said. That's the heart. The heart is hidden until it blooms and becomes a part of Lightlark. Oro had presumed it was a plant, but this time the heart had returned as the very basis of life, an egg. Okay, so this is not my largest note, but a lengthy one. The heart manifested in a bird's nest, fell to the ground and cracked open. Then the yolk rose up and floated in the air. That was the heart. Ela explained that the shell was the moon and the yolk was the sun, so it's where darkness meets light. Still doesn't work since the moon doesn't correspond to darkness well in this context, but that's only where the problems start. This is a contrivance of the highest order. How did this happen to manifest in this exact moment on this particular day only when it had an audience? Did this happen nightly, when they, where the heart egg cracked open every night, or is this a contrivance of the highest level where it only bloomed now? How involved is this bird in this? Did the bird manifest the egg? Was the egg in the nest and Ela didn't notice it until now? How much control does the bird possess over this whole process? It seemed smart enough to understand that it had to lead others to the nest for the egg. Could the bird have gone to the rulers and laid an egg in front of them? Surely a floating yolk that apparently is supposed to pulse with power would have gathered some inspection. Of course no one could see this twist coming because it involves elements that we didn't know were in play. This is like ending Lord of the Rings by having Space Marines airdrop at the Black Gate and wiping out all the orcs and uruk at the end of the last book. And there are two instances that I can think of right now where Aster compared the sun to a yolk, but that doesn't come across as some sort of a, eh, eh, do you see what I did there kind of a thing, and more like her just being toying around, dicking around, for lack of a better word, and playing around with an element that we had no reason to suspect was connected to something later on. This isn't a clever reveal, it's annoying. Part of the fun of a mystery is being able to play along with the elements and see how they add up at the end. Being able to play along and guess along with the protagonists and the detectives and the, you know, whatever. But this is annoying because nothing makes sense leading up to it. We have too much to balance elsewhere and 
We're utilizing elements that contradict things that we were told beforehand. It's going to be a plant. Oh, until it's not. It's going to be in a literal place where darkness meets light. Oh, until it's not. And I don't like the reveal. I don't like the metaphorical usage here because so often, like I've said, it just becomes frustrating to try to figure out what the hell Aster is talking about because she keeps flip-flopping how she utilizes literal and figurative prose. It's not enjoyable when you have someone just playing tricks on you and there's nothing you can do in response. It just becomes an exercise in patience. I guess one could argue that Aster did in fact subvert our expectations, but let's be perfectly honest, subverting expectations is the modern way of saying, what a twist. What a twist! It's no different, and in fact is often worse, because you're introducing elements that weren't in play beforehand. Twists can be effectively utilized, unfortunately it's one of those things that I can't really list without ruining a story, potentially. Fight Club is all I'll say. And there are ways to play around with, with twists in a way that makes them memorable and, and logical. One of the best ones that I could list is from Deep Blue Sea. It's an otherwise stupid action movie where scientists are trying to cure cancer by making super intelligent sharks that of course get loose and attack all the scientists and workers on this underwater lab and you know they just start destroying everything one by one and the characters start dying one at a time and one of them you've got Samuel L. Jackson who plays this you know kind of a legendary figure who survived an avalanche and is seen as some sort of a, a hero character and when they're at the bottom of the lab and they're like everyone's starting to fight together because the tension's so high how are they going to get out of this oh, we should go this way no that'll kill us we should go this way no that will never work and he has this rousing speech about how they have to work together about how bad it actually was during the avalanche and he starts revealing secrets that he didn't actually tell uh, the public and it's this perhaps a bit tropey speech where he says, we're going to, you know, buckle up and, and work together and we're all going to get out of this alive. And all of a sudden, we're going to pull together and we're going to find a way to get out of here. First, we're going to seal off this. He was standing in front of a pit that had direct access to the ocean the whole time. It's entirely logical that the sharks would be able to figure out that they could just run up and bite somebody who was standing too close to the lip of the, the, the water. It makes sense. And it's not just that it works in a story sense, it works on a meta sense as well. Back when that movie came out, the big name actors were almost always the ones who lived to the very end of the movie. So for Samuel L. Jackson to die about halfway in was a tremendous shock that I certainly never saw coming. And for him to be taken out mid-motivational speech. This wasn't just a twist that took you by surprise, this was a twist that reached out of the TV and slapped you. I don't remember a lot of the rest of the movie, but that moment will stay with me for the rest of my life. It's logical. It fits in the characters. It plays with tropes. It is very satisfying, especially when you go back and rewatch it. Even if you know it's coming, the setup, the presentation is done so well. The heart egg twist reveal thing is not like this because it contradicts what we've been given about the heart beforehand. And we're already overloaded by information up to this point. So for the information that we've gathered, to be rendered useless in retrospect isn't a fun exercise, it's grating, it's annoying, it's, you mean I studied for the test and there's only a single question on it? <sighs> okay, so, twists alone don't make for good storytelling. It's very easy to blindside someone with a twist. Sometimes it's good. Oftentimes, it sucks. Anything can happen within the confines of a story, especially for authors like Astor who don't bother with logical or internal consistency, but whatever. But only blindsiding an audience doesn't make for a good twist or reveal. Hell, I never would have guessed that Sam Jackson would die in Deep Blue Sea midway through a motivational speech, but it really worked. It used traditional tropes, big name actor, motivational speech, etc., and then used that against the audience for a genuine shock. Aster is just throwing a bunch of random stuff at the reader with no setup in the hopes that it would surprise the reader. The issue is that nothing she's done involved a lot of, inv uh, of the investment on the reader's part. I kept forgetting that Junerable was a character, for example, and she keeps changing the rules so it becomes frustrating to try to guess what she's going to do next. The issue is that nothing she's done with this twist involved investment on the reader's part. The homework that we've done up to this point 
meaningless. Everything was wrong. Here's the surprise twist. You're welcome, everybody. I'll say that Aster does have some talent as a writer, but her twists are not where she shines. Whew. Okay, so getting back into things. So the heart egg is now manifest, and because Oro is allergic to sunlight, Ela has to step out and grab the heart, so she does. The bird's happy, Ela's happy, Oro's happy, and then she gets shot. And felt it all rip away as an arrow plunged through her chest. She choked, falling to her knees. Her chin dipped and her eyes settled on the long tip of an arrow, sticking right through her heart. A perfect hit. This? Yeah, apparently it's what's left of the Vinderlin gang or whatever. They shot her once and then Oro destroys them all in an instant so easily that it's like, why were they even there? Like maybe he was distracted by the wonder of finally getting the heart. I, I'm not going to say that uh, it's completely illogical that Ela got shot, but they're just, he vaporizes them so easily that they feel like an afterthought. But Ela grabs the heart, tugs on Grimm's family jewel, and he appears, and then I guess teleports her away somewhere. And Ela starts to wonder if this is what it's like to die. Oh, thank God. So Ela wakes up immediately the next page, and it's assumed that she survived because she was able to tap into the heart's powers and basically revived herself. She thinks that this might have been her committing the original offense that the prophecy spoke of, but she's not sure. And then she's got Grimm there with his bundle of contrivances trying to get a load of this. There's something else, Grimm said. He was so serious that Ela's stomach sank. What had happened while she was healing? There is a moonling shop in the Agora, a hidden one long abandoned. I went there to try to find more remedy while you were sleeping, and I found something hundreds of years old. A rare wilding elixir that does what moonling healing cannot. Ela drew in too much air. She blinked at him, a question in her eyes. He nodded solemnly. Grim looked at the floor, not at her. Celeste is awake. Everything is so bloody convenient, it's starting to piss me off. Grim just happened to find a hidden moonling shop that was long abandoned, which just happened to have an ancient wilding elixir that just happened to be stronger than any known moonling portion, which just happened to be strong enough to gear Celeste. This kind of easy solution is what makes it so hard to have any stakes in the story. I cannot stay invested in any suspense because any real issue gets waved away with nary a thought. For fuck's sake, Ela was dead a page ago. This is just the start. The book gets dumber and dumber and dumber as we continue. Wait until the next chapter. That's probably the worst. So Ela runs to Celeste to try to see how she's doing, and Celeste confirms that Azul was in fact the one who attacked her. And when she's done checking with Celeste, Ela goes back to her room and Oro flies from his balcony to hers through the sunlight, which did burn him and his skin is healing as he's walking in to see Ela. I get that he's concerned. I get that he's excited that she's awake and moving around, but you don't climb over a barbed fence to vi visit a buddy in the hospital. You use the gate. Oro just looks like an idiot. So they found the heart with 10 days to spare. Quite impressive, especially considering that Terra is apparently submerged mostly into the forest floor and only the right half of her face was still exposed to the air. Ela goes to talk to Oro about the next part of the prophecy because unfortunately, one of the other rulers still has to die. No, it should be a pretty easy choice, right? You got Cleo, who's been an antagonist for pretty much the entire run of the book, and you've got Azul, who did try to kill Celeste, right? Hey, one or the other, why not? Except, that's not what Oro recommends. The last step, then, is the matter of which realm will perish. Oro leaned back in his chair. As promised, the choice of which realm to save is yours. Starling, she said immediately. Her shoulders settled a bit. She was safe. And so was her best friend. Oral's brow furrowed, surprised. Why? she wondered. Then her blood went cold. Who dies? she asked quickly, not bothering to hide her fear. Not anymore. Oro's eyes softened, but the rest of his uh, expression remained firm, the face of a king. Nightshade, Ela, he said gently. Something had punctured her lungs. 
Another arrow, maybe. Her breathing became panting. She was drowning from the inside out. But you said he couldn't die. You said he's the only thing standing between us and a greater danger. From that point on, she had assumed Grimm was safe. Oro nodded. That was true, he said, until we found the heart. I'm not sure why she's just saving Starling arbitrarily, because she's saving everybody. Only one realm has to die. And we still don't know whatever this thing that Grimm is protecting the rest of the world from is. And I might as well reveal this now. We don't find out for the rest of the book. Now, this is where some of Oro's logic really falls apart, because Elo offers a counter and suggests that they just kill Cleo, because Cleo uh, is still the number one suspect for who spun the curses originally, and she tried to kill Ela on more than one occasion. Oro dismisses this idea. Oro stood too, towering over her. There are thousands of moonlings on this island. I will not sentence them all to death because of the actions of their ruler. And yet he's prepared to sacrifice thousands of nightshades for the potential actions of their ruler. Oro even confirms this later on in the same chapter that because Grimm has the teleporting flare, he's able to send an entire army between uh, the Nightshade Newlands and Lightlark. So, if he were to become an opponent in war, he would be incredibly dangerous. But Grimm hasn't actually committed any such offense. So, Oro's, uh, Oro's accusation and his claim to kill Nightshade as a realm is even flimsier than the one to kill the Moonlings, because at least Cleo did something! And yet, because it would be narratively inconvenient, Ela doesn't point that out. She instead offers Azul as another option. Because remember, not only did he attack Celeste, something that Celeste has confirmed, but there was that suspicious conversation that Azul had with Oro way the hell back, I don't know, 200 pages ago. What about his plan? Ela demanded. I heard you both. Your plan is madness, Oro had said. You will be sentencing thousands to death. A realm has to die, Oro, Azul had responded. His plan? Oro said, taking a step towards her. His plan is to sacrifice himself. Give, him, uh, give himself up as the ruler to die to end the curses. He knew his island's days were numbered after my demonstration. He was willing to sacrifice himself, his people, if it meant saving everyone else. They have a democratic rule. His realm agreed with him. They voted for it. And then Oro dismisses the whole, I'm sure he had a reason to kill Celeste thing. But let's, let's think about this whole democratic vote for sacrifice thing. Keep in mind, we don't actually know what the percentage of the people that voted to sacrifice the Skylings was. It could have been a narrow margin, 51% in favor, 49% against. So that means about half of the entire population doesn't want to die, and they've been outvoted. So I guess they're going to die. This is why, aside from the whole not meshing with the magic system thing. The use of democracy doesn't actually work in this book because now at this point, you're talking about stakes that are incredibly dire. We're not talking about a matter of foreign policy or, or economic policy. This is a matter of, are you okay with dying? And I find it very hard to believe that the entirety of the realm is okay with death. And so, Aura was trying to back Ela into a corner, because there's no way that she's going to sacrifice wildlings, and there's no way that Aura is going to agree to sacrifice the sunlings. So, the choice has come down to either Celeste or Grimm. And because she found the heart egg, and she has apparently used the heart egg, it looks like it's bonded to her or something. So, Oro can't make this decision by himself. Now, it's obvious that she's not going to sacrifice Celeste. Celeste is her sister in this whole situation, and the Starlings have all suffered immeasurably. Not being able to age beyond 25 when everyone else is effectively immortal is terrible. And she tries to sum up her character by saying that as the Centennial went on, she wanted power, which isn't really a complete thought. This is something that even Fable 2, for all of its faults, got correct. What exactly does Lucian want? Aside from godlike power? Hmm, that's a tough one. No, 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 that kind of power is a means, not an end. 
People talk about wanting money, wanting power, wanting strength, but the question, the thing that really becomes interesting is what do you do when you have those? What's your plan after you take over the world? Simply owning the world isn't enough. You actually need a plan for after the fact. It would be much more accurate if Ila instead stated that she wanted to save everyone. That right there, that's an end goal. Save everyone, stop the curses, make it so that uh, everyone can live happily ever after kumbaya. But all this talk of sacrifice doesn't really mean anything because Ela suspects that she knows where the bond breaker is. It's in that new hidden library that Oro showed her. And more than that, because he has helped her, she wants to uh, bring Grimm in on the original plan so they can split the blood cost three ways, which I don't think will actually work because it's a two-ended needle. I mean, if you can split it three ways, then why not split it six ways? Because that'll save everyone, won't it? Not to mention, it'll really lessen the blood cost. But that's discounting the whole blood bond breaker thing being incredibly stupid, but I'm getting ahead of myself. But now we're on chapter 53, and this one, oh, this is the chapter that pissed me off. This one was so awful that I, mm, I almost went hoarse screaming at it. But of course, the three-way save might not work. If Ela saves Grimm, and she's in love with him, and he's in love with her, then they can share power. And whatever power they share, they might be able to use to save her realm. But Ela has a potential counter to that. Or, if that was not possible, when her curse was broken, Ela would attempt to trade the wildling abilities she would gain in exchange for Terra and the rest of the wildlings that had been taken by the ground. The forest on the Newland was known to make deals, and a wildling ruler's powers were too valuable to refuse. It was a sacrifice she was willing to make to right everything. The forest on the Newland was known to make deals? What the hell are you talking about? First off, dirt? Dirt makes deals? Second, when the hell was this established? Aster is just making stuff up at this point in order to make everything tie together in the end, and it doesn't work. This is why editing and attacking your ideas is so important, because if it doesn't work in this moment, it's going to derail the reader, and they're going to sit here thinking, how the hell did you think you could pull this off? There are so many problems in this book, just look at the timestamp of this video for proof. So, the plan now is Celeste will collapse part of the mainland castle, and that'll distract Oro long enough that he'll leave his quarters, Ila will sneak into the secret library, dig around and find the bond breaker there, then she, Celeste, and Grimm will meet in the place of mirrors in order to use the bond breaker there, because uh, if Oro comes looking for them, his powers will be nullified, but enchantments like the Bond Breaker will still work. And they'll also bring the remaining healing elixir that they just happen to have because I guess Grimm found some, and uh, they'll close the wounds and I guess restore the blood they lost after the Bond Breaker is, is used. Now, once they're done with the Bond Breaker, uh, Ela, Grimm, and Celeste will need to disappear somewhere until the 100 days were over and uh, either Oro chose someone else to kill to break the curses, or the island disappeared again. Perhaps forever this time. And I've already brought this up, but does it like literally disappear? Because what happens to the people on the island at that point? This is not like the village of Brigadoon! But even though she's upset with Oro, Ela writes a letter to him explaining whatever she could. So Ela gives a tug on the family jewels and summons Grimm, and the two teleport quickly to just outside the Wild Isle. Ela very quickly gives a brief rundown of the plan. They've got an ancient relic that should solve all their problems. Now, Grimm apparently hadn't been outside at night in centuries, and this is because, I'm assuming, the Nightshade curse is the inverse of the Sunling curse, where he can't go outside or else his skin would begin to split open, just like Oro's head under the sun. He would die. However, when they get to the Place of Mirrors, somehow that doesn't happen. And I hate this. 
They were at the edge of the woods on Wild Isle, enchanted by ancient wildling powers, shielding it from all abilities other than wildling's own. She had a theory that the wildling forest might be a little like her, that its quelling of powers also meant other realms' curses would be nullified. And she had been right. This stinks of plot convenience so heavily. We didn't even get confirmation of the Nightling cur uh, Nightshade curse, I don't believe, up until this very moment. So it could have been anything. I'm starting to get heated because I remember how abysmal this chapter is. It is rapid fire contradictions one right after the other and it's, it gets so much worse very quickly. Also, if the Wild Isle, the place of mirrors, nullifies curses, have the starlings live there? Because all of a sudden, they'd be able to live longer. Oh my God, why has no one thought of this? Why didn't Juniper suggest it for all the starlings living on Star Isle? It still would have been connected to everything. It doesn't like literally disappear. I don't know how this works. We're coming up on the longest note I've got. It is almost a full page, so bear with me. I'm gonna have to do quite a bit of reading and then quite a bit of ranting. Headphone warning, this is going to get loud because I am sure I'm gonna get pissed off. Ela ducked into the dead forest and Grim did not move an inch. He watched her, eyes filled with something like despair. Heart, he said. She stilled. Something about that word, about how he said it. Will you ever forgive me? He wondered, reaching out and tucking a piece of her hair behind her ear. Her heart beat once, twice. For what? She asked, taking a step back. Another. Grim shook his head, frowned. You asked me, just minutes ago, if I trusted you, when he should have asked if you could trust me. The forest did not make a sound. The dead leaves did not rustle, as if stunned, just like her. She stumbled away, said, what? So quietly she doubted he had heard it. Heart, he said. He took a step closer. Your dreams, the ones you asked me about, are not dreams. What? They're memories. Memories. Him standing before her in full armor. Her legs wrapped around him. His lips on her neck, on her collarbone, on the sides of her knees. The dreams she'd had for weeks the ones that had made it hard to look grim in the eye. What are you talking about? He shook his head, reached for her, then recoiled when she flinched. You appeared in my castle one year ago, and you returned several times using your nightshade relic. Ela was drowning. She was sure of it. The ground shifted below her feet. She gripped a decayed branch for balance. I've never been to nightshade lands, she said, shaking her head, backing away another step. Grim swallowed. You have. You just don't remember. I had to take away your memories. All the ones of, uh, with me in them. She was panting. Like he had offered to with Juniper. A memory re uh, raced to the surface of her mind. The second thing that had come out of her mouth when she had first stepped foot on the island ninety days prior. Have we met before? Grim had touched her shoulder afterward, and she had forgotten all about it. At the sight of him... Something must have peeked through the veil he had put on her memories, and he had snuffed it out with that touch. Ela blinked too quickly. Nothing made sense. Though it was the key, uh, least important thing he had said, her head was full of cotton, and all she could focus on was, My star stick is a starling relic. Grim's eyes were sad. He looked like he was falling apart and trying very hard not to show it. No, it isn't, he said. It's nightshade. He frowned when she shook her head again. Who do you think its power came from? She wasn't breathing. Grimm's flare was the power to portal anywhere he wanted to go. The same power as her star stick. No, she said. I've never been to Nightshade Lands, she repeated, her mind spinning, voice breaking. She hadn't dared, not after Terra's warnings. Grimm's voice was gentle. Heart, he said steadily. Where do you think you were before you portaled back to your room for the centennial? Ela remembered arriving in her room. The, uh, through her puddle of stars, right before Terra and Poppy had entered it, right before fixing her crown atop her head and addressing her people. But she didn't remember where she had been. She searched her mind, digging, begging the memories to appear. They did not. What Grimm said was true. She had been with him that morning. He had taken her memories. Then, 
Just minutes later, he had pretended not to know her. She just looked like him, uh, looked upon him like a familiar stranger. <sighs> so, that was about two full pages. Now for the rant. For some reason, Grimm chooses now, moments after they arrived outside the place of mirrors, seconds after they arrived in fact, when time is of the essence, to tell Ella that her sexy time dreams of being with Grimm were not dreams or him manipulating her, they were memories. While this does recontextualize a few things that needed it, it raised several other questions. This is a big reveal that sounds way too bloated and rewrites so many things for little to no reason. Grimm and Ella used to be lovers before the centennial. This raises the question of how she met him in the first place. How was she able to utilize the star stick to teleport to the Nightshade Newlands, and why did she go there when they have such a dark reputation? Also, that would contradict how her star stick works, because she explains she needs to know where she was going before she teleports uh, there, and she has never been to these places before she explored. Also, this makes her star stick look like an even bigger contrivance, because she has difficulty teleporting to places that she hasn't been before, so Going to Nightshade Newlands and meeting the ruler of all people sounds amazingly convenient. Grimm confirms that he and Ella met one year ago, which can work given the timeline. Apparently, the opening scene of the book, when Ella was portaling home, she was coming back from his place, presumably where he erased her memories. Grimm says the star stick is a nightshade relic, which does fit in with his teleporting powers, but the question becomes, how did Ella get it? Also, if Ella assumed it was a starling relic, would Celeste be able to correct her on it? Grimm erased Ella's memories of them being together, then pretended not to know her during the centennial. Why? What does any of that accomplish, aside from some stupid misdirection for the reader, and only the reader? It doesn't make sense in the current context for the characters to do this at all, especially considering how dangerous the Centennial is supposed to be. Also, if Grimm erased Ella's memories, why did she remember being with Grimm in her dreams? Sounds like his mind games didn't stick. At least when Cassandra Clare did this in Mortal Instruments, she wrote in a reason why the mind games would fail. The constant rewriting of the past thing can work once, maybe twice in a story, but Astor relies on it to pull the rug out from under the readers far too heavily. It becomes too burdensome on the reader to, and there's so much to juggle at once that it almost demands that you turn your brain off for all this to make sense. I would say this is a clever use of misdirection to overload the reader and make them forget certain things, like how I forgot how it was, uh, about Azul for a second since he had no stage presence, but the amateur mistakes littered throughout to counter that notion. Using clever misdirection can make a story that much richer when it genuinely tricks you, but Astor kept throwing one detail after another, intentionally over overloading the reader, so they didn't have a choice but to struggle to remember things. It feels more like a cheap trick instead of clever wordsmithing. On top of that, most of the rewrites are empty and don't actually add up much uh, to add much to the characters or world, leaving me asking, yeah, and? Now granted, some of these questions do get answered by the end, so the recontextualization does get smoothed out later on. But the first time you go through that, if you're paying attention, all of this collapses inwards at once. So instead of being this big dramatic reveal, it's this frustrating, what the hell are you talking about that doesn't make sense? This also comes back to the cyclical pattern of how the story is supposed to be read, because you actually have to understand this element to understand elements in the beginning. And while I can appreciate a story that does that effectively, like the way the cyclical story in the original Final Fantasy works, that didn't overload the reader, so you didn't have this ass pull of a reveal later on in the book. I can honestly make a counting gag of all the times Astro used recontextualization to rewrite what we understood from before. There's something you can do to really effectively fool the audience and recontextualize an entire story, but that's usually something you can do only once, and it's best saved for the end, or very near to the end. Fight Club, The Usual Suspects, Planet of the Apes, all did this famously and very effectively. Astor seems to add these moments in just because they're neat. And we're not even done with all the recontextualization. This is the start. This is the baseline you gotta understand so the beginning makes sense. So the bits with Grimm make sense. And at this point, you're probably figured out how Astra got away with all these twists. The, how, you know, she was so proud of how no one could figure out all the twists that she came up with. And the reason she could is because she cheated. She would introduce elements that didn't exist before. She would introduce rules and then contradict them later on and say, ha ha, I fooled you. This isn't tricking your audience, this is lying to your audience. And the last two pages I read are a monument 
to the bullshit unearned ego that is Alex Astor. There are thousands upon thousands of twists that you can do within a single book if you use the same technique that Astor did. You can have this gigantic reveal of, oh my god, it was the butler in the Victorian era drama piece that you're writing the whole time until the aliens invaded. The twists don't work because it's not part of a clever strategy or using misdirection on the reader. It's just cheating. It's just a cheap, lazy trick. The author punishes you for paying attention, for trying to keep all this straight. Actually investing yourself in the story and trying to learn and memorize everything gets used against you. And there is a way you can actually make that work. There is a way you can make that clever, but not like this. Not when the last minute reveals or this ass pull nothing story reveal. You know, when I was reading this the first time, I was going through, I was, I was kind of mixed on Light Lark as a property overall, because it was amateur, but it wasn't awful. And at the end of everything, while I won't call it god-awful, I will say that there are elements that I genuinely enjoyed. This reliance on twists for the sake of twists is such a stupid writing choice, especially when so many of the elements have so little depth. I love it when story elements blend together and actually complement each other, or when writers are able to surprise you in ways that fit within the logic of the world. Tales of Symphonia does this pretty effectively, to bring that up as an example again. And spoilers, so skip to here if you want to avoid them, but you're told a lot of things about the world of Silveront, about how you've got the designs that are these uh, murderous half-elves that rule over people, and you've got the chosen of regeneration who has to go on a journey, and uh, if the chosen is able to complete the journey, the designs get sucked into a portal and just leave for however long. It's arbitrary. But it turns out that all of that is actually a lie. But it's not a lie that is created just to fool the reader. It is a lie that works in context, because the world of Silverant is intertwined with another planet called Tethyala, and they're both overseen by an organization called Crucix, Crucix, whatever, because this whole Chosen of Regeneration thing is part of a millennia-long plan for a supposed hero to try to revive his dead sister. All of the rules of the world and the way that the magic interacts with the summonings and whatnot, there's a reason for the lie. There's a reason why it's all revealed when it's revealed the way that it is. Because that way you get maximum enjoyment, you get a reason for the misdirection, there is a built-in story reason for all of that, and that's not what we get with this reveal with Grimm. That is a recontextualization of so many things that do eventually smooth out later on, but this initial reveal is just Astor saying, ha ha, fooled ya, you never saw this coming, did ya? Her advertising all of these twists that you never would have seen coming is the most damning thing she could have done for advertising her book. She should have kept her ego in check and just said it's a fun story with fun characters and then focused on that. I'd be less pissed off if she didn't display the bullshit unearned ego that I kept seeing time and again in all those stupid interviews. And we're still not done. So, with this earth-shattering revelation told at perhaps the most inconvenient time, Ela just runs off into the Place of Mirrors, hopefully before Grimm can actually reach her. Celeste is already inside, and she's holding a giant sewing needle, long as a dagger, the Bond Breaker. Now, they don't know where Oro is or how long it'll take for him to find them, so they need to hurry. Time is of the essence. <music> 
Fortunately, using the Bond Breaker is ridiculously easy. All they have to do is pierce their skin and hope that they can survive the cost. The Bond Breaker's cost was said to be at least a gallon of blood from a ruler. The average human body contains about eight to 10 pints of blood. A gallon is eight pints. Hila and Celeste individually would need to lose almost all the blood in their body for this to work. So yeah, congratulations, you've beaten the curse by killing yourself. And apparently transfusions have difficulty working after you lose about 40% of your blood, so good luck staying conscious while you hope that the magic elixir kicks in in time. He punched out all of my blood! And if you've been paying attention, you'll notice that none of these elements actually make sense ever since they were introduced. The Bond Breaker was such a stupid concept that there's no way that it could have actually added up to anything. And if that was your guess, that it was a red herring the entire time, congratulations, you guessed the twist. Hila and Celeste stab each other at the same time in their hands, just as Grimm walks in, and all of a sudden, Hila turned to face Celeste. Her friend's eyes had changed. They were darker, a deep silver instead of gray. She grinned wickedly. Hila froze. She didn't recognize that smile. Celeste's silver hair began to float around her head. Her back arched just as Hila doubled over, suddenly lightheaded. Her skin felt too thin, yet Celeste's skin gleamed far too brightly. The bond breaker was taking something from her and giving it to Celeste, something important. Grimm grabbed Hila's other hand, tried to pull her away from the needle, and was flung back against the glass by Celeste. But her powers didn't work in here. The nightshade thrashed violently against the chains that looked like vines. His arms strained. Just then, the door crashed open once more. Oro stepped through. How had he found her? His amber eyes went straight to the bondbreaker, and he paled. Eva, he said softly, looking more panicked than she had ever seen him. Then he doubled over, falling to his knees. Was the island deteriorating again? But this was different. Grimm slept over at the same moment. Both weakened in seconds, like her. How? Suddenly she was shoved straight down to the stone, away from the needle. It fell to the floor just as her head cracked against the marble. She blinked, vision blurred, and Celeste took a step toward her. Blood dropped from the puncture on the starling ruler's palm. Six droplets. One sizzled, one floated, one burst, one became dark as ink, one froze, one hit the ground and bloomed into a crimson rose. Celeste's blood contained abilities from all six realms. And considering that every other person on the island has been a liar or a traitor, you guessed it, Celeste is in fact the final boss. And this mishmash of convoluted rules that don't make sense all comes together for this precise moment. The reason why the Place of Mirrors has that weird enchantment at it. The reason why the magic blood does the thing that doesn't exist anywhere else in the book. The way love has an effect on Lightlark for no particular reason. The way the prophecy was constructed. The way the rules were constructed. All for this stupid, stupid reveal. Now there is a potential counter to my criticism about the magic blood thing because Oro apparently knew that Ela was always lying so he didn't really worry about why her blood wasn't doing the thing. Except she bled in front of him and she never worried or fretted about the blood not doing the thing. Therefore, Aster ignored it for that particular moment because it was narratively inconvenient. She didn't even try to hide the blood. So yeah, it's still a plot hole. And then Celeste reveals what's going on. Celeste must have read the confusion across Ela's face because she said, There never was a bond breaker, little bird. This is a bond maker. The only enchanted device that allows a transfer of ability created to help Sunling kings shift their power to their heirs without having to die. Isn't that right, king? <laughs> So this would have been a very clever reveal because through various manipulations, Celeste was able to get Oro and Grimm to fall in love with Hila. She then used the bond maker with Hila, which meant that she had access to everything because Oro has access, Oro has the narratively convenient 
access to all of the other powers. That's everything is added up just for this reveal at the climax. All of the conveniences, all of the contrivances, all of the nonsense, just for this big climax. It doesn't work because you have to stack the deck in such a particular way to have a reveal this big actually play off. And unfortunately, everything, like the weird coincidences, the little pieces of world building that didn't make sense, that didn't have an explanation for why the rules worked that way, was so obvious that it was building to something stupid like this, that if you actually read this book while you're paying attention, you can see this coming. A proper clue in a mystery like this is one that drops with a little bit of notice, where you can say, huh, that's kind of weird, and then move on with your day. These clues, the way the magic works, the way the bond breaker didn't make sense, the way the place of mirror, for some reason, cancels out powers, that'll be important for the fight scene in a little bit. All of that was so obvious, the clues might have well been saying, we're gonna add up to something big. But then there's who Celeste really is, which opens up the door to another logistical impossibility. The starling transformed, her nose shortened, her eyes changed colors, her cheeks hollowed, her lips became redder. A different face, a different person, an impossible power, a flare. Celeste wasn't Celeste at all. Oro finally looked ready to collapse. His eyes flashed with pain. Aurora. Aurora. Ela knew that name, the starling ruler who had died the day the curses had been cast, the one who had been set to marry King Egan. Celeste isn't actually Celeste, she's Aurora, a footnote character that Oro discussed in passing once, maybe twice. She was supposed to marry his brother King Egan. Apparently, she was the starling ruler that died the night the curses were cast. How is she alive? You're alive! Damn it! Why aren't you dead, you... <laughs> How did she stay hidden all this time? How did she slip in as ruler of the Starlings this time? She says that she uses illusion magic, because apparently that's part of her flair, but the entire population of Starlings die at 25, and they all live on one island. Are you saying that she just steps in as the new ruler every few years so no one, when no one can recognize her and no one raises an eyebrow at this? Or does she revert back to, uh, back, revert herself back to a baby and have people raise her? Can anyone account for her as a baby or do people just grab kids without question? Does that mean that she spent several lifetimes <laughs> shitting herself and re-shitting herself? If she reverts back to a baby, then no one would be able to account for her parents. Are the Starlings really this stupid? This was probably the single worst group to use for this twist considering their curse. Your dramatic reveals shouldn't come peppered with a slew of questions that the reader isn't supposed to ask and likely won't get answered. The only other solution I can think of is she does have kids and then... Miss Cartman, uh, eight years old is a little late to be considering abortion. This is dark. Like this, this book, when you think about what the necessary implications are for all of this to work, this is much darker than your average young adult book. And I don't think that's by design. And then there's the motivation. Why? Oro's voice was guttural. Then realization hardened his features. It was revenge, wasn't it? Aurora only smiled. What do you mean? Ela demanded. Her head was swimming. Nothing made sense, this book in a nutshell. Every word seemed to pain him, but Oro said, My brother was supposed to marry Aurora. Blood dripped from the corner of his mouth. But he fell in love with someone else. With her best friend. What? With your ancestor. So apparently the ancestor that died during the Night of the Curses was a wildling named Violet. And Ela knew almost nothing about her. Certainly not this twist, but it is central to Aurora's horrible revenge scheme. And, oh boy, if the reason for everything, just, I can't prep you for this, just listen. Aurora laughed without humor. It had all happened centuries ago, but the pain was raw on her face. 
They meant to marry with a ring already on my finger. I was so angry. I used my shape-shifting flair to change into a beautiful wildling and convince this fool, she looked pointedly at Grimm, that he would have me that night if he gave me the most beautiful flower on the island, one I knew had bloomed on the remnants of Night Isle just weeks prior. The heart of Lightlark, something Egan told me about his children. I had tracked it, intending for it to be a wedding gift. Instead, Grimm unknowingly unlocked the heart for me to use. The job was rushed. Since I had not found it myself, I could not wield it effectively. I curse all the realms without really meaning to, even my own. Only I, as the curse's curator, creator, was left unmarred. Then I panicked. With all the rulers except for me dead, I would be the prime suspect. So I faked my death with a nightshade illusion, using the heart. You saw me die, but the person who truly perished was my heir, my foolish sister. I took on her identity, her face. Then, when I formed the Starling Newland, I forbade attendance in the castle, led from afar, keeping secrets as easy in a realm where everyone dies at twenty-five. I became a new Starling ruler every centennial, all the while biding my time, planning, waiting. Even if she did ban attendance in the castle, it's going to be really weird when there's a new baby born every 25 or so years and no one's around to witness it or account for it. It again becomes a logistical nightmare because you've got this cover story that doesn't work under basic scrutiny. So the reason all of this happened in the first place is because a woman was jilted. Aurora was left at the altar and got so pissed off she doomed everyone in the world. This is... This is stupid. And even though she does have the survival angle as far as the whole, you know, being immune to the curses because of reasons of plot convenience, it still doesn't answer the whole how does she not recycle her life every 20-ish years. At that point, the only proof that there is still any kind of ruler in place is that the rest of the Starlings aren't dead. Sometimes it is effective when a story's central plot revolves around something simple and humanizing. See my previous example from Tales of Symphonia as an example. This also retroactively raises questions about Grimm. If Grimm knew about the heart before, why didn't he make any mention of the heart at all until now? Granted, he wasn't involved in the search for the heart between Oro and Ela, but shouldn't he have been able to put two and two together when he discovered this massive thing of power and very shortly after everyone was cursed and life was ruined? On top of that, why didn't he respond at all when Oro revealed that they were looking for the heart? Also, Aurora was spared from the curse because she was the one who created the curses. Fine, I'm willing to accept that the magic just works that way, convenience or not. But you would also think that this is really sloppy because now it sounds like, well, if Celeste didn't have a curse, Grimm should have been able to sense that and point it out much, much earlier, right? Well, Heart Eater, Grimm said, trying to get her attention, but she couldn't even look at him. He growled, tearing at his binds, but it was useless. She told me the original offense was a sunling ruler falling in love with a wildling ruler. Egan loving Violet. His breathing was labored. To break the curses and fulfill the prophecy, the original offense had to be repeated again. You had to make Oro fall in love with you, but you were already in love. You would have refused, so I had to take the memories of us away, together away. And the reason why Grimm, I'm not going to read this all because my voice is starting to give out, but the reason why Grimm helped Celeste in the first place is because he had figured out her identity and was going to kill her, but she offered him a deal. She had a plan to break the curses, kill Oro, and give uh, Grimm control of Lightlark. All he had to do was help her. You see what I mean when I say that this is told out of order? Because it feels like all of this is being explained retroactively, so while you're reading, it's like, but wait, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't mesh up with what happened earlier. And then there's the big reveal about Ela herself. And that's where you come in, little bird, Ela swallowed. It was all luck, really. Grimm's voice bellowed across the room. Aurora, he said in warning, don't. She only smiled and continued. Years ago, one of Grimm's powerful, curious generals stole one of his relics and used it to visit the Wildling Newland. There, he met a beautiful wildling, and, although forbidden in every way, 
Would you believe they fell in love? The Nightshade General was powerful. So powerful. He thought he could subdue the Wildling's curse. Keep it at bay. And he did, she smiled at Ela. Long enough for them to have you. Ela shook with rage. No. Yes, Ela. You are not only Wildling, but also Nightshade! She shook her head. I am powerless. Aurora laughed. Quite the contrary, little bird. You're very powerful. Your wildling abilities have simply been cloaked by your nightshade powers. Made invisible, unusable, unless a skilled nightshade should untangle them. Manifestations of power are so strange, aren't they? Power. Ela had always had power. And that sounds fine until you remember the scene where Ela talks to Oro about couples between realms and what happens when they have kids and he said that they don't have more than one power eel is a contradiction somehow explain that one aster and even though there are retroactive explanations for other things that still don't make sense in context or writing schemes at large this is one that she hopes you forgot about it does not get a follow-up so many of these reveals and twists are speed bump moments because when they're told initially, you realize that it doesn't mesh with something that was told before. So the book has to go out of its way to give a further explanation for why it works that way. So instead of enjoying this, you know, incredible twist, you're too busy realizing how little of the story actually works cohesively. So many things are tacked on top of so many other things that this book, like the structure of the plot, doesn't actually make sense. How can Ela actually have powers, suppressed or not, and no curse? Her blood doesn't do the thing. How is she lucky enough to be born with her powers in such careful balance that they don't actually make sense within the magic system as it's been explained. Maybe this is something that Aster is trying to say for the sequel, but for right now, this is, this is plot convenience of the highest order. And the contrivances do not end there. The chapter is still going on. Somehow, Juniper had figured out who spun the curses. How did he figure it out? I have no idea. But Aurora killed him for it, not Cleo or Ella, as had been previously suspected. And then there's the matter of how Azul attacked Celeste during Carmel. Somehow he figured out that she was actually Aurora and he tried to stop her. No idea how that worked, but whatever. The book doesn't explain it, but it does make Azul look so much dumber in retrospect. Azul apparently knew that Celeste was actually Aurora and didn't follow through in killing her. Not only that, but he didn't think this shocking twist was worth sharing with any other rulers or warning them against some secret plot she may have tried, despite discovering it over two weeks ago. Not only did he fail to kill Celeste, but he allowed a dangerous villain to go undiscovered for another long while. This is counterintuitive and wasn't done because it made sense for his character to do this, but because it had to be hidden from the reader. Azul's realm contribution was an attempt to increase communication, but he's been mum on this entire reveal when it actually mattered. Good job, hero! Now instead of looking mournful, he looks stupid at best, selfish at worst. So, with all of these really stupid reveals out of the way, with nary an explanation for a good portion of them, mind you, Ela decides Enough is enough, she's gotta stop Aurora. But we have time for one more convenience. Ela swallowed, knowing she had to finish the job. She was quick, faster than lightning striking. Her blade was at Aurora's throat in a moment, but before she could pierce flesh, the blade shattered. Ela and Aurora met eyes. It didn't make sense. Aurora couldn't wield her abilities here. The Starling ruler laughed. The dagger you chose at the Starling shop the one I planted there. One I had enchanted so it could never kill me should you discover my plot. Of course you chose the one with a serpent on it. So predictable, little bird. So weak. So foolish. Boy, isn't that convenient? That is some thick-ass plot armor. Extra thick! And it's not that all the daggers were enchanted this way. 
that one specific dagger was. So if she had chosen literally any other knife or weapon in the shop, Aurora would be dead. I just, just wow. Rereading this again, I'm getting all pissed off all over again. Ela didn't listen. She's not good at following rules. She brought the star stick and she uses that to escape. So in a moment that adds so many layers of confusion to how anything in this book works, Ela doesn't portal back to the mainland castle. She portals back to the wildling Newlands, which means that in fact, the storm does not stop enchantments because she teleported from point A to point B and will, within this chapter, go back. That was all in one chapter. That was, that was chapter 53 alone. It is the most exhausting, twisty, exposition-heavy chapter in the entire book. It is also the most enraging because everything is turned on your head, on its head. I just, oh, it doesn't work at all. Aurora's entire plan up until this point relied on so much luck so many contrivances, so many conveniences. She needed all of these different people to be stupid in exactly the right way at exactly the right time on, on dozens of occasions running the span of Ela's entire life. And yes, Poppy and Tara are involved in the plan. We'll get to that in a minute. But, oh my God, the, the luck that Aurora requires for this, for everything to go as well as it did, for as long as it did, for Grimm to never figure out anything that was going on, for Oro, who apparently has the ability to tell when people are lying to him, to never pick up on the whole, hi, my name is Celeste thing. Wow, I just, whew. I am, I'm actually starting to wear my voice out a little bit. There's a reason it's taking me three days to film all of this, and not just because I got a crap ton of notes. I have on more than one occasion worn my voice out filming all this. Don't worry, I'm fine, but... Whew, this plot line is so convoluted, even Rube Goldberg would look on it in disgust. This is... This is so overrated. Now, Aurora's plan relies on killing the other rulers, so the immediate thing that comes to mind when you think that, when you're reading this for the first time, is, okay, that'll kill all of the other realms. That will leave her nothing to rule over except the starlings. They might get their curse broken, but even so, you're talking about only having one particular set of powers when you could have had a whole crap ton from others. Now, if you want to freeze something, heat something, do whatever the hell, teleport, whatever, you got to do that yourself. Who knows the, the amount of magic that she would stupidly be cutting off from herself just because she wanted to murder the other rulers. So, Ela teleports back to the Wildling Newlands where she runs into Poppy, who smells of cinnamon and blood. So it must have been a feeding day. I don't know what's more mortifying, the fact that Wildlings eat hearts exclusively or the fact that they use seasoning. So Ela confirms that Poppy and Tara knew that she actually had power, somehow, and that Poppy and Tara were working with Aurora the whole time, because Aurora called her Little Bird. I told you it was going to come back in another 400 pages. And Poppy gives this as an explanation. Poppy looked pale. We did it for you. The Starling Ruler gave us a choice. Kill your mother and her lover so that her, their power would be transferred to you in time for the next centennial and raise you to be able to seduce the king one day. Or she would kill the entire wildling line and end our realm. She demanded we convince you that you weren't born with ability, so you wouldn't be uh, ever try to use it. She said it was dangerous, the mix of power, that it could kill you. It's really remarkable that she never incidentally discovered any kind of ability on her own. Like, she had some, like, how many times that happened in X-Men in the comics? Like, someone's just going along, minding their own business, when all of a sudden, mutant power. I mean, as a kid, she must have tried to control plants or talk to animals or something. 
This also kind of retroactively ruins the ro the romance between her and Oro because if the romance between her and Oro did stem from her wilding ability to seduce, then that means it's not real. That means that the shipping war there kind of falls flat because she's kind of using a mind roofie. Not quite a clean image there, Aster. Hila thinks about killing Poppy and leaving Terra to rot. Understandable, but she's too busy dealing with everything that Aurora's doing. She's got to get back because there is one person she can trust. Grim had betrayed her on every level. He deserved Aurora's wrath, a slow death at her hands. But Oro did not. She remembered his words, spoken true. I've never lied to you, Ela, not once. He was the only person she could trust, the only person who hadn't truly betrayed her. Well, except for that point where he did betray her and reveal her secret for reasons he didn't have to do. So she armors up, grabs two long swords, and then portals back to Lightlark. Poppy and Terra murdered Ela's parents and lied about it because Aurora threatened to kill the entire Wilding Realm if they didn't, and she demanded that they raise Ela to believe that she didn't have any powers. So are these abilities not intuitive? They, this sounds like a big risk, unless they were using a potion or something to keep her ability suppressed. Again, this is something the Mortal Instruments got right, and I don't even like that book! Also, Aurora took a huge risk herself by revealing to Poppy and Terra the way she did. How did she even get there if Aurora didn't have a star stick of her own? Well, even though she can't use any other powers, Aurora is able to tap into the wildling abilities that she just gained through uh, Ela, and she summons these indescribable monsters. And I don't mean indescribable in the same sort of HP Lovecraft uh, eldritch horror concept monsters. I mean, I don't know what they look like. Aurora had stolen Ela's powers, and even dead, the enchanted forest sought to protect the starling ruler. The decaying nature created guardians in response to Ela's threat, creatures crafted from bark. They hustled, uh, hurtled towards her through holes in the glass, wielding weapons made of bone and horns from wild animals. Ela roared and lunged, fighting them just as fiercely as any foe, spinning on her heel, turning her blades, shielding from their thorns and bone daggers with the metal across her arms. Yeah, so, um, I grew up in the woods and, uh, Used to, used to spend a lot of time outside uh, around a lot of trees. Um, everything on this island has been dead for 500 years. Bark becomes very, very brittle after, the, after a while. So I don't buy any of this. Like maybe it's got the advantage of there aren't any insects on the, on the island, so there's nothing eat, eating away and weakening the wood. But at the same time, really minimizes the whole desolate island thing that they were going for. So Hila's inside the place of mirrors when she defeats all of these nondescript wood monster things and she starts hearing clapping. Aurora stood in front of her laughing, clapping once more, amused. You came back? You were free, little bird! She clicked her tongue, suddenly disappointed, and you flew right back into your cage. Ah. Oh, I forgot to mention that while she was arming up on the Wildling Newlands, Ela also took a swig of the remaining Wildling Healing Elixir, so it's still coursing through her veins, which effectively means she's got a healing factor, the way that it's used here. Ela whirled around, bracing against the impact of a trunk. She fell to the ground, air leaving her lungs for just a moment before returning. The healing liquid she had just taken still running through her blood, aiding her. One of Aurora's thorn-covered vines sliced right down her side, sending blood streaming, and she screamed. But a moment later, the skin knitted itself together again. I can't believe he's still alive. I can't believe you left the house in that shirt! Ah. Ela starts rushing Aurora, swords drawn, and at this point figures out somehow that the original fence wasn't using the heart, and it wasn't a sunling falling in love with a wildling, because the curses were so cruel that they must have been spun through a truly sinister act. And then she figures that, that perhaps her ancestor hadn't sacrificed herself as part of the uh, solution to get the prophecy in the first place, considering that Apparently, Violet was the one who led the death charge something. She was the first one to die. So, apparently, the original sin was Aurora murdering Violet. Understandable, but 
How does Hila always have such plot convenient suppositions? She figures out these wild ideas with no lead in or evidence, but figures out whatever she needs to at just the right time. This happens so frequently that I would almost call it a talent of Hila's if it wasn't so Mary Sue ish. Uh, the fight keeps happening. Uh, Aurora throws a bunch of trees through the ceiling, and with a hint from Grimm saying, Your heart, heart eater. Ela figures out that she still has the heart egg thing with her, and she uses that to unlock her wildling powers, and she uses that to shatter all of the trees and stuff that are in her way. She finds the bond maker, picks it up, and stabs Aurora in the heart in such a way that uh, one end is in Aurora's heart and the other is in Ela's palm in order to reverse the powers that Aurora had stolen. So, the original offense was committed, a quote-unquote murder, and a ruling line had come to an end and one of the six won. So, Aurora, de uh, Aurora dies. I'm sorry, I'm exhausted at this point. Aurora dies, the floor cracks open, her body falls down there. Ela somehow has magic now. Light Lark is starting to fall apart and she uses her newfound wilding powers to summon stuff to bring her Oro and Grimm uh, back up to the uh, to the service where the ground uh, isn't falling apart anymore. I just want this to be done. You know, I, I read some advice um, a while ago. I don't even remember where I got this, but the idea is that if you've got a fantasy story with some sort of magic or particular abilities, don't rely on the protagonist getting some brand new powers at the last second for the sake of convenience, because that is... That is such a cheap way to work through a fight scene at the end. If it's not a pre-established ability, if it's not an extension or something, or if it's not like some latent burst of inspiration, because if you don't do this, everyone's going to die, then it just comes off as a deus ex machina. And all of a sudden, Ela having wilding powers, despite never training with them beforehand, apparently has this deep intuitive knowledge to the point where she's able to master, like, clear everything away and defeat Aurora in combat and then save herself from falling down a gorge. It just stinks of convenience. Like I said, I like it when protagonists struggle, when they actually have to display some degree of effort. But in order to, like, for me to believe this, I have to believe that she's able to intuitively utilize these powers that she's never utilized before, that she gets at exactly the right moment. It is... it is really exhausting. So there are two chapters left, and this is where the resolution really starts. We start to get a few things wrapped up with the other characters. Azul, for example, got a little bit of closure. Azul had been seen on the beach, watching as the cursed storm finally cleared. Apparently the storm had held the souls of those killed by the curses. Those were the whispers she had once heard. The bodies trapped inside had supposedly walked just a few steps as specters before disappearing to their peace before they reached shore. And Ila hoped that Azul had been able to see his husband at least one last time. Now, even though he had betrayed her, Grimm still thinks he has a chance with Ila because five... Uh, let's see. Ila spends two weeks... Uh, in darkness in her chambers, recovering from all this. And then about nine days into that rest, Grimm reaches out to her and says, Remember us, heart. Remember it all. You will remember. And when you do, you will come back to me. Pretty hoity thing for him to say, considering he was an associate in a plot that murdered her parents. And with the storm subsided, Lightlark is now part of the regular world and everyone can reach it normally, I guess by boat. All the curses are broken, of course, but you may be asking, what about the Starlings? Aurora is dead. Certainly, they're all dead too. That's how the magic works, right? Well, see, this is all in two parts because she used the bond maker in the end. Oro comes into the room and... Ela reached a hand to his chest. Somewhere she could feel his power pulsing. An endless stream, gold and gleaming. Sunling, skyling, moonling, and starling. When Ela had used the bond maker, she had returned each ruler's power through the same bridge that had allowed her to take the uh, take their abilities in the first place, though she still had access. 
So not only did she return the powers, she kept all of the powers for herself, even though she doesn't want to tap into the extra abilities yet because she's not used to them, but good God, is that a lucky win. But there is a little loophole in why the Starlings aren't all dead. When Ela had killed Aurora with the Bondmaker, she had known exactly what she was doing. Not just t getting her own power and Oros and Grimm's back, but also taking something from her. All her Starling ruler abilities, a loophole to kill a ruler and their line, fulfill the prophecy and end the curse while sparing the Starling realm. Oh, how convenient! This is a cop-out. The Starling survived because Aurora's power flowed into Ela through the Bondmaker. Now they all get to survive. This is called a loophole, but it strikes me as a cheap excuse. Why do the other ruler's powers return to them and stay with her? This just sounds like it was written to allow a happy ending. Then again, the mechanics of these powers are so weakly defined that Aster could fit anything in here and it could work. And there are a multitude of plot threads that still need to be wrapped up. And we're going to answer almost none of those because there are only two pages left in the book. The one thing that they decide to toy with, because we don't get this re uh, resolved, is they go back to the Place of Mirrors because Ela has somehow figured out how to get into the vault. You see, her crown was the one that belonged to her mother and her mother's mother and Violet. That was when she had realized what it was. The only thing that connected her to her ancestors. The only important object that had survived the centuries. She stood before the vault, at the back of the Place of Mirrors. Oro was next to her, eyes fixed on its peculiar, peculiarly shaped lock. Ela took a steadying breath before slipping her crown into the hole. Its every ridge clicked into place. She turned it, just the way she would a key, and pulled the door open. And that's the end of the book, but oh wow, that is lucky. It is remarkable that this one-of-a-kind lock opened with a crown that would be very easily lost or damaged. Remember that scene when Oro flicked the crown and it dented very easily? Wow, it's, it's so fortunate that over the centuries, the crown never lost its primary shape. Powers would have made sense because that's something that you can't really trace as easily, but a crown is something that can be lost, damaged, or stolen. That means that if someone else really wanted to, they could have snatched the crown off of uh, Ela's head at any point and opened the vault themselves. Everyone else had hidden libraries that were accessed with powers. Apparently, in Cleo's case, they were her specific powers that could open up the library. If that's the norm for everyone else, then why are the Wildlings doing something different? And God only knows what actually exists in there, but I suppose that will be saved for the sequel. I don't know what kind of a story she could actually write from the sequel because so many things were left unsatisfyingly unanswered. For example, what about that whole Legion thing that Cleo was building? What amounted to that? Why isn't that being brought up? What was the resolution with Cleo? Is Grimm just gonna go off and be emo somewhere on his Newlands, or what? What even happened to the rest of the Wildlings? Is Terra still melting into the dirt? I'm sure plenty of you have plenty of other questions that are not being answered. This book does not live up to the hype in the slightest. I don't even know where to start. I need you here so I don't turn into a rage monster. A good chunk of the characters have no real definition. What can we really say about Azul? He's some sort of a loner idiot or something, which is such a shame because he otherwise was underutilized. Cleo was just the Ice Queen, appropriate considering the island, though I wonder if that was by intent. Oro was honest and never actually told a lie, but was so obtuse and did lie by omission. He was otherwise just some weird goody-two-shoes loner weirdo. There's not much you can really say about him. He's just some bizarre personal fantasy that somebody probably has somewhere. But aside from untrusting loner, there's not much that you can really say about him personally. He doesn't get a lot of definition, which is surprising for a love interest. Normally, 
you'd want to expand on that. Give them likes, dislikes, you know, what are your favorite foods, colors, seasons? You know, get into the why of the character and expand upon them. Grimm is an idiot whose dick doomed the planet. Azur tries to explain why he was a traitor in the end and, you know, justify his actions retroactively, but he was otherwise the weird gothic player sort, which is an odd combination, I'll grant. I don't see that very often. But all that's kind of ruined in the end when he realized that Grimm was actually a stupid POS. I'm trying to minimize the swearing because YouTube is dumb. And then there's Ela, who exists more or less to show off how cool she is. She has so many badass moments that it does become a central feature of the book, which is a hallmark qualifier for Mary Sue's, mind you. Granted, I am still not qualifying her as a Mary Sue because, again, she's too stupid. A lot of the reason why I find it difficult to relate to Ela in any way is because so little of the world actually makes sense. So the way that she moves about things, the reason she uses the star stick only when it's of a very particular moment, not even when it's a matter of plot convenience, it's just a matter of this is the narrative that the author wants to spin. Her decisions are reckless when they're not stupid. She will trust or stop trusting people at the drop of a hat, immune to the concept of logic as a whole, and the story is written in such a way to reinforce the idea over and over that she is a super unique flower whose love and dedication will save everyone. Well, everyone who doesn't get a needle shoved into their heart anyway. But because the story was so insistent on reinforcing how cool and super special awesome Ela was, the entire story just becomes annoying. The few times she does struggle within the story, it's either an incredible pittance, like when she was possessed by the ghost, or it's some incredible tragedy that's undone within pages, like when she was shot in the heart and then was fined the next page. Oh, and the magic system. Don't get me started. You want a good magic system? You gotta read something by Brandon Sanderson or Jim Butcher. Jim Butcher has come up with dozens of separate magic systems within his Dresden file books, but they work interconnectively. They're simple, granted, but that simplicity is where the art flourishes. You got four different types of werewolves, three different types of vampires, so many different schools of magic. Hell, in one book, you got like four different breeds of necromancers. And it works because it's simple. You don't have this overcomplicated, narratively convenient bullshit. I, I think you can see, especially if you watch this video a second time, how many things were built up just to reinforce the climax. How many things were built just so the climax could happen precisely the way Aster needed it to. The bit with a place of mirrors not allowing magic, the way love works, the way Aura was an origin and just happened to have all those magic abilities already. And Lightlark itself is a surprisingly listless place. For the variety that it shows, there is almost nothing to really describe each of the aisles. Everything is bland and surface level. You have very brief descriptions that you can list everything off. Sun Isle's the one with gold. Moon Isle's the one with snow. Star Isle's the one that's falling apart. Sky Isle floats, Wild Isle's dead, and Night Isle doesn't exist anymore. Then you've got the large swaths of nothing that is the mainland. You've got the castle. That's about it. A couple of nondescript forests and locations. Oh, except for the one mountain range that Azul turned into a giant instrument that never actually amounted to anything substantial. The cultures of the other worlds, despite their powers and despite the tragedies of their curses, largely can be summed up in only a few words. If you want an example of multiple cultures done well, check out something like Mass Effect. Almost a dozen alien species, each of which has a definable culture that you can go into a little bit of depth with. And yet, 
So many elements in this book feel like Astor wrote them just to show off how unique Lightlark was as an island. So many times the characters are sidestepped for the point of detailing how this element on the island works or how this feature looks. But like I've described, that doesn't breathe life into a world. You need the characters to interact with the world in order to make it feel real. I think the closest Aster ever got was the chocolatier scene when Ela and Grimm were sharing chocolate. And there are elements that I liked uh, scattered sporadically throughout this video. You'll notice there are plenty of times where I stop to compliment Aster. She does have an element of talent to her. I do think that someday with a little more practice, she could actually be a pretty good author. The problem is I don't know if she has any incentive to actually improve on what she's doing. This is a garbage book, but a lot of people are celebrating it. Ideas in this book are presented, but the weight behind them is never considered. Aster's biggest problem is that she didn't take the time she needed in order to flesh Lightlark out. She got lazy, she took shortcuts, she focused on Flash, and didn't put enough focus on substance. Now, like I've said before, the reason I don't like Lightlark is because Aster's writing style is entirely antithetical to my own. There's a speech that I heard from a, I believe he's a pastor a couple of years ago named Eric Thomas, where he tells a story about the guru of the beach. Um, you might also find it under how bad do you want it? And I, I highly recommend you listen to it. I'll have a link to uh, some videos uh, in the description, but he tells the story about a man who goes to a guru guru for advice on how to be successful. And that video is kind of foundational to how I view my own writing. I don't want to spoil it here because I think it gives a greater impact if you get the story from the source. So go check it out. Someday, Aster could very well be an author worth paying attention to. But it ain't right now, and if she write, if she does finish the sequel to this book, it will not be with the sequel. She has too many mistakes already under her belt, and I don't believe she has the skill to work her way out of them. And that was the darling of book talk, but not the queen of book talk. We're not quite done with the mess that is everything on book talk. I had to consider long and hard about what I wanted to review next. And one name that keeps coming up on Book Talk, aside from Aster, is Colleen Hoover. So join me next time when we plunge our way through November 9th. And if you can't wait to find out why Colleen Hoover is such trash, check out Amanda the Jedi. She did a review recently of, what was that? It all ends with you, I think. Hopefully this won't take me too long to get through it's only about 250 pages or so, but uh, if Caleb Joseph's videos are any indication, I'm going to hate this. These are my balls. See how they glisten in the light? <laughs>